Ready? Yep. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the third keynote talk. Today, we have Anders Harsberg. Ooh. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's see. Anders is a Microsoft Technical Fellow and the lead architect of the TypeScript open source project. Anders has worked on programming languages and development tools for over 40 years and is the original designer of C Sharp, Delphi, and Turbo Pascal. Anders studied engineering at the Technical University of Denmark, and today he's going to talk about TypeScript. Please give him big hands. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's lovely to be here in person. This is actually the first in-person talk I've given since COVID. I think it's really kind of crazy, but it's lovely. I love it. Um, I'm here to talk about TypeScript and the journey of uh, adding static types to, to JavaScript. And that journey began more than 10 years ago. Um, and, and back then, the world was very different from what it is now. What was happening, you know, we were going from a very homogenous world of PCs to a more heterogeneous world of devices and so forth. And Google had done fantastic work with V8. Um, to, to increase JavaScript performance, and HTML5 was happening. And finally, the web platform was actually becoming a place where you could write real large programs. It was possible, and it was also becoming necessary because of the, the, the device revolution. And um, we all know that, that JavaScript is a, is a language that has issues. Um, and writing really large applications in JavaScript is just very, very hard. And the world was discovering that uh, at a rapid pace at that time. Uh, JavaScript doesn't have a static type system. At the time, it lacked essential features like modules and classes and so forth. And it was designed in a hurry, and a bunch of mistakes were made in the, in the early design. And the tooling for JavaScript at the time kind of looked like this. I mean, there wasn't really any at all, right? So you would write your code, you would hope it run, and if not, then, you know, good luck trying to figure out why. Um, and people were doing crazy things to, to sort of get out from under that, like writing in CoffeeScript, which is just another compiled to JavaScript language without a type system. So really, it solved some problems, like classes and so forth, but not really, not really all of it. Or Internally, we were seeing people um, do wild stuff like writing code in C Sharp and cross-compiling it to JavaScript. And that was actually how I sort of first got into, into this problem. Some, some folks from Outlook.com came to us and said, could you please consider productizing this, this thing called Script Sharp? And I'm, well, well, what's Script Sharp? Well, it's this thing that compiles C Sharp to JavaScript. And, but why are you doing that? Uh, well, because that allows us to use grown-up tooling. You know, like, I mean, we can do code navigation, we can have modules, we can have all these fantastic things that, and I'm like, really? Is it really that busted? Uh, and that was sort of what, what got us thinking about, wouldn't it be better if we, instead of like targeting JavaScript from other languages, what about trying to fix JavaScript? What is it about it that's busted, and what could we do to make it better? And, and we sort of ended up on two major things that we wanted to do. One was build great tooling enabled by static types. We knew already at the time from experience that, that you can't build a great IDE experience for a language that has no types at all because there are no indications in your program as to what the intent is. And so statement completion and code refactoring and all of code navigation, all of that stuff just isn't really possible without some hints put in the code. Um, and the other thing was uh, ECMAScript 6 was becoming a thing, and, and it defined a whole bunch of new features, but the browsers were lagging behind, and so there were a bunch of features that people wanted to use, but they couldn't use because they weren't in the browsers, yet it's actually possible to compile them into idiomatic down-level JavaScript uh, through transpilation. And so those were sort of the two things that we wanted to, to do with the, uh, with the TypeScript project. Um, so TypeScript, basically, it starts with JavaScript, to which we then add a static type system. And, uh, and that enables us to build great tooling. And I, 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 just out of curiosity, how many of you use uh, VS Code here? Um, yeah, a lot of people. And VS Code is written in TypeScript, and they were one of the original uh, um, 
uh, users of ours, and, and so they're sort of our sister project, you know, and, and, and you, you see what, what, what great tooling becomes possible when, when you add a static type system. Um, but then through transpilation, it all just compiles back to JavaScript again. That's sort of, in a nutshell, what, what TypeScript is. Um, the project today, uh, we sort of operate by these six principles here. We are both open source and open development. Uh, the project is hosted on GitHub. It's a very active uh, site, um, uh, our repository, and then you're all welcome to, to, to check it out, please. Um, we closely track the ECMAScript standard. We do not see it as our job to make language features in the JavaScript core language. Where we innovate is in the type system that we add on top. So we work with TC39. We've championed many features through TC39, but then we see it as our job to, to sort of in, invent and build and innovate in, in the type system. And then, of course, we want to build best of breed tooling. So, so the, the way we've implemented our compiler is that it is written first and foremost as a compiler for tooling's sake. And it is a service that the IDE can use to do things like statement completion, refactoring, code navigation, et cetera, et cetera. It's not just you know, your classic uh, code in and binaries out kind of compiler. Um, we work hard to continuously lower the barrier to entry to make it easy for anyone who writes in JavaScript to, to, to use uh, TypeScript. And then we focus a lot on, uh, on the community, and it's a, it's a big community out there. Um, so we, we released uh, the first version of TypeScript in October of 2012, uh, so uh, 11 years ago, uh, just about. Um, and it's sort of been a slow climb, and, and TypeScript today is probably, it's for sure in the top five programming languages in the world, depending on how you look. Um, uh, on GitHub, this is the latest Octoverse thing. We're, we're, we're now sitting at, at number four. Uh, and of course, if you add JavaScript and TypeScript together, it is by far the, the world's most uh, uh, used programming, programming language. Um, at, at this point, pretty much all major uh, JavaScript frameworks are either written in TypeScript or for sure have support for, for TypeScript. And we, we try to work a lot with the community on, on making the experience better. We worked a lot with the Vue guys. We worked with the React. We originally worked with, uh, with the Angular folks, um, and that was sort of part of what, what got us launched uh, uh, years ago. Um, and in addition to that, there's this uh, wonderful uh, community effort called Definitely Typed, which is all about collecting types for all of the world's JavaScript and putting it in a central repository. It is one of the most active sites on, on GitHub. Um, today, the activity is actually s slowly trending down because more and more uh, NPM packages now include their types, and so you don't need to get the types separately. They just come along when, when, when you NPM install something. But, but even so, this has been a large part of, uh, of our success. Um, now, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about the type system, because that's probably what, what you're most interested in. And there is actually also where, where most of the innovation in, in, the, in the language is. And you know, when we set out to, uh, to design this type system, our goal was to create a type system that models JavaScript's behavior. Um, or allows you to model JavaScript's behavior. And, and in a sense, that already sets it apart from how most type systems are, are designed, because most type systems starts with, um, you, you know, you design the type system, and then, then that dictates what behavior is possible <laughs> in your language, right? But, but here, we were coming in, there's a language that already has all sorts of behaviors, and it's now our job to design a type system to model that. And that takes you down a very different path, as, as, as you'll see. And you end up with um, a whole bunch of constructs that I haven't seen, type constructors that I haven't seen in other programming languages, um, and, and some, some unconventional choices also. Um, so these are some of the attributes that I would use to describe our, our type system. Uh, first of all, it's erasable, meaning that uh, 
this type system does not in any way affect execution of your programs, right? Because your programs run just as JavaScript. And when you write code in TypeScript, here's, for example, a, a little program that declares a person type and a greeting, uh, la, la, la. And you see we declare a type person and we use it in a couple of places as a, as a type annotation. But, but when this is transpiled or compiled, all of the types are erased. And what runs is this, just JavaScript. So the types in no way affect execution. And in a sense, what we're designing here is a type system purely for tooling's sake, um, which, which contrasts with most type systems out there that exist because you want to have uh, certain runtime guarantees or you want the type system to assist the code generator in creating the right types of instructions and so forth. None of that holds here. Uh, but on the other hand, the type system has to be completely interactive. The implementation of the type system has to be completely interactive because its main purpose is to power tooling. Uh, now, we actually, over time, have uh, accumulated multiple ways of specifying the types. Some people don't like to transpile their code. They like to just be able to save and run right away. Uh, and for that, uh, a lot of people use what's called JSDoc type annotations. And we can slurp those up as well. We don't really care whether you use manifest type syntax or whether you put your types in comments. Um, and indeed, when you're writing JavaScript in VS Code, you're actually using TypeScript. You may not know it, <laughs> but the language service that runs underneath is the TypeScript compiler, because to TypeScript, JavaScript is just, it's just TypeScript with no type annotations in it, but we still can infer a lot of the types. Um, Another aspect of, uh, of our type system is that it's gradual. Uh, of course, it has to be when you're, when you're in, a, in a sense, modeling a, a dynamic programming language. Um, in, in TypeScript, we have this funny type called any. Uh, this is sort of like a community meme there. Just slap an any on it, and then you, know, it'll, it'll, you, know, you don't have to worry about the types. Um, and the any type is this oddball that is both a top type and a bottom type. So, so anything is assignable to any or compatible with any, but, but any is also assignable to anything else. And of course, <laughs> that means you have massive holes. Um, I mean, clearly, this type system is not sound, and it was never designed to be sound, and gradual type systems aren't, uh, at least not. <laughs> They're, they may be sound in islands, but they're not overall sound, right? And so here's an example of some code that you can write in, in TypeScript. Uh, uh, if, if, if you wanted to, you know, first create a number, then assign that to an any, and then assign that any to a function, uh, and then try to call the function. And of course, boom, that, that's not going to work. But the thing that's interesting here is um, that, um, that we already have a runtime underneath where all behaviors are well-defined. So even this program has a well-defined behavior. The well-defined behavior is it raises an exception, which of course might not be desired. Um, but there are no undefined behaviors here. And often one of the key things that people use TypeScript uh, uh, soundness in type systems for is, is to root out undefined behavior. Because undefined behavior is what enables all sorts of security attacks and, uh, and, and so forth. But in JavaScript, it's all well-defined. It's just that a lot of the behaviors are undesired. And it's, in a sense, our job to tease out all the undesired behaviors. But that's a much, much lower bar. In a sense, we're coming at it from nothing is checked, and then anything we do makes the, <laughs> makes the world better, where most type systems come at it from a standpoint of, if you can't achieve perfection, then don't even try to go there. And that means you cut out a whole bunch of possible things that, are, that you could do that you might not be able to prove soundness for. But we don't have that restriction, and that actually makes our work very interesting, because we can go in places where, where, where people typically don't go. Um, so, I, th I sort of describe our type system sometimes as a Swiss cheese type system. You know, it's, it's, it's full of holes, um, and in the most liberal settings of our, of our checker, uh, it, the, the holes are everywhere, right? But we, but we actually enable uh, and we recommend that you run the checker in strict mode, and in strict mode, we can root out 
almost all of the, all of the things that you, you would worry about. There are no implicit any's ever inferred in that mode. There are only the ones that you explicitly ask for. Uh, nulls are strictly checked, et cetera, et cetera. But, but again, we've in a sense turned the type system from a switch into a dial, right? And you can dial up how much checking you want. Um, now, our type system is structural and, and, and as, as you all know, like JavaScript is duct typed, right? I mean, if, if you, you, <laughs> you, you, you write, if, 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 you know, if it walks like a duck, it looks like a duck, it's a duck. It's good enough, right? I mean, here's, here's for example, some code where we have a greet function that takes something that has a name property. Um, and, and you'll see that we can either have a person class with a name property or we can just pass an object later on. It doesn't matter. Anything that has a name property is compatible here. Uh, this, this is distinct and different from nominal type systems where you, know, you have to agree upon a name for every contract and then you have to explicitly state that you implement this contract. And if you don't state it, then you don't implement it. And that actually creates a lot more friction in the system, right? Because unless two library writers agree on a, on a protocol, well, they can't talk to each other without first writing adapters and da 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 da. Where in, in, in TypeScript, there is no friction. And, and, and also, this, this enables us to, um, to actually add types after the fact, um, which is really, in a sense, what powered the early success of TypeScript. There, at the time we came out, there were a gazillion frameworks and types for none of them, right? And so we had to provide a way of writing the types out of band in declaration files that are sort of like .h files in, in, in C, right? Um, and, and being structural in the type system makes that an awful lot easier. Um, the type system is also generic. Uh, I, I would posit that it is impossible today to create a language of, of any relevance that doesn't support generics. Go try it, uh, but, 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 but then eventually added generics as, as well. Um, but when you combine uh, structural typing and generics, uh, you set yourself up for a world of pain, um, which we have spent the last decade uh, exploring. <laughs> Here's, here's an example, say, of a generic type node, which is you know, some node in a tree that has strongly typed child pointers. So, so the children, so parent is P, and then the children have node of node of P's as, as, their, uh, as their type. Um, now, let's say I define another type that looks just like it in structure, but has different names and whatever. Well, in a nominal type system, these two would not be compatible. But in a structural type system, they have to be compatible. So let's say I have two instantiations of node, of null, the, the top root pointer of, 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 my, of my tree, and now I want to determine whether these two uh, are compatible. Well, I, structural means I have to go examine the properties of each of them, and yes, they both have a data, yes, they both have a parent of type null, and then they have children of type node of node of null and item of item of null, and now we go explore those, and then, of course, that leads us to, and that leads us to, and, <laughs> and it's turtles all the way down, right? And, and so, so you end up exploring these recursive abysses at, at all times, and you have to find provisions in, in the type system to cut off the madness. Uh, <laughs> um, and so we have what we sort of call the affectionately the, the whoops, the, the turtle limiter, um, did it show up there? Yeah, yeah, that, that we use various techniques to cut off the recursion after three to five levels and then kind of go, well, let's assume that's true and then let's check everything else. And if that also checks out, then we're gonna say it's true. Uh, now we can get away with this because everything in JavaScript has a runtime type check built in anyway. So we don't actually have to prove beyond a shadow of doubt that this is true. We just have to prove it to a high enough degree of certainty, right? Um, the type system uh, also is, uh, it relies heavily on inference, uh, which of course you want to do because you're starting with something that has no type annotations in it. And so to the extent that we can infer stuff, it's good. Here's an example of, where, of, of, of a program where everything is typed by a single type annotation on, on get lengths. Um, 
And because strings is of type string array, then we know that there's a map function, and we know that map function takes uh, a function, uh, and we can type the S accordingly to be a, a, a string, and that means in turn that we can figure out that S dot length is a number, and that means that we know the map returns a number array, and that means we know get length returns a number array, and that means we can infer that length is of type number array. So, so the types can flow throughout. Now you might ask, why do you even need that type annotation? Couldn't you have inferred that from the call to get lengths? Um, we could have, but we don't. Um, and so unlike other type systems, like say Mindley, Hilner, uh, uh, Hindley, Milner type systems, for example, that do unification and, and, and a whole program analysis to, to deduce the types, um, we, we only do inference from, from context moving inwards. Um, we do not have spooky action at a, at a distance, if you will, which often plagues certain, some functional programming languages where you have a call in a remote place that all of a sudden changes the types uh, over here. And, and of course, uh, full program analysis doesn't really work very well in module systems, right? Because so, so that means that the module barriers are gonna have to have type annotations anyway, so we, we stipulate that functions must be annotated. The only time we, we infer for functions is when there's context, like for example, you're passing a lambda here. At that point, we can contextually type from the outer context. Uh, but get links, a top level function, we do not infer anything. Um, the type system is also very expressive, and, and this is what I'll, I'll, I'll try to cover then in the remainder of my, my talk here, all of these various type constructors that we have uh, and that we have accrued over time. Um, of course, we support like object types. You saw some examples of that. We also support union and intersection types that basically union or intersect the domains of possible values of the types. Um, we support the Kia for index types, which is up which obtains the set of possible property names for a, a type. Um, and then lookup types that takes, given a type T and a key of type K, what is the type of properties in that type? Um, and then map types, which are comprehensions over object types that allow you to, to do mappings. And all of these exist conditional types and now we're getting sort of into dependent typing and, and whatever, and we'll, we'll show you, I'll show you some examples of that. Oh, but, oh, but know that all of these exist because they are necessary to model JavaScript's behavior. It's not something that we did just because we thought it was fun. It's actually something that, that is needed in order to, to properly type JavaScript. And that's what uh, I'm gonna try to uh, look at now. Uh, let me go here, and I'm gonna start showing you some code here. Um, First, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about union types uh, and how they, oops, is this not showing my screen? I guess it's showing my, that's, that's interesting. What do I do to get PowerPoint to show me my screen? Well, maybe I'll just shut down PowerPoint. That'll probably take care of it. Here, let's see. Yowza. How's, how's that? There we go. Can you all see this? Okay. Um, this is a very typical piece of, uh, of uh, JavaScript uh, and a very typical pattern in JavaScript where you have, JavaScript doesn't have overloading, um, but, but it's dynamically typed. So you can write a function that does something when you give it a string and something else when you give it a number and this is very common in JavaScript. Maybe not strings and numbers, but it's very common to either take a string or an object with a property bag or, or whatever. And, and then you wanna tease out inside the function what, what was given to you, and you do that by guarding code with, with type checks, and then, and then off you go. Um, now, originally, TypeScript did not have union types. We were basically a singly rooted type system, and that made it pretty hard to type constructs like this. We did originally introduce overloading, but that only works at the top level, not when types are buried in, as the types of properties and, and so forth. And so here, there was really no type that I could give here. I, I mean, I could give it type string, but now, now it errors on one of, the, one of the things that I want to permit, or I could give it type number, 
and then it errors on the other one, or I could give it type any, but then it doesn't error at all. That's not what I wanted either. Uh, so with union types, I can say this is a string or a number, and now I get the desired behavior. Um, and so union types allow me to basically combine arbitrary, the domains of arbitrary types into one type. And probably this is the most profound thing that we introduced into the language. It has since colored everything that happens in the language. And every operation does not operate on a single type. It always operates on a set of types represented as, as, as a union. And the singleton case is just sort of like the, the, the oddball. Um, with, with union types, it also makes it possible for us to increase, meaningfully increase the precision of the type system. So shortly after union type, we introduced literal types, which are types that are, they're basically uh, unit types. They have a single possible value, which is the literal. So here, I am making a new type called direction that has four possible values, up, down, left, and right, uh, represented by their, their uh, literal types. Um, and that gives me much, much higher precision than what I could have otherwise had, um, but is really not meaningful in a singly rooted type system. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, what's, what's the point of something whose type is always the same, right? I mean, that, that's a constant. Um, but, but once you have union types, you, you, can, you can combine them. Um, and of course, uh, it, it, this occurs, I mean, just if we look in the, the type declarations for the DOM, this occurs all over the place. Super, super common to have properties that have these like 10 possible values and whatever. And, and this allows us to model it and, and type check it properly. And of course, it also makes the code authoring experience better. When I'm sitting here and I'm about to type in what can go here, well, statement completion can, can help me fill in uh, the, the right types here and show me uh, and so forth. Now, this stuff also helps with solving the billion dollar problem or the, uh, <laughs> of, of null pointers uh, or the two billion dollar problem, if you will, in JavaScript because JavaScript is endowed not just with null but also with undefined, you know, and there. <laughs> um, but, but really, we can use the same techniques to, 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 to chase these issues down. And you'll see here, I have an error, a function that takes an, an, an optional message. And if I attempt to, uh, say message dot length here. You'll see we give us we give statement completion, but if you choose length, uh, let me let me just say let len equals. You'll see that we use the question dot operator because we know uh, in statement completion because we know the value could possibly be undefined and that means we propagate the undefined and so len is actually number or undefined here. And if I were to get rid of uh, the question mark, you'll see that it's an error uh, because we know from control flow analysis that it could possibly be undefined. But if you're in a guarded block, then indeed now you can uh, choose these uh, or, or, or pick these methods. And so this is enabled by control flow analysis. And that's sort of another part of once we had union types and literal types, um, we added control flow analysis and type refinement based on proof in the code. Of, for example, here, this constitutes a proof that message couldn't be undefined. And since message is a union type that includes undefined, we can remove undefined from that union type in the code that's guarded by, by the, the check. Um, and the check isn't just a syntactic check that you're enclosed in a block. It could also, if I said here, if, uh, let's say, uh, if, if message equals undefined, uh, throw new error, for example, um, you'll see here that message now has undefined uh, removed from its type because we know from control flow analysis that that, that code dies and, and, and never reaches this, this point here. Um, indeed, maybe I'll skip over this one here because it takes a little while to work through, but here you see, again, examples of uh, where control flow analysis, you know, uh, detects uninitialized variables, detects type mismatches and, and, and so forth, um, and chasing them down is interesting. In fact, it's funny to look at the, what part of, part of the, the issues that JavaScript has is uh, the semantics of 
the operators. Let's say I have a function here that takes strings or string arrays or nulls or undefined, and I do a truthy check of s. Well, in here, uh, not surprisingly, you get string or string array. Uh, but down here, you get null or undefined or string because the empty string is falsy. And so you could still have a string here. Now, a lot of people forget these things in their code, and they end up <laughs> thinking that they have guarded against a certain type occurring, but, but, but they haven't. Uh, here's, another, oops, here's another classic. Um, if, if type of S is object, you would think, well, I probably only get the string array then, right? Well, no, you also get null, because null, the type of null, is object in JavaScript. No. <laughs> Don't ask me why, but it is. <laughs> um, and so down here, you get string or undefined. Or if you use, sorry, uh, if you use the double equals to check for undefined, well, then you actually also check for null because <laughs> it coerces the values. But if you use triple equals, um, then you'll see you only get undefined and null now occurs down here. And so, so knowing this catch, I mean, we, we on a, on a daily basis, we get bug reports where people go, I wrote this code and whatever. Else. No, actually, it's because you did this and this and this and not that. And so, you know, so, so this is something that people always struggle with. Um, now, one of the really, really interesting things about uh, union types also is that they enable a pattern that we call discriminated union types, which this is a very, very common pattern in JavaScript where you have objects that have a discriminant property that says what kind they are, and then the remaining shape of the object depends on the kind. Uh, here's like drawing shapes or whatever, but this could be a message processing system that receives JSON over the wire and then you know, branches out based on it. It occurs everywhere in, in JavaScript, this pattern. And we actually understand this pattern. So here you see a function that computes the area. And, and all I have is a single type annotation that says S is a shape. And that means we know that S dot kind could be square, rectangle, or circle. But then if you branch on that, then we also know in here that S now has been refined to just be the square variant. And that means that in turn we can give you statement completion so when you say s dot, we know that size is one of the properties you, you can pick out here. And similarly for rectangle and circle and so forth. Um, but even better, if I try to put code here, we actually know that this code is unreachable because you have handled all of the cases uh, that, that could possibly occur. Um, and so, so through control flow analysis, we know this doesn't happen. And so exhaustiveness checking is, in a sense, falls out from, from, from this work. And now you can sort of see it's kind of like ADTs in a functional programming language, right? There are certain patterns that you could do here that, that, I mean, yes, no, there's not pattern matching with the same level of richness necessarily, but, but even that can be, can be worked around. Um, it's also interesting to note that the type of S here gets refined down to never, which is the empty union type. Uh, we used the, the name never because it originated or, uh, originally in functions that, that we know through control flow analysis never return. So if a function throws always, its return type is never, uh, meaning that you can assign its result to anything because it'll never happen. <laughs> and so never is this bottom type that is, that is assignable to everything and, and is the opposite, if you will, of unknown, the top type that, that, that isn't assignable to anything, but everything is assignable to it. Um, now, interestingly also, you'll see that because we know that the function the, the endpoint of the function is never reachable, we can infer that this function returns number because we know that all of the return paths produce a number and there's no fallout at the bottom that could possibly return an undefined. But if I comment out one of the cases, you'll see now that we know that S here could possibly be the, rect the rectangle and this is no longer unreachable and the function now returns number or undefined because you could fall out the bottom. Um, so, so there's a bunch of stuff here that, that combines to, 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 you know, to really find a lot of bugs in people's code that, that they, they didn't realize uh, they have. Um, now, the, 
complement of union types is intersection types. They are less often used, but, but you very quickly discover that if you have unions, you also need in intersections. Um, here's an example of, of where, where they are relevant. Let's say I have uh, a function that takes string and returns string, and a function that takes direction. That was that up, down, left, right that you saw earlier. And let's say I make a union of those two, and now I want to call this function. Well, intuitively, you sort of know that, well, I have now, I'm typing two input positions here, one that requires strings and one that requires just the four possible string literals in direction. So the only thing that's safe to pass in is one of those four values, right? But on the return, I don't know which one I have, so it actually returns a union of the two, which is just string, right? And so, so effectively, you end up with intersections in contravariant positions and unions in covariant positions, and the type checker knows that, and that's one example of where intersections are a must once, once you add unions to, to your language. And indeed, you can see here, if I intersect string and direction, I get string, but if I, uh, sorry, if I union string or direction, I get string, but if I intersect them, I get uh, uh, up, up, down, left, right, or direction. And interestingly, if I have a string or a number and I intersect them or union them, then I get string or number. But if I intersect them, I get never because they share nothing. And so if I were to change this from to string function to numfunc, you'll see that I end up with a function to which I can never pass a value. <laughs> but if I, uh, so I can never call it, but if I could, it would return a string or a number. Uh, Uh, other examples, I, you know, I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time here, um, uh, but indexing with union types, the same thing happens uh, if, you, if you do spreading. We approximate the behavior of spreads using intersection types, uh, which isn't exactly correct for JavaScript, but it's correct enough for, for our purposes. Um, let, me, let me try and look at... Um, some of the other stuff that we do. Um, here is a very typical pattern in JavaScript. And now we're starting to look at some of the things that you can't really do in other programming languages, but, but, but are typical in JavaScript. Let's say I have an item uh, record here. And then I write a function that takes an object and a property name and returns that property of that object. Um, now, this is a capability in JavaScript that strongly typed languages typically don't have. Every object in JavaScript, in a sense, is a dictionary. Um, and and you, can, you can treat the property values just as keys in, in that dictionary. But so, how would I type that? How, how would I make this piece of code down here actually give me, for name, uh, something of type string, and for price, something of type number? Currently. It, it just gives me any, as you can see, because I don't have any, any, any types. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to type out what it actually looks like to, uh, uh, and here you'll see two of the type constructors that I mentioned earlier in, in, in use. Um, so what I'm saying here is now, get prop is generic on T, which is the type of my object, and K, which is something that extends the possible property names of T. And then we infer that the function returns a T sub K. Um, and now you'll see down here that we infer, oh, you passed me item and name, and that gives me back a string, or you passed me item and price, and that, get, that gives me back uh, a number. If I, for example, uh, said uh, greater than or equal, it doesn't matter, then pass price, else pass name, well, you'll see that we now infer, well, you're passing me either a name or a price, and therefore 
you either get back a string or a number. And so unions distribute over this type constructor, the T sub K type constructor. And there's a whole bunch of semantics that, that you know, over time <laughs> we've sort of learned about these, these type constructors and how to, how to check them and how, what are their constraints and, and so forth. And, and a lot of the reasoning in the checker you know, revolves or, uh, around that. Um, Here's another real world example that uh, maybe I won't spend uh, too much time on, but, but this, this is something that exists in the real world in a low dash library, a pluck helper method that picks out, given an array of T's and a key name, pluck me out all of the properties from those objects with that property name. And that in turn is an array dot map of where X is typed as T and it returns a T sub K and therefore the result here is a T sub K array and therefore down here I get a string array when I pass it, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, map types are in a sense the, the, the ability to apply comprehensions to types. Um, so it's like sort of like a, a, a for comprehension that computes the properties and their types inside, a, a, inside an object type constructor. Here, for example, you see I say for P in foo, bar, and bass, give me a property of type string, and what I end up with is this type, right? Um, now we have a bunch of built-ins, for example. There's a, um, gosh, I keep doing that. There's a built-in partial type constructor. If we look at its declaration, it says, given a T, iterate over all the keys of T and make them optional and give them the type that they already have. And so this, this takes an object type and makes it into an optional type of, this, of the same shape. Um, and there's pick that says, uh, give me an object type and a set of property names for that object type and pick out those properties only and give me a type for that. Uh, and here you see examples of, 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 of use of that, like an assign function that, for example, takes uh, a partial set of properties and modifies them, or a pick that picks out, you know, two properties from item, which in turn ends up giving me back a uh, well, if you look at what we get when we say statement completion on X, you'll see that we picked out just those two properties. Um, so there's a whole bunch of pattern, and, and the reason we have those is that this is what a lot of JavaScript libraries do. They do sort of object munging and turning objects into other objects and, and turning their properties into different properties and so forth. And so we're sort of guided by what people do in, 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 in what we go implement in, in the type system. Um, now, one particular example there that starts to get really interesting, and now we're starting to get into dependent typing, is conditional types. Um, so here's another JavaScript pattern that, that we see a lot where, depending on the input to a function, you get different outputs from that function. Here, for example, if I give you a string, I want to get back a name label, but if I give you a number, I want to get back an ID label. And ideally, we would want down here, you know, we would want typing that gives me the right type when I give you something that we statically know is, is one or the other. And that becomes possible with uh, conditional types. So here instead, we've said a label of T, where T could be a string or a number, is if T extends string, then a name label, otherwise an ID label. Um, and then we use that as the return type. We may make, we make create label generic, and we use that as the return type, and now when I pass in Elmer, I get a name label, but here I get an ID label, or if I pass in one or the other, I get one or the other. So in a sense, you can think of conditional types as smart union types that collapse upon instantiation to one of their possible choices. Um, now, this, uh, then combines with, with inference as well. Um, and this is where it starts to, to get interesting uh, because now you can write logic. So here we have a result of T that says, if T extends promise of mumble, then return the mumble, otherwise return T. Uh, or, 
And now, if I say, what is a result of string? Well, that's string. And a result of promise of string? Well, that's also string. But a result of promise of promise of string? Well, it only unwraps one level. So it's not quite doing what I want it to do. Um, but we actually allow, uh, oh, sorry. We actually allow recursive types. Uh, with, combined with conditional types. And now <laughs> it's starting to smell like Turing completeness uh, uh, because now, you can, now types can compute and iterate. And here you see that now we will unwrap as much as we need to. So even here we get string. And here we get all of the bottom types unwrapped out of their, out of their promises. This turns out to be very common in JavaScript too. There are, there are lots of places where, where we need stuff like this. For example, there's an array, uh, a method on array now that got introduced recently called flat. That flattens an array. So if you put arrays inside of arrays inside of arrays, then there's a method that flattens them all into one array. And typing that looks something like this, where no matter how many levels of typing I give it, it, it flattens it down to, to, to one level. Uh, and of course, if I try to trick it and construct an array that every time I index it, I get another array, and it just goes on ad infinitum, then you'll see again here we have one of these <laughs> turtle limiters that, that we have built into the type system where after, after 100 iterations or whatever we go, this isn't going well. We're going to stop here and, and, and give you an, an error. Um, now, chasing down all of that is actually what has been the really hard part of, of <laughs> and something that we continue to, to, to struggle with because effectively our type system is Turing complete. Uh, and, and someone even put up an issue that proved the Turing completeness, and people are doing the, the most absurd things. I've seen people write chess games in our type system, uh, SQL parsers, uh, you, 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 you name it. Um, but lots of stuff is possible. Here's an example of how to reverse a tuple, and you see that it, this really is a nice little pure functional programming language in the type system where you have iteration, uh, through recursion, and you have choice through conditional types. Um, all of the values you operate on are types. So you're operating on sets of values, but of course they could be singletons, and now you're just operating on, on simple values. And your functions are your generic types, um, because they take other types as parameters, and you can invoke them again, and so forth. And so here you see that, yes, you can write something that reverses a tuple, for, for example, in, in our type system. Um, how are we doing on time? Sort of okay. Um, let's see. Where would we go next? Um, let's look a little bit at, at tuple types, which is interesting too. Um, and then I think I'll stop after that. Uh, so we, we support uh, arrays and tuple types. Um, and, and we even allow tuple types to have holes in them. So you can say, well, the number array, here's a thing that, you know, so first of all, in JavaScript, tuples are just arrays uh, with, a, with a given fixed layout, right? And so a, a two tuple here of number comma string is in, when you run the program, it's just an array with two elements, but we can strongly check this. Um, and we can even have holes in the middle of arrays of a certain type and then check the, 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 yep, the, the fr uh, front and the back. Um, where this gets interesting is JavaScript has all of these abilities to manipulate argument lists of functions. Um, and for example, here's a function that takes um, uh, a number and a string, and I can pass to it a one comma ABC, uh, but I can also spread in a tuple provided that that tuple has the right shape. Um, and, and indeed here, if I were to try to pass in A3, you'll see our checker says, no, you can't do that, but you can pass in the, the A2 tuple. Um, and functions also support rest arguments where you can spread in arrays. And indeed, uh, if you type a rest argument as a tuple, you see that everything actually unifies. This, this simply becomes a function that takes two arguments, right? So there's really no difference between parameter lists and, and tuples. And that, in turn, means that we can type uh, parameter lists as arrays or tuples and then capture them. So here, for example, we're capturing 
the tuple that comes out of calling this function. Um, and, and that is, in fact, precisely what, what all the function does is this. And we can give accurate type to that. Um, and with, when you spread in a, a, an array, of course, we give you a, a number array. And we can even, in later versions of the language, allow you to control whether you want us to infer mutable types or immutable types. Here we infer an immutable type um, because both have good uses in, in, in the language. This is another part of inference that differs from functional programming languages. Often, you know, like in a functional programming language, you're free to just infer the most precise type ever, uh, every time, right? But, but you don't really know in a language, when you said one as the element of this tuple, did you mean you want a tuple back that has numbers in that position and then you might put other numbers in there? Or did you mean something that you're never gonna mutate, in which case we wanna type it as the literal one, right? Because that's the most precise type you can get. And so it's, it's not always decidable, and so we allow you to put in hints like, like that. Um, um, now, where, where it starts to become interesting then is you, could, you can model higher order functions as well. Here you see a, a, an invoker that calls a given function with a given argument list, and we can give accurate types to that. Um, so when I say invoke of F1, uh, you'll see that not only do we know what its type is, but we know <laughs> that you are now supposed to give me an argument, a number and a string, and we can even pick up the parameter names from the function you passed in. Um, and so, so again, uh, these, are, these are very common things that happen in JavaScript, and so, so over time, we've enabled you to model that. Um, the last crazy one here is uh, uh, inferring to composite tuples. This is starting to look a little bit like currying, although, but it's, but it's really just binding arguments to, to functions and understanding how to split uh, the argument list of the function into two tuple types where one is specified, and so now you sort of get partial, partial application in, in all of these with the, with the correct types. Um, I'm gonna cut it off here and maybe just do my summary slide. This, this, but hopefully this gives you sort of a taste of, of what's possible in, in this type system. I wanted to just sort of end on a, a slide that talks a little bit about why I think TypeScript succeeded. Um, one of the key decisions we made early on was uh, to not try to create a language that replaced replaces JavaScript, even though the world was crazy with languages that were supposed to replace JavaScript, but rather we went for the other route of trying to improve the existing ecosystem. And I think what we also got right from the beginning was that we were designing a TypeScript system for tooling's sake here, and this was all in the name of pr providing and creating excellent tooling. Uh, and that means that you you engineer your compiler very differently. You engineer it as a compiler that really works as a service that powers your, your language service underneath the editor, right? And that is, in a sense, its core purpose. And that means that everything has to be deferred and incredibly responsive. I mean, we know from user studies that that users get irritated if it takes more than 250 milliseconds for the dropdown to show up. But if you're sitting in a 100,000 line program and you press dot somewhere arbitrarily in the middle of this program, you obviously can't check all 100,000 lines to deliver a result. So you have to be incredibly incremental, yet the minute the user then completes that dot, then the program has changed and it could mean something completely different. So you also have to account for that. And, <laughs> and that is not simple, uh, but, but, and, 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 the TypeScript compiler is, in a sense, a gigantic exercise in applied functional programming, uh, if, if you look at it, uh, where we construct ASTs for all of the source files, and then we never mutate those. And every time you type a character, we throw away the entire program and then reconstruct it from pieces of the old program that we can convince ourselves are reusable. Um, and uh, that's how we get our performance. Um, and of course, I should say, you know, TypeScript is written in itself, and writing a compiler in JavaScript is not the first thing that I thought I was gonna be doing for, for a decade of my life, but it's amazing uh, what, what, what's, what's possible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll leave the rest up there, maybe, and then I'll, I'll just let you read it, and then we'll stop here, and then I think there's time for, uh, for a few questions if, if, pe if people have some. So, so thanks, yeah. Thanks a lot for yeah, the you're welcome. Yeah, yeah, inspiring yeah. talk, mm -hmm. and we have so many questions. Um, <laughs> let's start with Ron, with, when the mic is ready. Hi, thanks very much for mm -hmm. such an interesting talk. Thanks. Um, I was wondering, when, when you're retrofitting a type system on a language, you're, you're trying to avoid undesirable behavior, but along the way, at some points, you, you throw out programs that would have desirable behavior. Correct. So I was wondering, how, as a group, do you decide which programs you want to save, and how do you decide <laughs> um, when to add switches to to turn the dial, uh, what, what kind of uh, um, thought yeah. process goes into that? It's a damn good question, and it's not one that has a short answer, uh, but, but, but I think a lot of it is based on our own experience using the language first. This is, we dog food every day, and so we know what, what the patterns are, and we know that when, when it's irritating that we can't get them right. Um, we also judiciously monitor the issue tracker on GitHub, and, and so the community is very good at making us aware uh, of, of issues and, and providing uh, programs that reproduce the problems, and then we, we try to jump on that and, and, and make it better. But it's an iterative process all the time, and it's this tension between completeness and, and, and uh, soundness, you know. The, <laughs> the answer is never at the extreme, it is in this nebulous gray middle, right, where, where that we try to chase down in our day-to-day -day lives, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Sam Evan. Hello, I'm, I'm Adam Chapala from MIT, and I'm wondering about the principle you shared where you can kind of make a, a best effort when it comes to the soundness of different typing constructs right. because there is dynamic checking that was always there underneath in JavaScript. Mm -hmm. What about important properties that have not been dynamically checked, like around encapsulation and data abstraction, where you could really foil some effort to maintain an invariant if there was some corner case of the type system? Well, this is why we have these, these varying, I mean, first of all, that's why we have strict mode, and, and we recommend that people use strict mode. And in strict mode, it is a lot harder to violate uh, um, soundness uh, but, but it's always possible because, I mean, we, we do have like assertions where you can just willy-nilly assert that this now has typed that. Um, and, and, but, but, but we endeavor to make all of that explicit. So, so it only happens if you say so. And if you say so, fine, then you get to say so. Indeed, we have this thing called user-defined type predicates, which are functions that you can pass an argument and then you can assert in the return type that x is of type blah. And then you write the function that proves it. Because there is no definite proof in JavaScript that you implement this particular protocol. But, and, and most of the time, it's based on this good enough. OK, I go, OK, if you have that property and that property, fine, we're going to say you're that. Uh, you know, we're not going to check all of the 50 possible properties, you know, because that would be too costly at runtime, right? So it's always this balance, you know, of, of safe enough, right? Um, and we sort of have to embrace that in the design of the type system. We can't fight it because then our tool is of no interest to the community, right? So again, <laughs> it's tricky. Thanks. Yeah. Hello, I'm Simon Peyton Jones. I am hey, um, and, and as, um, <laughs> it's good to see you. Although, <laughs> although I used to work for Microsoft, I, know. I have learned more about TypeScript in the last hour than I have in the previous ten years. So oh, thank okay. you for that. <laughs> um, so my question is this: um, You described a bit of a Wild West situation in which the bar is very low. You can't you can't not improve the situation. So that's great. And yet, I'm sure there is some correctness criteria that's in your head. Like you don't want to report an error when there really isn't one. And you describe quite a complicated system. So I bet that somewhere in your head or on paper, there's some formalization of stuff that says, well, here is a criterion that says this heap of code that is the compiler is doing the right thing. Do, do you have such a thing? Or even sort of sketches of I such do, a thing? But, 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 do you see but, what I do, mean? but part, uh, but, but, something in that means that, it's more than justified by the implementation. Yes, but in that heap of stuff, 
there are a bunch of unsolved problems that uh -huh. we don't know the answer to. For, for example, I mean, one of our most, uh, <laughs> One of the issues that, that on a, on a practically on a daily basis we refer users to is issue number 9998, uh, which, which talks about limitations of control flow analysis. Um, for example, it is possible in, in JavaScript, which is one of the things they got right, uh, to, to close over outer state, right? So, so nested functions can access the outer locals of outer functions. Now, what if you, what if you write Let's say you have an outer local, and you say if that outer local not equal to undefined, and then you have a block of code, and that block of code calls functions. Well, do these functions then, I mean, and it's like how do you now, you could try to inline the world there and see and, and whatever, and it's just, there are certain things that you either, but you still have to say, does this check for undefined hold in the face of a call to a function following that function call? Yes or no? <laughs> and you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't, right? Because some people will go, yes, that should invalidate all of my assumptions because every call to a function in JavaScript is virtual, and you have no idea where it's ultimately going to go, so it could have, but, but does it? And, and in reality, 98% of the time, it probably it doesn't, you know, and it's inconvenient, and so, so there's, there's that, right? There's just these things that we know we will never solve. Um, and, and so it's just about like making the right choice and then, and then every time someone arrives and tells you this is wrong, we tell them, yes, but the alternative is worse. <laughs> so. right, but you could, uh, I was wondering whether you've tried to distill some of those choices into some kind of formalism other than the code of the compiler itself. Uh, really we have not been particularly formal in our in our design. No, no, I was so so. But hey, if if, if you're interested, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'd love I'd love to. I'm I, exactly, and I would love to learn a lot about what other holes we have that I didn't even know about. So yeah, yeah. Hi, Sam Tobin Hochstadt, Indiana University. So uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, as someone working in gradual typing for a long time. It's been very gratifying to see the amazing product that you all have produced building on those ideas. Uh, and I guess my question is, what would be valuable for the academic community, say the, those of us who think about gradual typing in a research context, for you? What questions are the next ones that people should be thinking about for TypeScript in five years or for the next gradually typed language that comes after TypeScript that we're not, we haven't solved those problems right. yet? Well, I think, I mean, for me probably the, the, the thing that gives us the most headaches uh, is because we're Turing complete, you can do infinite computation with our types and how do you cut off the madness and where do you cut off the madness? And, and does there exist proof that certain types terminate and others don't? Uh, we're not super good at, at, like, I mean, we have some fairly crude limiters in place, you know, that, 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 that will stop recursing. But at times, they stop recursing too, too soon. And then all of a sudden, after three or four levels of nesting, things are not checked as much as you would like them to be. But it's... But conversely, there are, there are examples of, of types that absolutely explode exponentially after three or four levels of nesting because of the, the generative nature. And, and it's very hard for us to, 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 to tell the complexity of a type and, and how, how, how far to drill into it. Do, do you know what I mean? That is something that for, for a decade we've struggled with. And we still, I mean, just yesterday I was fixing a bug in, in this particular area, right? And again, it's just, so I would love more research in that area. That, that would be super, super interesting uh, because we would put it to good use uh, if, if we knew better answers than the answers we have now. I'll, I'll keep going as long as you yeah, want. Yeah. So, yeah. so, yeah. Five yeah. more minutes, four more minutes. Your, yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm uh, Neil Krishnaswamy from the University of Cambridge. So I wanted to ask a question about the intersection in union types mm -hmm. in, uh, in TypeScript. So you know, these, this is one of these features where the natural complete strategy has exponential backtracking, but there aren't like, you know, you know, clear heuristics like cutting off recursion depth at a certain level. So, but TypeScript is still quite responsive. So I was wondering like, 
what kinds of heuristics do you use that you do find work well? Well, so union and intersection types are rarely uh, an, an issue. There are certain constructs you can do where you, if you start uh, intersecting large union types, then we do this thing we call normalization, where, where we bring them to sort of a first normal form, and that actually is, is quadratic in, the, in nature, and so types can get very large there, and we do not, as a rule, operate on denormalized types in, uh, you, you know, we do not, we always mm -hmm. normalize such that unions sit above intersections, sit above singleton types um, in, in the type representation, uh, but, but it, that's not without issues. Um, and so we do have certain limiters in there that say this type is too complex to, to compute and we're not gonna try because otherwise it's gonna take all afternoon. Um, but generally speaking, I think where we really run into sort of in, intractable trouble is, is because we allow recursion in the, mm -hmm. in the type system and computation through conditional types and, 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 and recursive types. And those can run amok. And, 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 and sometimes they run amok by creating millions of types, <laughs> you know, and, and, but, they're, but they're still very shallow because they're very bushy and wide, do, do you know what I mean? And it's hard for us to, to get those always. And so, so people in the community get very inventive when they type their libraries and they, they're very proud of, oh my God, look what I accomplished here with this morass of types, right? But, but they explode in your face and then of course all the users of that framework are now burdened with statement completion that gets incredibly slow and so that's always tough. It's tough because it's tough for us to place blame <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because we don't know what's causing all this computation, do you know what I mean? Or not, not, not easily at least. So yeah, those are some of the things that we struggle with. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mike Sperber, Active Group. So at least with static type systems, as they evolve, sometimes you make changes that break a lot of users' code. Um, was that ever the case that you wanted to make an improvement to the type system, but then you discovered? Uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, and and, and it's, it's sort of the, it's the strange dilemma of, of, a, of a type checker's uh, <laughs> job, right? That, that, that as the type checker gets better, it produces more errors and therefore it breaks people's code. Because hey, this built before with the last version of the compiler, now it says there's an error here, but, but obviously the program is working. You know, well, well there, could have, there could possibly be a condition where your program errors, but it doesn't in, in real life, but, but do, do you know what I mean? And so it's that debate always. Uh, we tend to, we tend to weigh changes on, uh, is this something where our current behavior is just blatantly wrong? And yes, we can defend no matter who arrives, we can defend and go, but look here, I mean clearly, this should not do what it's doing now, so therefore we're gonna fix this, we're gonna call it a bug. But then there are other situations where, yes, we now start checking more judiciously, and that is gonna break some common patterns out there that, you know, People obviously have worked around in their existing programs and it's not actually causing them grief. At that point, we typically lump it under a new strict option um, and then you could opt into it. And then we have this Uber option called strict that always opts you into all of the new strict options. So if you're in that mode, then you just get the latest and greatest and then you can opt yourself out of the latest checks if you don't want them. Or you could start at a baseline where you're not strict and then you opt yourself in individually to every new feature that we add. But of course, as time marches on, we get more and more compiler options and you know that in and of itself and like testing all the combinatorics of that is horrendous, right? And so, so <laughs> I don't know that there is a fantastic answer, you know, but we try to cater to those sort of two standpoints, if, if you will. Um, Let's take the, the last, last question. question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I want to elaborate a point that you didn't mention, but uh, if you're using TypeScript, you're also allowed to keep some files as JavaScript, which is super, super useful when you're trying to like migrate something that right. is like not really well typed, just like, okay, this is like going to be JavaScript, like, and I will slowly like type them down. Like I've successfully migrated a bunch of code base this way and it, it works really well in practice. But yeah. uh, my question is a little bit off, off a tangent, um, 
tooling and compiler as a service model is like a really important part of like the TypeScript. Uh, it is also a really important part of another Microsoft project, the C Sharp oh, oh. Roslyn compiler. Uh, the which story? Uh, sorry. Uh, I didn't hear the last uh, part. Uh, it's also an important part of uh, the C Sharp Roslyn compiler. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, my, I guess I'm wondering which one came first, or like how much like cross intercultural crossbreeding between these two compilers are happening inside Microsoft. There was actually a lot of crossbreeding in, in the beginning. Roslyn came first, um, and indeed, uh, the the first production compiler, the first compiler that we shipped uh, or released uh, for TypeScript was actually written by several of the uh, of, of people who had been on the Roslyn team. And that was actually also an interesting journey because they came over and then they proceeded to write a, a TypeScript compiler in C Sharp style in JavaScript, right? Lots of classes and lots of auto-generated syntax trees, uh, you know, AST accessors and blah, blah, blah. And we had an awful lot of auto-generated code right off the bat. And that's actually not a good way to get performance in, in JavaScript. And uh, then we got more interested in this more functional way of writing JavaScript, um, where you just write functions within functions, and that's how you get uh, isolation of state and whatever, and that's also how you reduce polymorphism in, in your code, which is, which is pretty bad. V8 handles polymorphism pretty badly, uh, and it, it doesn't know how to inline when you make method calls because everything is virtual in a sense, right? But, but if you have functions within functions, then all of your calls are inlineable and you get a whole different level of efficiency. And, and so currently, the TypeScript is compiler is implemented pretty much, there are no classes at all. It's all functions. It's, it's, a, it's a large exercise in functional programming in, in JavaScript, if you will. So, so that was an interesting journey too, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you. So let's all right. thanks. Well, thanks all. Thanks again. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to resume at 10:30. 10:30.
One, two, three, test. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Tahina Ranandro. I'm from Microsoft Research. And it's my pleasure to introduce today three great talks on verification uh, for this session, starting with uh, Jonathan, my colleague Jonathan Potenko, um, who will present you about uh, how to turn um, modular high level uh, programs into, uh, verif um, into verified. Uh, uh, low-level efficient code. Thank you and uh, go ahead. Thanks Sahina for the introduction. I'm live. Everyone can hear me? Oh, and yes, uh, sorry, one, one second. Please ask your questions also on the, um, on the Discord thread. Sorry about that. Oh, all right. Uh, thanks for attending this talk. Uh, this is joint work with my uh, awesome collaborators at uh, Enria uh, in Paris. So that's a lot of big words, uh, modularity, code specialization, zero cost abstractions, but really this uh, talk is the story of how we landed a pretty significant amount of verified code into the reference implementation of the Python programming language. And so starting in October, if you're using Python and specifically Python 3.12, you will be enjoying a verified cryptography specifically for the hashing library that is part of the Python uh, repository. So this talk is um, the story of uh, how we built a series of uh, high-level APIs. Um, um, built a series of high-level APIs that uh, allowed us to be very productive and save on uh, a whole lot of work and uh, make us very productive in producing that code that went into Python. And so uh, the technical ingredients that went into that are terms that should be very familiar to this audience. Uh, there's elaborator reflection, there's uh, metaprogramming, there's automated code rewriting, and there's uh, high-level abstractions. And to the right is the series of PRs that uh, went into Python. I mentioned verified cryptography. Uh, the specific library that uh, was uh, landed into Python is uh, HackleStar, the uh, verified uh, high assurance cryptographic library. And HackleStar is something that got integrated before in uh, Linux, Firefox, the, the, the Tezos blockchain. Um, but the novelty here is uh, the addition of these new APIs with the techniques that I just talked about and um, the fact that it went into Python. HackleStar is pretty large. My message is that it's a large amount of code and that productivity is really important because it's really hard to keep things together when you have 140,000 lines uh, of verified code and over 30 algorithms. So really, there's a lot of uh, attention and care that goes into uh, keeping everyone productive. HackleStar is written in the F-star programming language and compiles to about 80,000 lines of um, C code. And the reason we compile to C code is um, for performance. There's a social thing wherein if you want people to take your code, you have to give them C. That's non-negotiable. Things are perhaps starting to change, but for people like Python or Mozilla or Linux, it is C code that has to be uh, produced. It's non-negotiable. And so it's a very unique set of constraints. We are producing, um, we are transpiling almost in a sense, code that people will actually look at because the workflow is as follows. If we want to say add a new algorithm like Kyber, like we're doing right now into Mozilla, we're gonna produce the C code and we're gonna submit a PR um, to the Mozilla repository, NSS, the uh, crypto library of Firefox. And then someone will look at the code. Someone will actually review the generated C code and will issue comments like you see on the right, like should the code look like this? Should the code look like that? So there's a very strong constraint here, which is that what we produce is eminently readable. And uh, usually that involves a back and forth between us and whoever consumes our code downstream to reach a um, satisfactory state of affairs. And so the challenge for Python was the following. There was a pretty high level API for hash algorithms. Um, hash algorithms, you've heard about them. SHA-2, SHA-3, maybe you've heard about Blake 2 or you know that you shouldn't use MD5. Uh, Python has a built-in library that exposes those algorithms. And it turns out that they were gathering uh, different implementations from all over the place, uh, over the internet. And um, it was all doing the same stuff, but in a, like, there were five copies of the same API, five copies of the same state machine, uh, five copies doing pretty much the same thing. And when we set out to replace this stuff, of course we were not going to re-verify the same stuff uh, five times. We're uh, you know, part of a functional programming community and we try to uh, do things such as be generic. Uh, if there's the same stuff happening five times, you only wanna write it once and you wanna have aggressive code sharing and reuse. Um, you wanna stay at a very high level. 
you want your invariants, your data types, you want to have higher order functions and polymorphism. Uh, you want, of course, a lot of usability. You want your stuff to be as automated as possible. You want to, your verification to go smoothly. And you want, of course, to have abstraction. You don't want to hear about the gory, grotesque details of C code. You want to operate in like a very high level environment. And that's a challenge, right, when you're generating C code at the other end of the pipeline. And so this talk is really the story of how um, we managed to let the programmer, the person who writes the proofs, who proves all of these things, uh, think and operate at a very high level of abstraction, genericity, and modularity. Uh, and so the way we did it is that we essentially added a stage to the F star to C compilation pipeline that essentially implements something akin to C++ template specialization directly in F-star in user land without extending the TCB. It turns out that it was a super useful feature that we ended up using all over the place in HackleStar. And I know for a fact that it made me and several of my collaborators much happier because we were able to get a very uh, high level of um, automation. So allow me now to um, give you a little bit of an intuition about how it works with just like drawings, and then I'll get more into the um, technical details. Um, this is a static call graph. What this means is that the blue function at the top, update, is calling um, update 0 or 1 or update LT1 or update N. I'm not going to get into the details yet of what this update function does, but it's essentially the update function that um, the Python API needed, and there are subcases. So the blue box at the top calls into any of the three subcases below. And the blue code, and that's the important part, the blue code is entirely generic. It doesn't matter if this is the API for MD5 or the, MP the API for SHA2 or any of the variants of SHA3. The blue code is identical. The blue code is really generic over the choice of the update block function that's underneath, and that one can be algorithm specific. There's an update function for SHA2, there's one for SHA3. There are a variety of update, of update functions, but the blue code really remains the same regardless of your choice of algorithm. And you can kind of see where this is going, right? Um, you want to write the generic code once, and you want to specialize it, you want to instantiate it, you want to apply your functor, whatever like, you, way you think of this, you want to specialize this code for uh, various choices of uh, block function. So for instance, you might want to get, you might want to have like this specialized for um, SHA-256, for instance. And if you remember, I said that we were producing C code and we have to produce idiomatic fast C code. And so that means that when you want to specialize your blue code over your choice of green box, you can do something like having function pointers or dynamic dispatch or having like a tagged union and any of these things because the people who consume the code would be very unhappy. They would say that this is not idiomatic. That's not how you normally do it. It's slow. It's adding extra tests. And people will really get like hung up over one extra conditional in the critical path. So what you have to do actually is you have to get um, an entire copy of this whole static call graph and generate a specialized version of this entire thing for your choice of update block SHA-256. And you want to do it again. And for instance, you want to pick um, the SHA-512 function, and you want to generate like an entire copy of this entire like, algorithm for SHA-512, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's essentially what we did in this work. We encoded that code specialization logic that copies an entire algorithm and produces a specialized version of it that um, is suitable for then feeding into the F star 2C uh, compilation pipeline. And this kind of code specialization is entirely written in F-star without extending the TCB. It's a user land tactic that takes care of rewriting all of this code. As I mentioned before, one good intuition is that it's almost like C++ template specialization. The code is uh, copied. And of course, we verify the whole thing once, but we enjoy the specialization for free many times. And before I get into um, the details, I'll note that this is a recurring theme, actually, to um, have, of course, a high-level polymorphic construction that you want to specialize multiple times. When you look at Rust, it's also polymorphic and is relying on whole program monomorphization um, um, to target LLVM bit code. Uh, Fiat Crypto also has like automated uh, verified compilation of high-level specifications down to ASM, and it's also giving you like a lot of specialization for free. Veil has verified transformations. All of these things are kind of operating in the same space. What is different for us is that we are generating C code that people will actually take a look at. 
and that puts a very unique set of constraints on the problem. Allow me now to um, jump into the technical details a little bit and give you an intuition of uh, what's happening. The language that we operate in is uh, called low star for low level F star. It's a subset of F star that compiles to C. It's a shallow embedding of um, curated C concepts in F star. It means that uh, you can use machine integers, you can use um, while loops, but you cannot use higher order, you cannot use closures, you cannot use any of these things because they don't naturally compile to C. Um, the code is irrelevant, it's a linked list, but uh, my point is, is that um, there's a fine function for that linked list and this implements a key value map uh, with a linked list of pairs where uh, the first element of the pair is a key and the second element of the pair is the value. Um, you have a null check here. Uh, we model the C memory model in F star and uh, the way that this operates is that if your code fits into the low star subset, then it's eligible for compilation to C via a dedicated compiler called Caramel um, that will generate C code out of this. And this is actually like verbatim what comes out of the compiler uh, on the right. So great, you can do things. You can do things like uh, a linked list, but let's not, oh yeah, and like there's an erasure process that removes uh, ghost things. You can see here that your U32 on the left becomes a UN32T uh, from the in types.h header on the right, et cetera. So low star in a nutshell is a low level subset of F star that models C concepts such as uh, the C memory stack and heap, machine integers, et cetera. And uh, Caramel compiles post erasure uh, low star to C. And we've used this for a variety of works for the noise star protocol compiler, for the Hackle uh, library in its various uh, iterations, for Quick, and so on. But if you look at the code that I just uh, introduced for uh, a warm-up, that code was very monomorphic, right? It was specialized for pairs of UN32s. The keys were UN32s and the values were UN32s. And so what if we want to go generic? Imagine that you want to have a version of the previous code that's higher order, that has generic type parameters, that is modular and well specified, well, you could do something like what you have on the right. You could um, define a type of maps that take a key and that give you a fine functions. You could define what it means to have uh, decidable equality with EQ type. It's a type T and a function that decides the equality of two Ts and returns bool. And then you could say, okay, well, I have a map combinator that's gonna make a map given an EQ type and a choice of uh, types for the values. And um, you're super higher order, and it's just really neat, and you're generic, and you also cannot compile to C because you cannot put a type in a record in C, you cannot use closures, you don't want to use higher order, and you don't want to pass records around with function pointers in them. So you see the problem here, right? There's a tension between writing something that's super high level and yet generating um, readable C code. So there's a first idea that some of you might be thinking about. Uh, it's a good idea, but it doesn't scale. It's too inline. If I take the uh, example from the previous slide and kind of get the essence of it, right? There's a fine function that takes uh, a decidable equality type and a key, and that does, you know, uh, a review of all the entries in the map, and that calls e.eq, right? And that's the thing that's not C-like. You don't want to call, like, you, don't, you cannot select a function pointer and call it and like have Mozilla be happy because you're passing around function pointers everywhere. So this is the thing that uh, is not really looking good. And for the sake of example, I've also added a send function. Let's imagine you're in a protocol and your send function takes a key and is looking up like the value associated to that key. Fine. A first idea is to aggressively inline everything. So imagine that you're trying to get a specialized version of the send function for you in 32 you could partially apply send to an EQ type where the type T is U32.T and the equality function is simply your equality monomorphically over 32-bit um, unsigned integers. And if you rely on inlining, you will find that send U32 starts with the body of send, then inlines fine, so you get the beginning of fine, and then you end up with a monomorphic equality test and then the remainder of the inlining, and that is monomorphic, specialized, doesn't rely on function pointers or passing around records. And that would compile to C, great, but it would make people very unhappy because that doesn't scale. If you have more than a few functions, inlining everything will give you 2,000, 5,000 line C function bodies. And while for me, I'm like fine with it, the people who look at the C code are not fine with it and they will be like quite upset if I give that to them. And 
And here there's kind of a stumbling point, right? You can't use type classes or dictionaries. Uh, you don't want to pass closures around. It's not idiomatic. And even like truly generic code is very difficult in C because there's no top type. Um, the inlining idea from the previous slide doesn't scale either. Too aggressive, it's, it's unsightly. And that's where we're going to introduce a little uh, cocktail of techniques uh, with partial evaluation, metaprogramming, and a systematic code rewriting pattern. So what we do, and this is the gist of our technique, is that we introduce a systematic rewriting pattern. I'm going to demonstrate it manually, but in the following slide, I will show how to automate it. So if I take the example on the left, this is exactly what we had on the previous slide with find, send, and send U32. Instead of doing inline, inline, I'm going to rewrite this into a higher order style. The find function is going to become parameterized over your choice of equality function. So MK find is a higher order function that receives an equality function. And here's the interesting bit. MK send is a higher order function that receives a specialized version of find for the particular value of E. The universal quantification over the EQ type is outside, which means that MK send first sets your EQ type, then receives a specialized version of find for that EQ type. And what that pattern allows us to do is to uh, instantiate in two steps. First, we generate a version of find that is specialized for u32.eq. And equipped with that specialized version of find, we generate a specialized version of send that refers to find u32. And that's the important bit. We're going to have a specialized copy of find, and send is going to call that specialized copy of find. And what this gives us is actually what we wanted. We get a specialized find u32. It calls the monomorphic u32 equality. And the send function is not aggressively inlined. It actually is specialized for u32 and calls the find u32 function. And that's the essence of our technique. With this, we manage to preserve the shape of the call graph. If I had find and send, I can specialize both find and send and give you a complete copy of the algorithm where every single function has its own specialized variant. That generates very readable C code. Once again, it's kind of like template specialization in C++. I've generated a copy of the entire call graph, and this is a systematic pattern that can scale. And so the step two, of course, is to automate that pattern. So now we offer um, a micro DSL where the user can directly annotate uh, their code. So the user now writes the code on the left. The user doesn't have to write MK or something. All that the user uh, does is say, well, given an equality function, here's my find function written in natural style. Here's my send function that is going to refer to my find function. No particular encoding. The user annotates these three functions, saying that they all need to be specialized over their uh, respective choice of type argument. And then we have a meta program that runs at compile time that executes with an F start inspects this code, entirely rewrites it, and produces the encoding that we just saw on the right. And so the user writes the code on the left. And then once the meta program has rewritten this entire call graph into the uh, higher order version on the right, all the user does is write the instantiations and the uh, specializations. And this is what I uh, refer to as an extra stage. We've essentially equipped F star with the ability to uh, rewrite your code to um, allow you to specialize it for uh, a given uh, choice of uh, equality in this example. And then you can do that as many times as you want. You can do u64.eq, you can do any other type.eq, and you're going to get like, specialized copies of your code uh, for any choice of um, equality. It is sound. Uh, Meta F star rechecks the terms that are generated, so uh, we don't have to worry about um, the, um, an implementation mistake in the rewriting tactic, and it traverses the entire call graph, and it um, allows the user to not have to think about the encoding. We have more bells and whistles. Uh, we can emulate Cox section variables without extending F stars. There's another little facility where you can say, well, this function is just a helper, so that one can be in line the way. It doesn't need to appear as a specialized copy and all, like, a few more gadgets. But the bottom line is that this has turned out to be extremely useful in Hack of Star. So moving away from that little micro example with uh, send and find, what have we been using this for in the real world? Well, first of all, and before I get to the Python use case, first of all, we've been using it for um, a lot of algorithms in uh, Hackle Star. The V2 of Hackle Star called Hackle XN 
leverages uh, SIMD instructions in uh, processors. And so oftentimes we write an entire algorithm that is completely generic over the uh, level of uh, vectorization. So that means that almost all of the code is the same. So it's parametric, it's polymorphic over a data type that's either uh, plain C, 128 bit, uh, yeah, 128 bit uh, vectorized uh, instructions like AVX or NEON or 256 bit like AVX2. And um, this is great. We can write the algorithm once, rely on the tactic, and gen generate three copies of the same algorithm for uh, these three vectorization levels. This is an actual screenshot of how it looks like. Um, splice means insert into the scope the definitions that are produced by the tactic. And then what the user writes is give me a specialized AAD decrypt for a uh, given a specialized ChaCha encrypt and a specialized poly encrypt. We have other um, uses for this in HackleStar. We have notably uh, HPKE, which is a very fun algorithm that combines under the hood uh, three sub algorithms. And so we can write one HPKE and then generate uh, 15 or more if we'd like. There are at least 80 possible options. We can generate like copies of HPKE specialized for a given uh, suffer suite, so a given choice of uh, GH, uh, key derivation, and the uh, signature. Curve uh, 25519 is also a, a fun example. You can choose first whether you want your core field operations to be in assembly or in C, and then you get a field, and then you can choose again and generate multiple copies given your underlying uh, base field. Which brings me to perhaps the flagship application. These are um, already uses of the techniques that I described, but the flagship use of the technique that I described is the streaming API. And that's the stuff that went into Python. So now I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that whole like update business. This is a very nasty state machine. Um, this is a state machine for what's called a block algorithm. A block algorithm means that it processes data uh, block by block. A block is, I don't know, 128 bytes, 64 bytes, whatever but it can only process data one block at a time. And this means that the state machine is super tricky. Um, you must feed the data block by block, which is not realistic for most use cases because you don't always have like an amount of data coming in that you wanna hash that's to a multiple of the block size. Um, it's also a nasty state machine because if you want to compute the hash, the digest, uh, you kill your state. Your state becomes invalid. And so oftentimes you wanna compute intermediary hashes as the data comes in and that requires great care and there's like a precise sequence of operations to obey. And so no one uses that, right? No one uses uh, that block uh, API. What everyone uses is called a uh, streaming API, which has the beautiful state machine uh, up on the top right. And it, the uh, streaming API takes care of the buffering. The streaming API maintains a little internal buffer that fills up, and then when it's full, it flushes it into the underlying hash algorithm. And it takes care of all of the internal details. Um, it uh, doesn't invalidate the state when you extract a digest. And so this is what you wanna deal with as a client. If you're Python, that's the API that you're actually using. Uh, but well, the reason we're here is that this API is uh, very tricky to implement correctly. So um, there has been a very fun series of uh, papers that have found um, bugs in this very uh, streaming layer for reference implementations, uh, notably of the SHA-3 uh, hashing algorithms. And because Python maintains in its source repository a copy of this uh, reference implementation of SHA-3, Python inherited the SHA-3 bug and uh, ended up with a CVE. And that's where we came in. So uh, we got in touch with the Python folks who were super nice and uh, they were very uh, on board with the idea of replacing their buggy algorithms with a uh, verified version of it. So we were able to write uh, the streaming API using the style that I described. Uh, we wrote it once, we verified it once, but then we used those techniques to specialize it for um, about 15 applications. Uh, Python took a large amount of those and uh, that gave us enormous code savings. Um, it would have been absolutely impossible to verify streaming APIs for each one of the uh, hash algorithms that we have. And so uh, this technique of writing the streaming API once and specializing it multiple times for SHA-2 in four variants, SHA-3, six variants, MD5, SHA-1 for legacy, et cetera, that gave us like, a huge boost in productivity and that actually led us to a proof to code ratio of 0.51, uh, which means that every line of F star yields two lines of C code. That metric has its limits. The reason I'm mentioning it is that we've been using that metric in previous papers and we never attained such like a low ratio. So that means that it's a massive improvement in productivity compared to earlier versions of Hagglestar. 
we've had an excellent engagement with the Python team. We replaced all of their built-in uh, hash implementations, except for Blake 2, which will happen soon. And it's a good confirmation uh, that our work had practical impact. Um, it forced us to uh, polish a lot of what we did and uh, do some serious packaging work, but uh, it's good because our code is better off for it now. And uh, that's about it. The lessons that I want to like, uh, leave you with is that the arsenal of PL techniques uh, allowed us to get the best of both worlds, operate at a very high level while still generating very low level, very specialized code. We have essentially an extra compiler stage that implements something like C++ template specialization. This found a lot of applications within Hypolstar and our flagship application was the streaming API that transforms the unsafe state machine into a safe one and that one was integrated into Python. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Yes. Uh, please line up for questions. And uh, please uh, introduce yourself with um, your name and affiliation. And please eat the mic. <laughs> well, close to the mic, well, as close as possible. Thank Can you. I see the nutrition facts first? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Hello, this is Adam Tapala from MIT. You mentioned how you don't have to trust your rewriting process because the results of it are reject. Mm -hmm. That sounds like you could have some downsides, like presumably that would mean you don't actually know that all the instantiations of each abstraction are correct unless you've tried all of them, and it might actually be more expensive to check the specialized versions than the original one. Is that all uh, fair so far? It's the uh, elaborator reflection design, right? that uh, the compiler exposes a safe API to you that doesn't allow you to create um, anything that would end up being accepted as an invalid, uh, ill-typed term. Um, there are no facilities currently in FSTAR that would allow you to show once and for all that the rewriting uh, tactic always produces well-typed terms. Mm. In practice, uh, the transformation is uh, pretty systematic and explains itself rather well, and so once we debugged it, this was like three, or three years ago, we haven't had any issues since. But in a security context like this, you can imagine someone purposely choosing a weird set of parameters where they'd noticed a corner case in your, your rewriter and maybe they would be able to get around a supposed proof that had already been constructed. Where I guess comp compilation would fail, which would be a little surprising. You wouldn't deploy that code, but nonetheless, there might have been a bug lurking in there. Is that right? I'm having a hard time imagining something like that happening, but let's okay. check more afterwards. Okay, thanks. Max Vanema, undergrad at UIEC. I'm wondering um, how Hacklestar deals with like timing attacks or like, other kinds of side channel attacks. Is that out of scope? Sorry, deals with what? H how does Hacklestar deal with like timing attacks or timing attacks. other kind of side channel attacks? Yes, so, so uh, there's a type-based discipline in which uh, secret data doesn't enjoy the operations that the rest of the data has, like division. And secret data is a distinct abstract type, so you can't use it for memory accesses or uh, branching. And so that rules out uh, the most standard classes of side channel attacks, and that's the discipline that we use throughout. Even with like specialization, with like, different vectorization primi primitives? Yeah, the specialization still um, doesn't traverse the abstraction boundaries, so it won't look underneath. So there's a different flavor of integer that I didn't show here called secret integer, S32.t, and the specialization will not, uh, it can't actually, it can't look underneath the S32.t abstraction, so, um, you still, um, the guarantees are preserved after specialization. It's a typing guarantee because the specialized code still type checks, and it means that it still enjoys that uh, degree of side channel resistance. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks. And yes, and there is actually um, a similar question by Edwin Turek uh, from Zen Server on, online. So if you implement RSA, for instance, can you require that something equivalent to RSA, uh, RSA blinding is used? Uh, Array what? RSA blinding. Uh, RSA blinding, yeah. So on, t on, on top of that, we, um, like we have a, a set of library functions that uh, you have to go through if you want to do certain things, such as like masking equality functions uh, and the like. I don't know about RSA blinding specifically, but we uh, oftentimes do, uh, do impose uh, these restrictions. And this is our last question for this. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Ryan Steele, CMU. Uh, I have a quick question about other applications. This seems very um, in line with something along the lines of um, a neural network uh, uh, performance kernel implementation. Have you actually looked at that kind of application? 
Uh, we have not, but we uh, welcome uh, new uh, contributors to Hacklestar. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Jonathan. And Thanks. thank you. Thank you again. And now um, we have. Um, I don't know who is. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yes, one second, one second, one second. Yes, you can turn your computer away. Yes, and now we have uh, Hiroyuki Katsura from the University of Tokyo, who is going to tell us about uh, higher order property directed reach reachability. And once again, online, please post on the uh, Discord thread. I'm going to revive it and to mute myself. Oh, 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 okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. So, uh, hi, I'm here at Katsura from the University of Tokyo in Japan. And today I'm going to talk about higher order property directed reachability. Uh, this is a joint work with Naoki Kobayashi and Ryosuke Sato. Uh, first of all, PDR or Property Directed Reachability is one of the most successful methods in the pro context of first order program verification. Uh, however, we want to consider automated higher order program verification, and we think automated program, higher order program verification is still not satisfactory. So, this situation gave rise to the following questions. What would PDR uh, for high, high order, oh, sorry. What happens if PDR applies, is applied to the high order program verification? And if it's possible, then does it work effectively or not? To answer these questions, we formalize our method HOPDR for new HFLZ, which is a higher order logic with, uh, for program verification by utilizing polymorphic refinement intersection types. We also implemented a um, preliminary solver based on the proposed method, and we also evaluated our work with previous existing solvers. Oh, sorry. And finally, we compared our work with other methods by re defining their methods in HOPDR's our style transition rules. But we, we don't dig into the detail of this uh, comparison in this talk, so if you are interested, please refer to our paper. First of all, we want to talk about our motivation of this research. Um, we want to consider automated high order program verification. And in, in fact, in recent years, various approaches to automated high-order program verification have been proposed, including host model checking, or refinement type inferences, or logic pro program verification. Oh. <laughs> However, um, we think that they are not still satisfactory in terms of efficiency or expressiveness of the background type system. So this is the motivation for considering yet another approach like HOPDR. Then, what is new HFLZ and why we target new HFLZ when we formalize HOPDR? Um, new HFLZ is a high order logic with integers and greatest fixed points. Um, it can capture properties of higher order functional programs very naturally and uniformly. Consider the following situation. Um, given a program in some language, and given also you are given a specification like lack of assertion failures or uncaught exceptions or whatever. And now you have to write a verifier for this program. Then if you use new HFLZ framework, then you can just reduce the program to the variety checking of new HFLZ formula, and then use the off the shell new HFLZ solver to check if the original problem is valid or not. And in fact, this is the similar situation in the, uh, in the first order context. Uh, CHC solving or CHC satisfiability checking is utilized for verifying first order program verification uh, in widely. And to solve satisfiability checking of CHC, uh, PDR or SPACER, which is the extended, extended version of PDR, is utilized. So in this sense, uh, extending PDR to higher order is reasonable. And so now we, are, we want to look at how it is applied to uh, uh, OCaml program verification now. This program, some function, uh, takes an integer x 
and calculate the summation from one or one to x, and then finally passes the result to the continuation function k. And in the main function, it takes an integer n non-deterministically and passes that integer to the sum function and finally checks if the result r is greater than or equal to n. Does this OCAM program never fails or in other words, does this assertion never fails? This is an instance of safety property problem of functional programs. And this kind of problem is reduced to the following new JFLZ variety checking problem by the reduction of Kobayashi and others in a sound and complete manner. And actually, we don't dig into the detail of new HFLZ formula syntax, but basically, new HFLZ formula is comprised of a top level formula like this and fixed point equation like this. And this function, some function, is actually a higher order recursive function, and it is reduced to the following higher order predicate that is defined by greatest fixed point. And if you look at uh, the body of the program and higher order predicate, then you may notice that the cross correspondence between them. And from this observation, you may understand uh, the, this reduction does not lose any information. So that's why we think this is um, um, like this uh, unit HFLZ can capture properties of higher order programs. And then the main function is reduced to the following top level formula of new HFLZ. And now what we want to do here is to solve this variety checking problem automatically and efficiently. And this is what uh, our work is try, tries to do. Then before we talk about how to solve this variety checking problem, uh, by utilizing HOPDR, we want to talk about uh, PDR, which is the first order setting. PDR takes a transition system like this, input init states and bad states and step function, and checks if the bad state is reachable or not from initial state in finite steps. So if there is a counter example from initial state to bad states, then we can say it's reachable. But if you want to uh, prove unreachability of the problem, then you have to uh, infinitely uh, expand the post condition due to the existence of integer arithmetics. So to saturate in finite steps, uh, we have to uh, invent some good in inductive invariant which uh, satisfies these two conditions. And first condition says, uh, inductive invariant is uh, in invariant to the post condition and inductive invariant also does not violate the safety condition. So if you can find this kind of state set, then we can say the original problem is valid. But how do, I, how do we do it is the problem. To do so, PDR, uh, in the PDR, we rephrase the original problem to like this. Uh, instead of thinking that uh, expanding initial state finite and uh, infinite times, we consider from both sides then in PDR, we over approximate and under approximate of these uh, state sets by like this. And actually, this uh, CI uh, represents the under approximation of uh, uh, expanding bad states for k minus i times, and RI represents the over approximation of reachable sets in i, I steps from uh, initial states. And by repeatedly uh, refining these configurations, uh, PDR hopes to find an inductive invariant in finite steps. And in the context of first order PDR, CI, which is a counterexample, is represented as the model of the background theory, and RI is represented as the first order formula. But now we want to consider higher order setting, and then how, oh, sorry. How to, find, uh, how to handle higher order predicates in these states. This is the problem. And our key idea for HOPDR is to use refinement types for expressing approximations. So in the higher order setting, we consider refinement types as the over approximation of reachable sets, and CI, which is a recursion-free formula, uh, as the counterexample, so that we can handle high, higher order predicate in the counterexample naturally. And in fact, these types and formulas are considered to be extended version of state sets. So if you express uh, these configuration in this way, then you can naturally of the, uh, extend, expand, uh, extend PDR setting to the higher order case. 
Um, so, to explain this uh, higher order property directed reachability, uh, we, we want to talk about refi our refinement type system. Um, our refinement type system is, in fact, an extension of uh, refinement type system proposed by Cascade, Bann, and others. In terms of that, we, we are, we, our refinement type system contains polymorphic types and intersection types. And intuitively, um, refinement types is, our refinement types give over approximation of formulas. And in this sense, uh, we think uh, higher order, this kind of refinement. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, this kind of refinement type is considered to be higher order extension of uh, state sets. And this is the syntax for, uh, this is the syntax for a refinement type. And this guy is the type of pi such that theta implies pi, right? So the formula x is greater than zero has the following refinement types like this. And this is the syntax for the predicate that takes an integer. And this, uh, importantly, we, in this set in, oh, sorry, okay. Sorry, okay. Oh, oh, can you hear me? Okay. Then, uh, so let's, uh, let's talk about this refinement type you know, for high, the predicate that takes an integer. Uh, in this, in our setting, uh, tau, can depend on x, which is this integer variable. So we can write this kind of uh, refinement type for this formula. And then thirdly, this is the syntax for higher order predicate. And importantly, our, uh, in our type system, we can write intersection type at the position of argument, okay? Finally, this is the syntax for polymorphic type. Then if you ignore this higher order part, then you obtain, uh, we obtain the, uh, we can say that this refinement type is equivalent to the approximation of the PDL setting, original PDL setting. Because if you uh, translate this uh, reachable sets uh, in the original PDL can be reduced to the following uh, refinement type. Then by utilizing this refinement type system, uh, we uh, formalize higher order property directed reachability. First of all, um, now, instead of thinking of a uh, transition system, an unreachability problem of a transition system, we think we consider a variety checking of new TFLZ formula where it is represented as top level formula phi and fixed point equation. For example, this is an example of new TFLZ formula. And now, the goal of HOPDR is the type environment gamma, like this such that these two conditions hold. And recall that uh, the first order setting of PDR, this condition, this condition can be considered as the higher order extension of this one, which is the first condition for inductive invariant. And this one is the higher order extension of this condition. And so this condition says that for each type uh, assignment in the type environment gamma, we can assign that type to the uh, body of the type fixed point equation under the con assumption of type environment gamma. And probably this is, the, we can understand uh, analogy to the typing of recursive function in functional program literature. And secondly, this condition says gamma is strong enough to prove the variety of the top level formula. So if you can find this type of, this type of environment, then we can say the original problem is varied. And so then to find this kind of type of environment, HOPDL tries to uh, refine and relight configuration of the form like this, as we did in PDL. So, and this is the high order extension, high order extended version, so gamma i is represent represents the higher order I know, <laughs> um, over approximation of uh, fixed point with i time unfolding of fixed points. And secondly, uh, counterexample sequence ci represents the under approximation of counterexample with i time unfolding of fixed point. Then we want to find this type environment gamma by relighting these configurations 
using these transition rules. And this rule is actually a high order extension of the uh, G original GPD uh, uh, proposed by Holder and Biona. Uh, and you don't have to uh, understand the detail of the, uh, we don't have to understand the detail of this rule itself, but basically each rule says that um, given, a trans given a configuration like this, then if the, these assumptions uh, are satisfied, then you can obtain another refined version of configuration. Okay. Then uh, we wanna see how they, these rules are applied to a learning example. So we're gonna consider this example. This is an um, example of UTF-AZ formula, and this one top level formula says M is greater than one implies FM, uh, where FM is defined as the fixed point equation. And if it, if, so if it's defined as the greatest fixed point that satisfies this equation holds. Um, then um, this instance is actually varied because if you consider replacing fx with x is greater than zero, then top, from the top level formula, we obtain this formula, which is trivially true. And also from the fixed point equation, we obtain this uh, formula. This is also true. So in this sense, uh, we can say m is greater than zero is a candidate for an inductive invariant. But now, how to find this m is greater than zero automatically is the issue for HLPDL. So let's see how HLPDL finds this kind of inductive invariant by applying the transition rules and rewriting configuration one by one. First of all, HLPDL starts with init rule. This introduces the strongest type of environment to the sequence of approximation. And Unfortunately, strongest type of environment is not invariant. So uh, HOPDL thinks that we have to collect more information from fixed point equation. So we unfold once the fixed point by utilizing unfold loop. And by utilizing unfold loop, we introduce the weakest type of environment to the approximation sequence. Then this weakest type of environment is not strong enough to prove the variety of the top level formula. So now we obtain um, counterexample to the, this type of environment, counterexample formula to the, this type of environment. And then we wanna check if this counterexample is superior or not. And in fact, you don't have to understand this derivation itself, but um, this counterexample, it can be refuted by utilizing uh, the previous type of environment, topped gamma. And by finding this type of environment, uh, by using procedure that we introduce, uh, we can e apply conflict rule like this. And by utilizing this type of environment, we can say this counterexample phi can be derived. So we introduce this type of environment to the sequence of uh, the count approximation, and then now the sequence of approximation is refined. But unfortunately, this gamma one is still not an inductive invariant. So we continue to unfold fixed point again and we obtain another candidate. And at this time, we have more information than before. And if the interpolation solver is smart enough, then we obtain this type of environment by utilizing this conflict group. And Fortunately, this is an inductive invariant, so we can conclude by utilizing this type of environment, uh, this original problem is buried. This is how HOPDL finds an inductive invariant by repeatedly um, relighting configurations. But how about invariant case? Um, now, we modify this part here, so now this instance is invariant because if you uh, unfold this fixed point twice, then you obtain zero not equal to zero, which is always true false. And so for this instance, actually the f initial procedure for proving, disproving this instance is same as the previous buried case up to this part. But for this part, actually the, after the second candidate, this formula 
it could not be proved under the type environment gamma one, unlike the valid case. So we obtain another counterexample by expanding the fixed point of the counterexample like this, and by applying this side rule. Then we obtain another counterexample by expanding the counterexample again, and now the length of the counterexample sequence is uh, equal to the length of the type environment, so we can say this uh, instance is invalid. Okay, so this is how HOPDL repeatedly relies the configurations and obtain counterexample or uh, in inductive invariant. And so far we explained our procedure by utilizing a fast order formula but actually for the simplicity problem, but actually in, the, in our paper uh, there is a um, learning example for higher order formulas. And also probably you may wonder how to find a good type environment, gamma prime at conflict inference. And actually this is an, another important uh, issue for HOPDL and it is explained also in our paper. Also, um, there are some properties uh, that are required for refinement type system to make the HOPDL works effectively. And there are so other technical details uh, for uh, making uh, the whole procedure work efficiently. So if you're interested, please check our paper for the detail. Finally, uh, we wanna talk about uh, the experimental result. So far we talk about uh, how HOPDL is formalized and based on this formalization we implemented um, a preliminary solver based on the proposed approach. And so and we also take a benchmark set from safety property problem of higher order function programs and we conducted an experiment like this. And unfortunately, PDL HFL or HOPDL itself does not uh, outperform other, our, uh, other existing solvers, but we think there are some promising results. First of all, PDL HFL could solve problems that RESTful could not, where RESTful is the state of the art uh, HF, new HFLZ solver. And another thing is that um, PDL HFL tends to solve um, unsafe instances faster than before uh, previous methods. And finally, a virtually combined solver, PDL HFL plus RESTful is the best solver among these uh, higher order program verification methods. And so from these experimental results, we think this solver is complementary to the previous method. Um, finally, we wanna talk about our related work First of all, uh, there are some existing UHFLG solvers, like based on constraint home closure solving or predicate abstraction on SIGA, but we think our solver is complementary to their solver. And another thing probably you may wonder is that um, PDL, HOPDL is the higher order extension of PDL or not, and from the comparison we conducted in the paper, uh, we, uh, we confirmed that PDL for linear HCHC is obtained by a special case of HOPDL. So in this sense, our procedure HOPDL is the higher order extension of PDL. And finally, our procedure is also applicable to full HFLZ validity checking as a building block of the solver. And full HFLZ validity checker can handle arbitrary temporal uh, properties. So in that sense, this uniform approach can obtain more wider uh, properties can be handled in this framework. Um, so this is uh, HOPDL, and finally we will conclude our talk. Uh, we formalized HOPDL on top of polymorphic refinement type intersection types, for new, and we formalized HOPDL for new HFLZ variety checking. And we implemented a preliminary solver based on the proposed method and evaluated our work with the benchmarks and, and compared our work with previous methods and cons we consider that there are, uh, our solver is complementary to their solvers. Finally, we compared our work with other higher order pre program verification methods so that we can see how different it is. And so if you're interested this, in this part, then you can refer to our paper. Uh, that's it, thank you for listening, and yeah, I'm happy to take some questions.
Uh, hello. Could, could the third speaker please come forward to the podium uh, while um, uh, you can line up for questions? Uh, once again, please uh, tell us your, your name and affiliation and hit the mic. You can also ask your questions on uh, the uh, Discord thread. And uh, while there are, uh, do you have a question? Ah, sorry. Uh, ah, yes, okay, thank you. Um, you have a question? Ah, okay. Then, uh, I, then I do. I do have a question. So, if you could uh, back to, uh, two uh, or three slides before, please. Three slides before. Okay. This one. Uh, yes. Thank you. So, you mean that PDRFL could solve problems that RETHFL could not? What kind of uh, uh, problems that? Uh, yes. What kind of problems? Uh, basically, these problems are like firstly, uh, unsafe instances are not. Uh, P RESTful is not good at solving unsafe instances. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, RESTful is not complete in terms of the background type system. And there are some instances that cannot be handled in the background, uh, in the framework of RESTful. But our system uh, contains homomorphic types and intersection types. And in this sense, expressive, expressiveness is greater than their method. Okay. And in such, uh, so such instances can be solved. Our solver, but their solver cannot solve such. Okay. Thank you. Um, oops, but oops, oh, if you, yes, if you can stay on this slide, maybe. Uh, um, do you? I mean, do you have one idea why uh, PJ, PDR HFL alone? Uh, uh, Performs worse than uh, uh, the, the other uh, uh, servers that you should um, use. Basically, the type system itself is a bit difficult compared with other solvers. Okay. This is one reason. And another reason is probably um, other methods uh, finally reduces the problem to the background, like well implemented solver, like CHG solving or mm -hmm. other host model checking methods. And they, they, their solvers are good at finding fixed points, but we have to handle such kind of fixed point solving in this framework. So in this sense, we have to implement more to find efficiently find uh, fixed points okay. in this framework. So it, this is the second reason for it. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Let me see if, know, is there any question on Discord? Let me see. You know. Any further questions? Uh, I think uh, if there are if no further <laughs> questions, then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Hello. Hello. Who is the third speaker? Leon Gondelman. Leon, can you share your screen, please? Leon? Hello? Yeah, now we hear you. Uh, give me a moment. Can you try now? Okay, give us just a moment. is remote we are setting uh, him up one second sorry about that
Yes, we can see we can see your screen in the room. Yes, uh, on the in the s in the room we can see the your slides moving. Yes. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Thank you. So the uh, next speaker is uh, Leon Golden uh, Gondelman. Sorry. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, please go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Leon, and I'm going to present uh, a work that we recently did with uh, Jonas, Mario, Amin, and Lars on verifying reliable network components in distributed separation logic using dependent separation protocols. It's a very long title, so let's investigate together what's behind it. So this work is, in one word, is about tying two loose ends. On one end, we have session type based reasoning about reliable communication. And on the other uh, hand, we are tying reasoning uh, and program logics about distributed programs running over an unreliable network. And our work makes the following contribution in a nutshell. Uh, we come up with a you know, reliable dependent transfer of resources pattern that allows to reason about uh, reliable dependent transfer of resources over an unreliable network. And our work also provides a first foundational verification of a um, reliable client-server communication library, and uh, on top of which we build also a verification of remote procedure call and a key value store with a lazy replication. Um, so let's... Uh, motivates this work with the following example, in which we see two processes, process one and process two on left and right, that uh, communicate through a channel uh, with two chan and, uh, channel endpoints, C and C prime. The uh, first process uh, sends two uh, words, carp and DM over a channel, and then uh, waits to receive uh, two messages back and asserts that the length of the, so what it should receive is the length of the messages back, and then it asserts that the first message should be of, of length five and the second message should be of, of uh, length four. And the other process is kind of like a server. It just receives a message and then sends back the length of the request of the string. And, and uh, so um, uh, obvious observation with which we can make is that um, the assertion about messages, messages lengths hold only if the communication is reliable, meaning that the messages are uh, receive it uh, in order and without duplicates. And then the question is, uh, well, how do we can, how can we prove that formally? How do, how can we capture this uh, formally? Uh, one possible solution for that would be to uh, come up with a program logic that provides a formalism to specify the communication between processes in a given program, program like I showed just before. And that uh, comes with a proof rules to specify the behavior of communication primitives along with the fact that it should also enforce the implementation of communication primitives, primitives is indeed reliable. And um, here we see that we have some design choices for such a program logic. Well, it depends on what is a formalism to describe reliable communication and what are communicating processes themselves? Are they threads uh, or are they network nodes? And then also how the communication is actually implemented. So um, uh, one possible uh, implementation, one possible setting would be a message passing inherency, where processes are thread running in parallel. So here, uh, what we see is that we can create those uh, channel endpoints uh, synchronously, uh, and then uh, just uh, spawn two threads, process one and process two, which do the job we described before. And uh, it happens that for the processes running in parallel on the same machine for the message passing concurrency, uh, such a program logic has been recently developed uh, and it is Actress framework developed by Jonas and, um, and uh, others. And um, Actress framework, it specifies the communication protocols by mean of so-called dependent separation protocols. And it provides abstract logical model of reliable communication via so-called Actress growth theory. And finally, it uses this separation logic of uh, Iris framework to build a dedicated program logic to reason about message passing concurrency. 
uh, let's see in, just in details what all this means because we are going to use this through this talk. So dependent separation protocols is um, an expressive variant of session types. One can see it like that. So which means that um, I hope you can see my mouse moving. Uh, I guess so. Um, so dependent separation protocols is uh, they're described by the following grammar. One can send a message or uh, receive a message and advance in the protocol or terminate the protocol. And when one sends um, a message, uh, unlike just in like in session types, when it's characterized just by the type, one can send uh, for the value uh, of the type, it can uh, one can transfer a resource associated with this value. And uh, this resource can depend on some binders. Uh, so hence the word dependent. Um, and uh, those sep uh, those uh, separation protocols, they just like uh, standard session types, they come with notions of duality and sub protocol relation. And for duality, it means basically that uh, what one process as sense is viewed by the other process as uh, something received and vice versa. And the sub protocol relation essentially allows to swap between uh, sent and received messages if. Uh, what we uh, receive and send are uh, independent. Um, and this is useful to, for instance, specify and verify the example that uh, our motivating example, whereas the protocol for our echo server would be from the point of view of the server, it would be a recursive protocol where the process two receives uh, a string and then it sends back the uh, length of the string. And then the protocol for the process one would be the dual of it when it sends a string and it should receive uh, the length of the string. And the swapping is quite important here because one uh, subtlety is uh, that the um, process one, it uh, sends two messages ahead of receiving them. So it doesn't send and receive, send and receive. So it wants to perform two sends first and then make two receives. And well, thanks to sub protocol relation, uh, it is possible because the protocol for the process one is a subtype of the precise protocol we need. And then of course we need a program proof rules for send and receive to make this reasoning uh, factual. And this uh, exactly where Actress provides a program logic for message passing concurrency by defining a channel endpoint pointer, a ch channel endpoint ownership, uh, which associates the physical channel C with the protocol and then uh, provides the proof rules for creating a synchron channel synchronously, uh, channel both channel endpoints, and then provides the specification for send and receive. Uh, if we see very quickly this uh, the rule for uh, for send, for instance, uh, one has to have an ownership for the channel endpoint such that one can uh, know that the protocol is a state where one can send a message and give up resources associated with this message and then get back updated ownership for the uh, channel endpoint. All right. So this is what has been done recently for message passing concurrency. But what if processes that we are considering are running actually on separate machines and communicate with each other over network? So basically, what if our little example with the send and receive and, and the server loop, they are a part of a bigger program which is a distributed program with a client and a server that falls down in a classical paradigm when we create a, a client socket and we connect the client to the server after which we do all this stuff. And then uh, on, the, on the server side, we also create a server socket and then the server listens to accept new connections. And once the server accepts connection, it can serve each client uh, as we described previously. And the problem here, we can observe that, well, the network communication is fundamental and reliable, unlike the message passing occurrence, because messages can be lost, can be reordered or duplicated. And uh, so one needs, of course, uh, to use a reliable transport layer such as TCP, SCTP, or a custom reliable transport layer uh, to make this communication reliable. And the research question we ask in this work is, okay, can we apply actually 
the ACRIS framework, uh, namely dependent separation protocols and the ACRIS goal theory to verify uh, such an implementation of reliable network communication layer so that we, in the end, are able to enable high-level reasoning about distributed applications, uh, which we will we would be build on top of such layer. Uh, and our approach is the following. So we implemented in this work a reliable communication library for client-server communication in OCaml. We then translate this implementation into an Aeroslang using a, a simple compiler. And the Aeroslang is itself uh, an OCaml-like language, but it comes with a well-defined formal semantics and uh, a machinery to reason about a program's reason, um, written in this language. This machinery is called Aneris, Aneris program logic. And then we're going to use this program logic of Aneris and the Actress framework to verify this implementation. And once that's done, we are able to build um, distributed applications and libraries on top of RCLIP, such as remote procedure call. So let's see uh, those steps in little detail. Um, what is our library? So our library um, is very much alike, uh, like realistic libraries like TCP or SCTP in the, in, in the sense that it features BSD sockets like primitives, like connect and listen and accept and send and receive. Uh, it also uses uh, an SCTP for handshake connection uh, establishment and uh, it uh, um, provides the channel descriptors um, on which uh, send and receive operates, um, which under the hood use uh, buffered bidirectional uh, channels. And uh, the reliability is enforced uh, through classical mechanisms such as sequence ID, acknowledgements, or other retransmission mechanism. And it's approximately uh, 300, 400 lines of all kind of code. So uh, here is uh, just uh, uh, how our OCaml API looks like. And uh, indeed, it looks uh, pretty much standard apart from uh, uh, two differences. We make an explicit distinction between client and server sockets um, and channel descriptors. And the second is that what we're going to send over the net, or what we're going to send is not um, strings, but uh, values so that it's a bit more high level. And in order to do so, we are um, parameterizing our uh, 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 API with a serializer. So when the client starts to, wants to connect, it needs first to explain how the uh, values that will be sent to the server will be serialized. And similarly, how the values that the server sends to the client will be serialized. All right. And so uh, once we implement this library, we then translate it into an Slang, which uh, is a formal language with uh, um, well-defined operational semantics that features um, node local concurrency and um, UDP socket primitives. So it's uh, uh, about a UDP uh, network. And it comes also with an Aris program logic that allows to uh, that provides proof rules to reason precisely about this not local concurrency and to reason about uh, communication and reliable communication over UDP network. And it is built on top of Iris framework, uh, so in COG, and um, benefits from all features of Iris framework. Um, sorry. Um, so how do we verify? What, what is the um, crux of the verification of our sleep? Well, the key component of the verification is uh, what we call a session escrow pattern that links together the unreliable spatial, spatial resource transfer uh, in an areas and the reliable dependent resource transfer of actors. And once this link, link is established, we can define uh, an ownership uh, for channel endpoint, and we can verify send and receive implementation with respect to the, spe uh, the following specs um which look almost like the specs for that we have seen for message passing concurrency the only difference being that the channel ownership uh, channel and ownership is parameterized by the serializer and the ip address 
but essentially those specs look really really almost the same as uh actress provides for message passing concurrency and so let's see in details uh so what's the challenge is to to provide this thing and why do we need escrow such an escrow pattern well to understand that let's first see how resource transfer is realized in an errors so in an errors uh, where one reason is about unreliable communication. Um, <clears throat> um, when one uh, wants to transfer resource uh, resources over the network, one sends a, a message from uh, from socket handler S1. Um, and in that moment, one uh, has to provide a resource phi M, M1. Let's say we send a message M1, where phi is a function from messages to the propositions. So our resource is indexed by messages that we, we send. And then, well, this resource doesn't go through through the network. This resource is put into, so let's say, it, a logical box from which the uh, receiver can get, acquire this, this resource uh, once it receives the message. Now, the, the, um, the question is, how does it receive? Because the problem is that the messages can be lost or they can be duplicated. So the um, receiver should receive the message only once. And, uh, and uh, we achieve this by, by um, sending over the network, not the resource, because this can be, cannot be done. Because if the message is lost, the resource is lost. So the, the resource has to stay in the logical box. So what we can send over the network is a duplicable certi certificate that the message has been sent. And because the certificate is duplicable, we can send as many such certificates as we send messages until the very first message uh, of all copies of the message arrives to the to the receiver. In, in, and using this certificate, uh, the receiver can open the box uh, and retrieve the, the resource. Now, this um, enables retransmission of uh, of, uh, and safe transfer of special resources, but it doesn't allow dependencies between resources that are stored in the logical context. And indeed, there might be several resources that uh, such resources that are in transit. So if we send say, say message M2, M1 and M2, well then can arrive, they can arrive out of order and the boxes in which we store resources for both messages, they are completely unrelated. And well, this doesn't uh, fit to verify reliable communication library because precisely their messages are indexed uh, by some um, integer which enforces uh, the sequence ID, which inform enforces that the messages uh, are stored on the receiver side in the order they have been uh, sent. So on the other side, uh, if we look how the Actress goes theory um, allows reliable dependent transfer. Um, uh, we can what, what happens in actress goes theory is that this transfer is modeled using some a pair of logical buffers uh, v1 v2, which describes symmetrically for each direction um, the messages that are in transit and that are governed inside uh, another logical box inside iris invariant by some shared resource called the proto context that uh, precisely tracks what are the messages in transit. And here the idea is that the actress goes here comes with um, some logical rules that allow to create the the context the context with message no message no messages being yet in transit and some um, and two resources uh, that govern the the protocol for both sides here we don't see the uh, physical channel endpoints but one can guess that it is those resources that will be used to define uh, precisely channel endpoints and the idea is that when um, one wants to logically send a, a message using actors go theory then one has to own uh, the proto own resource um have the resource to be sent which happens to be the on the head of the protocol opens the logical box and then pre prepend to the to the end of the buffer v1 uh, the um, 
the message to be sent and then uh, get back after an update the updated endpoint for itself. And um, similarly for receive. So this is only uh, shown for one side. Right. Um, so Akris goes theory allows dependencies between resources stored in the shared logical context. But the problem is that as such, it doesn't talk about um, certificates. So it doesn't use an escrow pattern. And this um, way of sending duplicable resources, which it is indeed need, what we need to connect Arthur's logical state with a special transfer uh, using duplicable witness, witnesses in an array. And um, of course, also those duplicable witnesses, they must appropriately reflect the actress logical state so that resources that can be acquired in accordance to their dependence. And uh, what it means is that on top of actress go theory, we uh, built the following uh, theory, which we call session escrow pattern, which comes with the following rules. Those rules look, they have some similarity with actress go theory, but they present something novel. So instead of having the logical con now the, our logical context and the resources for both sides, um, they are parameterized by two numbers. The um, left number um, tracks how many messages has been sent uh, over this uh, channel endpoint. And the second number shows how many messages has been received. So that when we, oops, sorry. Um, so that uh, when we um, when we send um, let's say when we send a message uh, logically we uh, go from number n to n plus one and uh, another uh, thing that we can observe in in those rules is that whenever uh, send happens um, we obtain not we obtain not just updated um, uh, ownership of uh, of as own, but we also create a duplicable witness that we indeed have made this update uh, uh, called as IDX. And this, uh, the rule um, session uh, escrow uh, duplication precisely states that this witness can uh, is duplicable. And now this is resource that we can actually send along, along messages uh, over the network. Because this is will be duplicate um, uh, du duplicable. Sorry. Um, I'm lacking a bit of time, so I will um, keep uh, this slide. But um, I will just say that the um, once we have once we define this session escrow pattern, we're able indeed to define this uh, channel end or channel endpoint ownership and verify the implementation of send and receive, which under the hood using uses this channel descriptor and the uh, send and receive buffers. And so uh, the important points here are that the implementation of send and receive themselves, they are network agnostic because they are communicate with network indirect, indirectly via this um, channel descriptor. And uh, th thanks to that, um, verification of send and receive for client and for server is exactly the same. Um, I will very quickly, um, mm -hmm. I will skip this because I'm out of time. I will just uh, say a couple of words about uh, the verified remote procedure call. So on top of uh, our library, we build um, the remote procedure call uh, library, which allows you far further abstract away details of, of communication and build distributed application in a more high level. So um, and now we have a, we can uh, implement uh, application just by uh, making RPC request. So the idea is that if the user provides uh, the um, yes, if the user, I think, yes, sorry, I think, I think it, you should uh, conclude, please. Because, yes. yes, okay. Sorry, I was a bit slow. Um, I will just conclude then. So um, before this work, um, 
we um, we have just uh, an error program logic which models unreliable network communication and allows verification of distributed programs running or on top of UDP such as CRDTs. And what happens happened with this work is that our reliable um, session library, it allows to abstract over low level rely unreliable network details. So that now we can build clients and applications uh, that necessitate reliable communication. And furthermore, uh, we build as a library, as a middleware on top of this uh, reliable communication library, we build the remote procedure call library which further abstracts uh, away even um, high level reliable network details. So that applications such as distributed key value stores or uh, um, transactional uh, databases, they can be built directly on top of RPC without even reasoning at all about network. And uh, this really provides us, now we can develop uh, modu uh, distributed application in a highly modular modular way. Um, oh, sorry, I was a bit out of time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Um, so, please, please line up for oops, please line up for questions and uh, uh, say your name and affiliation and uh, eat the mic if uh, right. And while you are lining up for questions, I have a question online from Edwin Turek. Mm -hmm. uh, from, um, uh, yes. Uh, where is the question? Sorry. Oops, I lost it. Sorry. Where is it? Um, I lost my question. Where is it? Yes. Thank you. Yes, Edwin Turek from Zen Server. Yes, is uh, the RCLib, uh, RCLib uh, available somewhere online? And how does the key value store compare to uh, production implementations like uh, etcd? Uh, um, can you repeat the end, just the end of the question and how it compares to etcd? Yes. Yes. Um, Yes, uh, it is uh, available online on, uh, and there is a GitHub repo, uh, and also in the artifact uh, provided for this uh, uh, for this project. And um, um, it's difficult to. I think the comparison is to, uh, the actual comparison is to be done, but. Um, this the implementation of reliable communication and the libraries built on top of it. Uh, they feature they do feature realistic. Uh, they have several realistic features of um, existing uh, industrial products, but I don't think that they are really competitive with it yet. In any sense, so it's more of a proof of a concept in that sense. Thank you. Any further questions? Let me see. Are there any further questions online? Uh, I, I have I have one question. If you go back to the slide where you where you specify um, uh, just after the um, uh, how do um, I mean um, no, no uh, uh, the, uh, after point three sorry after the slide after point three please. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Oh no, sorry. It's not. It's not that one. It's uh, next one. Uh, where you specify that uh, uh, you need to provide the, the serializers for the uh, client and the server, sorry. Uh, I think it's this. Yes, there, yes. So when you say that you provide the serializers for the uh, client and the server, do you need also need to provide the, par the parsers and um, um, prove somehow prove that they are correct with respect to the serializer? Um, no, you don't need to provide this at this moment. Um, what you need to do is when you send a message, you have an additional side condition that um, the values that you send is indeed serializable with respect to serializer or that you uh, th that you gave. And then so this is a side condition here in ah. in the rule rule percent. And then where does it appear on the on the receiving side? On the it does not appear on the receiving side because um, uh, because uh, the um, because, sorry, because uh, the the uh, serialization has been passed 
uh, already at the moment when you one created a client and server socket. So um, one just by by the fact that the library has been proved uh, get for free that the received message is correctly deserialized. Okay. Uh, no further questions. Uh, let me see either online or here. So uh, thank you the speaker again. Thank you, Leon. Yes. Thank you. And, um, and this concludes the session. Thank you all. And let's have lunch next door. Thank you again.
<laughs> Try to finish on time. <laughs> Okay, and time to kick off the, the next session where we have uh, Connell talking about timely computations. All right, thank you, Patrick. Thanks for coming. Uh, there's a, a simple question at the heart of my talk, uh, which, which is what is a digital circuit? Or <clears throat> what is physical computation? We're used to thinking about computation abstractly, but kind of what gives computation its essence is not just the abstract mathematics that it computes, but what makes it computation rather than math, which is the physics of computation, which is it's a physical process. Information is physical, computation is physical. So what happens when we think about specifically and, and clearly the physicality of computation? Now, I'm guessing that you have been doing computation for a long time uh, and gotten used to what, in retrospect, and on further reflection, is kind of an odd aspect of, of, uh, of digital computation. <clears throat> an aspect of computers, which is what they are and what we do with them or why we use them are very, very different things. Okay? So a computer is an electronic circuit. It's a physical thing and it transforms analog signals. Now you may think we don't use analog computers anymore. That's something we used to do a long time ago, like in the 30s, and we don't do it anymore. But no, of course we use analog computers because computers are made out of the universe and the universe is analog. Okay? So computation, physically, is an analog thing. It's a physical analog thing. Now calculation is usually, not always, but is usually about discrete rather than continuous quantities. So it's more of a, a digital kind of a notion. Uh, and rather than being physical, it's mathematical. Okay? So, uh, so an, actual, uh, an actual physical implementation, physical manifestation of computation is, is continuous, but what we use it for is discrete. Okay? And it's one is physical and the other is mathematical. So in what sense could we possibly go around talking about correctly computing when the things that we're doing with computers are so different from their very nature? So that's, that's the question. And another way to ask this question is, what is a digital circuit? So I just said there's no such thing. And yet we use this notion of digital circuit in a really, really important way. Okay. So it's a question, what do we want out of the answer to the question? In other words, what, what, what are the kind of properties of a good answer? And these are my preferences. Um, I want a, or a good definition. I want the definition to be clear, so I, so I really kind of know what I'm talking about, so the, the less fuzzy it is, the better. I want it to be simple. Why should the question be simple? Because the question cannot be verified objectively. All right? if, if I have a question and I answer it, I verify the answer against the question. But how do I know that I've got the right question? Another way to, to express that point is, is once I have an answer, how do I know how to apply the answer? In other words, in what circumstances is it, is it correct? And we do that with our brains. We can do everything else computationally, but to verify a question, uh, we, need, we need to use our brains, and that's why it has to be simple. And so, for instance, for me, it's not going to be operational. It's not going to be linguistic, because both of those uh, features fight against simplicity of the question itself. It's going to be simple, denotational, mathematical. Now, also, it needs to be useful. I mean, it doesn't have to be useful if we're pure mathematicians, but I want it to be useful, and I'm guessing most of you do too. Useful means we get some insight out of it that we can solve problems with. We can do things we care about. And I would say form formal. Now, formal is a pretty uh, kind of a, a strict, uh, demanding sort of discipline, but the idea of formality is that it can be machine checked. It's completely unambiguous. We don't have to rely on, on our uh, uh, diligence, which we're not very good at, uh, to make sure that there are no, no mistakes slip by. <clears throat> And then constructive. Constructive is that I want to get some insights out of it that I can apply. So it's, it's very much like the useful. And finally, compositional. And I think we're all kind of, we're here in part because we love compositionality. But the reason for compositionality is that our, again, our brains are limited, right? And we want to be able to build things that are much more sophisticated than we can uh, understand in their entirety. So we build them in pieces. And if we care about correctness, then we're going to approach correctness in pieces. Okay, we're not going to build complicated things and then try to figure out what they're supposed to do and then prove that they're correct. That's a non-compositional approach and it's too difficult uh, for primates. Okay, all right. So that's, th those are my uh, qualities of, an ant of a definition I'm looking for. And this is my definition of a digital circuit. A digital circuit is an analog circuit that's used in a disciplined way. Okay, so it's not a physical thing. It's a disciplined use of a physical thing. So a digital circuit is an analog circuit that respects discrete meanings. 
Okay, so what I mean is the digital circuits are really going to have continuous uh, flows of, you know, like voltages, continuous thing coming in, but we're going to, we're going to uh, interpret that continuous information discreetly, so extract, you know, finite information like bits, something like that, out of it. And if we call that the meaning of the signal, and I don't mean it's the meaning of the signal, it, it's how we choose to interpret the signal. Okay. We want it to be the case that if you put two signals into this circuit, and those signals differ a little bit, but they don't differ in their discrete interpretations, all right, then the outputs can differ, but not in their discrete interpretations. Okay. Okay. So, that, so that means that, 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 that analog circuit is respecting the, the, the discrete interpretation. If, uh, that is, if, if two analog uh, uh, signals coming in are equivalent in the sense of how we interpret it, then, they, then the outputs will be not equal, but equivalent. All right. So that, that, that's the kind of framing, basic framing. And as I said, compositionality is centrally important. It's really our, the superpower that we use over and over to solve any problem. And of course, correctness. We don't want to just compute, we want to compute something in particular. We don't want to just do random fluctuations of, of electrical signals or bits. All right. So I want to talk about compositionally, compositionally correct computing. <clears throat> then I'll come back to, to digital computation. So I want to start with just computing. All right, not correct, not compositional, just computing. So this is a picture of computing. Computing is we, we've got some function f1. That's going to be, in, 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 in the case we're talking about, that, that's going to be a circuit itself. It's going to be a function that, that transforms continuous signals. Okay? So it's got some information coming in, row one, information going out, sigma one, okay? and it's the transformation. That's what I'm calling operation, or you call that implementation. But that's not correct. That's just something going on. It, it, I, we don't have a way to talk about whether it's correct because we, we need to compare it to something. So we move up from computing to correct computing. This is my picture of correct computing. In addition to the operation or the implementation or the physics, you might say, we have its intention, which I'm going to call its denotation or its meaning. Okay? <clears throat> Whereas the operation is chosen for its uh, physicality, right? something that can be computed in this universe so we can look at it and learn from it, okay? uh, and maybe computed it efficiently, inexpensively. I want its meaning, the, kind of the, the, the purpose or the intent of it, to be optimized in a different sense. It doesn't have to be physical, it doesn't have to be computable, but it needs to be mathematically well-defined and simple, so it's amenable to precise reasoning. And I don't just mean you can reason about it, but it's friendly to reasoning, okay? Then we need to relate somehow the thing that imp is um, implemented to its motivation, the motivation for implementing it, okay? And that's the that's relationship here, the, the horizontal arrows. So if row one is, is maybe a bunch of wires or a bunch of continuous signals, then row two is it, its interpretation via H, that uh, uh, first uh, vertical arrow. That's going to be what that's going to be the function that extracts information. Okay, and for us that'll be something like bits. We've got all this continuous stuff. We're going to extract some finite number of bits out of there, and maybe then maybe even interpret those bits as something like a number or a tree, or something like that. Okay, so uh, so we, we know how the. It, we need to know how the input, the kind of physical input, is going to be interpreted as mathematical input, and how the physical output gets interpreted as mathematical output. That's H and K. Okay. And then we need a consistency uh, a requirement. And, and that is that, that, that's implied by my the little uh, curvy arrow in the middle, <clears throat> which, is, which, is the, which means that this diagram commutes. In other words, if we start with a physical input row one, and we pass it through the physical circuit, get sigma one, and then we interpret it as a kind of mathematical or say discrete meaning. That needs to be the same as if we took row one and interpreted it, the input, and then passed it through the mathematical function. Okay? That's what correctness means. Now, that's how I'm defining correctness. So it's the uh, commutativity of this diagram, saying those two paths are equal. Okay? <clears throat> so that's correct computing. What about compositionally correct computing? Okay. So the idea is if, if this is what if we know what correct computing is, okay, and, and we want to do ambitious things correctly, right, then we're going to need to compose them. And if we want to be able to succeed, we, have, we need the correctness at every step instead of postponing until the very end and having a gargantuan uh, task. Okay? So I want to know how do we compose these correct things to make other correct things. Okay? So that's where we get compositionally correct computing. And what I'm suggesting is that you take this diagram and you can see it in parts. So I showed you one kind of parsing of it, which is these three layers, right? the three horizontal layers, operation, de denotation, extraction in the middle. 
But there's another way to slice it, okay, orthogonally, which is to say on the left, we have some notion of the input. Now we really have two things or three things about the input. What's the physical input? What's the conceptual input? And how does the physical relate to the conceptual? That's H, okay? Or you could just say it's H, right? And, the, and it, its domain and codomain are, are, are a part of it, all right? So we know about the input and we know about the output. It's physical manifestation, it's conceptual intent and the relationship between them. Okay. So that, that, that's a kind of domain and codomain of correct computing. Okay. Now what about a morphism or what about the kind of functionality or the, 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 um, the computation itself? Well, that's gonna be this middle row, this middle column. So it's gonna have the, the implementation and its purpose, its meaning, okay. and a proof. And that, that's what the curvy arrow is. The proof that in fact this relationship holds, this, this uh, commutation. Okay. Now, why do I call this compositional? It's because these things compose in a really nice way. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like. <clears throat> so we have these packages of correct computation. Intent, implementation, uh, proof of correctness, including the extraction. Okay. Now, how do we combine them so that we can build bigger things from, uh, bigger correct things from smaller correct things? Well, one very useful way to combine, uh, to combine subcomputations is put them in sequence. So if we have these two correct computations, the one on the left, the one on the right, and, and the one on the left feeds into the one on the right, in other words, the output matches the input. Now when I say the output, I'm including both outputs, physical, or say implementation, conceptual, and interpretation, okay? So when those line up, we can compose these correct computations into a single correct computation, <clears throat> okay? What happens? The implementations get composed sequentially, the meanings get composed sequentially, and the proofs get combined in a, in a um, standard way. There's like, if you try this, there's only one right thing that could possibly work, and it does indeed work. Okay. So you can combine the proofs in a clever sort of way. All right. So sequential composition is just one way that we build up computations. Uh, another main way is parallel composition. So here we have two correct computations, and now the domains and codomains are unrelated to each other. They're completely independent, unlike the previous one. These, these are un, uh, unrelated to each other, <clears throat> okay? And we can combine them in parallel. So what do we do when we combine them in parallel? Well, the inputs get paired in the, in the physical manifestation and in the conceptual motivation. The outputs get paired, again, in the same way. And then the functionality, both the implementation and the, the, uh, the mathematical intent, the, the mathematical function that motivates the implementation, gets not exactly paired up, but put in parallel. That's this cross operator. So it's like a pure parallel composition. It just means you run two, com two computations of parallel. <clears throat> they consume a pair. You pass the divvy up that pair to each computation. You take the two results, put them back into a pair. That's, that's just a common operation here. <clears throat> now what I've shown you are the basic building blocks, not all of them, but most of them, the basic building blocks of what's called Cartesian categories which is kind of the basic building blocks or some of the basic building blocks of computation in general. And not just computable functions, but differentiable functions, linear functions, polynomial functions, um, uh, incremental computation, all kinds of things can be looked at you know, in terms of this vocabulary. And they have very nice properties. <clears throat> and they're related to the type lambda calculus in a very kind of simple, universal sort of way. Okay. Well, the story's a little bit more involved in this, which is I don't wanna just have computations here that are all like mathematical functions. I want my circuits to be more real than that, than, than, than just the mathematical functions that they implement. Because why? Because I want to be able to like build them. I want to be able to synthesize, uh, maybe, you know, like Verilog and build a chip, that kind of thing. I, I need some sort of more analyzability that I can get of mathematical functions. So we introduce representations. And the idea is, is that we have two mappings from representations, that's the capital fees. Okay. We have one at the implementation and one in the, in, the, uh, in the meaning layer. And what that does is, it's a, it's a subtle sort of shift, but it means that the data in this diagram or the data in the representation is not just the meanings, but it's the things that mean what the meanings are. In other words, it's like the actual circuit, not just its uh, mathematical interpretation. Okay, so it's a bit, it's a bit of a, a subtle point. You can read the paper. Okay, this whole composability story works out with this extra bit of very kind of practically important layer. And it works out when these fees, these interpretations distribute over the kind of structure of these operations. So it, it really relies on phi of f, uh, phi of g composed phi of f being equal to phi of g composed f, okay? So that's its homomorphism property. For categories, that's called a functor, okay? Or a Cartesian functor. 
So that distributed property. So that's what you need, you need a, a functor. All right, so that's the basics. Now what does that have to do with the question I started asking is, this, this is how I wanna approach building sophisticated, very efficient uh, physical computation and have it be guaranteed correct and have it be sort of uh, what uh, reasonably easy to build at every step. Don't wanna make it hard, wanna make it easy. All right, so now I'm gonna ground in a fairly uh, uh, concrete example. <clears throat> Okay, and the example is, is a classic, uh, which is a full adder. So a full adder you can think of as, as, as adding three bits, okay? Another way to think of a full adder is to add two bits and a carry in bit, right? Now the result can be, well, the result is gonna be up to two, oh, I need two bits, I'm uh, sorry, it's gonna be up to uh, three, I need, so I need two bits for that, all right? So that's why there are three inputs, uh, one input per bit, or you could say one input per wire. The wire is the physical view, the bit is the, is the sort of interpretation view, okay? and two outputs, one, one per bit, okay. So now here's, here's a question. Okay. I want to build a correct implementation of, of, of this, uh, um, I want to build a correct, what? Something that embodies the uh, digital semantics, okay, of, of adding numbers. But remember, my substrate isn't digital, because reality is analog, okay. So to know that I've implemented physically uh, this computation, I have to take into account the physicality of computation. And one of the implications is that computation takes time. Right? It takes time to compute and it takes time to move information. All right. So understanding correctness relies on understanding timing okay? when, we, when we embrace the, the physicality. One reason to embrace the physicality, I didn't say so, is because you can get a heck of a lot of performance gain if you do that. It's wonderful that programming languages, especially functional languages, especially genuinely functional or denotative languages, uh, uh, take uh, the physicality, the, the timing, for instance, out of the picture. But there's a huge cost in performance. There's a huge cost in, in uh, uh, time and in power consumption. Okay. So if we take timing into account, um, then, then there's a natural question arises, which is, uh, which is when should you look at these wires? Because right? remember, that, that's the interpretation. We have these continuous signals and we're pulling out bits. How do you get the bits? By looking at the wires at certain times. So how do you know when to look at the wires? Well, that's tricky. Anything that's tricky should be approached compositionally. All right. So, uh, and, and I wanna know what, what's a clear question to ask. So here's a clear question to ask, which is if I know when to look at the inputs, okay, then when should I look at the outputs such that this correctness property holds? Because okay, remember, when is the interpretations, right? That's how we get our digital, uh, our digital interpretations. So that's a question. If I know when to look at the, if, if I know when I'm gonna look at the inputs, then when should I look at the outputs so that, 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 that the result, the bits I pull out, accurately reflect the mathematical function that's motivating the construction of the circuit, okay? So, turns out there's some subtlety in this question. So what, what notion of when is gonna be useful and tractable logically? So one question is, do we have a win for the whole circuit? In other words, one particular time? This is the time at which you look at all inputs. Okay, given that, then I figure out the time in which you look at all outputs. Well, that's a simple answer, but it turns out if you do that, you lose a lot of precision. Okay, in other words, uh, uh, um, the timing prediction would be much worse than if you looked at it in a, in a, a fine grain way, without a coarse grain way. Also, it breaks some compositionality, okay? So per bit timing, so a time per bit has a big payoff, okay? But there's another question. So, so then, then you might, might say, okay, so suppose I know for each bit when to look at it, what moment to look at it. And then I can ask the question, at what moment will the outputs be correct? Well, it turns out in most cases, no moments at all, okay? And why is that? The reason for that is that pathways through a circuit have different lengths. It takes different amounts of time for information to pass through. So here I'm looking at two of these. We take one of these inputs, the I1, and we're gonna to look to see the output of this NOR gate, okay? NAND, XOR, not NOR, okay? Well, let's look at these. So NOR has two inputs. So let's trace back how long, how much time passes between a single input bit and this NOR. Well, this, this path has two gates on it, right? This path has one, two, three gates on it. This path is gonna take longer. So it's gonna take longer for one of those paths to propagate information. So if I know exactly when I1 is, is valid, then NOR will get, a val will get one valid input at one time and the other valid input at another time, and it will never get two valid inputs at the same time. 
And assuming that it's the same propagation delay from each input to the output of NOR, it will never give a correct answer. No, I don't mean that. It will never will. We can never guarantee that it will give a correct answer. It might just by luck give a correct answer. But we want to know when can I guarantee, because that, that's when it's guaranteed to be correct. So what can we possibly do about that? Well, we can change the question. And instead of, instead of talking about at what moment the inputs will be uh, valid and what moment we should look at the outputs, we can say, how about over an interval? Suppose you could give me an interval of time over which the, the inputs are guaranteed to be valid, okay? As long as that interval is long enough, then this NOR will receive valid inputs at the same time. And, and that time will be the intersections of when uh, kind of the validity of the information coming into one input and the other input. They're gonna be off, but if the duration of the, of the original input is big enough, then that intersection will be non-empty. And that intersection will be exactly when uh, we'll have valid information coming out, okay? So instead of using a single time, we're gonna use uh, a time per bit. Uh, uh, instead of treating time as a moment, we're gonna treat time as intervals. And what we mean by an interval is that it's valid over the entire region. Okay. All right. So this slide is like a very simplistic way to think about an actual analog computation. So analog circuits always have meanings if you're not trying to interpret them digitally, right? They're just, they just transform continuous flows of information. Here's a very simple way, it's, it's in the paper, of saying what that is. It's not a realistic way, but it's, it's kind of a very simple way. All right. But the shift from analog to digital, <clears throat> the, the kind of main idea there is, is, as I said, we want to identify intervals, but those intervals aren't just intervals. Something happens, something is true during those intervals. And what's true is stability, what I'm calling stability. And what stability is, is just that, that is that the signal holds a particular value during that interval. Now, really, the signal is a continuous voltage, and it doesn't hold a value. It wavers, but it wavers near a particular, uh, like every, every voltage level in that interval has the same interpretation. So I've simplified it and, and kind of simplified away the, the tiny waverings here, but it's not hard to fix that. So the definition of stability, a signal is stable if there is some interval. Okay, there exists an interval. Oh, there's an agda, by the way. So this is an interval x hat and some value, static value, uh, a Boolean value, x, such that the uh, signal holds that value during the interval. In other words, for all times in the interval, the signal at time t is equal to x. Okay? So that's what I mean by stability, okay? So the idea is, let's not, let's not talk about arbitrary signals we're passing through, let's talk about signals that have this stability. And it's a constructive notion of stability which is not only, you know, do we, do we know that these uh, intervals of time and Boolean values exist, but the proofs contain, the proofs contain uh, the specific uh, information. So the fact that we're then working in constructive logic means there's a little bit, you know, more than meets the eye here, which, which is that there's computational content. So we actually have these uh, uh, intervals and, and bits to work with. Um, now, I, this is about one bit. What about multiple bits, right? M multiple wires? Well, we're going to tuple up these things. In other words, for every bit in a tuple, we'll, we'll, we'll have the signal, we'll have the interval of time, we'll have the, uh, the bit value. Now, in the end, what actually gets run is only an analog computation. And then what the user has to know is only the, uh, only the, the, the timing, so they know when to look. Okay. And this sort of pattern about uh, uh, values that have a certain property, like stability, and functions that preserve that property, okay? That's this kind of general pattern that could be uh, uh, um, described in a, in a very general way and reused. So that's, that's what I do and it's described in the paper, okay? Now we can talk about stable gates. What is a stable gate? It's a gate that has a property of preserving stability, okay? So this is in the paper. The important thing I wanted to call out here, ah, so, okay, so we have this notion of stability. And then a stable logic, in other words, like, like uh, you know, digital gates. Digital gates, remember, is a physical gate used in a disciplined way. Can be easily built out of these standard kind of building blocks. These deltas are the delays, or the propagation delays. All right. Now, what I skipped over real fast is how timing is computed. And there, there's just these three operations. <clears throat> so remember, every gate is going to consume and produce some number of signals. In this case, zero, one, or two. All right. Uh, and so the timing computations need to like work with no signals, that's pretty trivial. <clears throat> One signal, you just delay it by a certain value, or two signals. Two signals, you delay each and then intersect the results. So remember, they both have to be valid uh, uh, to, to get a valid input. Okay. 
So the basic building blocks of these timing computations are, are the universal interval, minus infinity to infinity, okay? This thing I'm calling star for convolution, okay, which is also called Minkowski sum in this case. That, that's the idea of, of you have two intervals and you add them, which means you, 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 uh, you form the interval, uh, which is like sums of values, one from one interval, one from the other. It's, it's more generally a set notion, okay? That turns out to be a special case of convolution. And then the third one is, is this like intersection operator. Those three operators turn out to be, thank you, turn out to be, uh, to form a semi-ring. There's a fourth one, which is offsetting by nothing, right? offsetting by zero, right? So that, that's the fourth one, uh, the, the, the singleton zero interval. So this basic vocabulary forms a semi-ring. Well, that's kind of interesting, but so what? So what is that timing is linear in this semi-ring, okay? So the time, all of the timing computations, if you think in terms of this semi-ring, they turn out to be linear. And that's a huge win for a variety of reasons. One is that it means that, that, that instead of representing this timing as a function from uh, intervals to intervals, we can, we can represent linear functions in a data sort of a way, which is what matrices are about. <clears throat> if, you do, if we do that, it also turns out that timing analysis, I believe, is really essentially automatic differentiation. That's what automatic differentiation is doing as well. It's computing linear uh, approximations. And then in this sense, statically timed hardware is affine. What I mean by affine is a const, uh, function with a constant derivative. All right. So now, uh, if we look at our full adder example and we crank it through uh, th th this compositional analysis where we represent the timing as uh, linear transformation and then really as matrices, we get out this sort of result. So this is a matrix. It may be a little hard to recognize. But the importance of being a matrix is you can look inside. There's no hidden information. That information tells you the timing properties of the circuit. Okay? If you don't like the timing properties of the circuit, find a circuit whose pro timing properties you like. Okay. All right. So that's basically it. There's a, a bunch of potential improvements uh, for the work. Some's in progress. Some isn't uh, that's in the paper. But I think that's a good, good time to stop and take questions. As usual, microphones, and there is a chat, which so far is empty, I think. Thanks for the talk. Is this on? Not on. No? <coughs> no I don't think so. Is that one? OK, this is on, I guess. OK. The recording won't hear you if it's not on, I think. OK. Um, Thanks for the talk. I'll repeat great. the question. Yeah. Um, I was curious uh, when dealing with, say, a signal that's um, a product of multiple bits. Yeah. And you have the time interval for stability. Yep. Do those different bits have different inter and pot potentially related stable intervals, or yep. um, is the encodings you've looked at? just have a single stable interval in time for the no, product of those. Thank you, yeah, thanks, uh, Gilbert. So the question is, uh, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, please. Uh, I think the question is, when we have these multiple bits, and I'm talking about the intervals, you know, the HGAN interval, are the intervals the same? Are they really getting diff are they really having the freedom of having multiple intervals? And there's absolutely yes, and it's incredibly important, be because like, if you look at, for instance, an, a ripple adder kind of circuit, right, you don't need the inputs all at the same time. They're not gonna be consumed at the same time. You don't need them at the same time. So if you insist on them being the same time, you'll get badly timed circuits. Yeah, yeah, so precision performance. Uh, thanks, Connell. Uh, so all of this sort of suggests that, well, feedback is a very common property yes. in circuits. Yep. Having a hard time seeing, uh, you know, the, the, how does this, how can you make this work? For, uh, yeah. uh, how do you interpret the feedback? Thanks. Yeah, so that's, that, that's the first bullet here. Yeah, so, so what I showed you is, is this kind of simple part of the story. All right, now actual circuits have feedback. Feedback is what gives you temporality. It's what you, it's what you lay out. It's what allows us to lay out computation in time as well as space. All right, okay. So, um, so the definition of stable I gave you is this kind of a simplification. It's, it, it's you identify a single uh, interval of time all right, so that's how you get one bit out of a wire. Well, wires can hold a lot more than one bit. So, so what you what need to do is, is to take that definition, generalize it in a fairly simple way, which, which says you don't have one interval of time, you have a bunch of intervals of time, all right? You have like a, a tuple or a tri or a vector or whatever you want, and, a sense, and the same shape you know, of bits 
right? And then a proof that, you know, for each of, for each of those times, you know, the signal holds the value over that time, yeah. So that, that's kind of the first step. The next step then is, is to look at it exactly like how do you want to formulate uh, um, um, cyclic circuits, or you could say recursive. And, and a nice way to do that in the same kind of general vocabulary is what's, what's called a monoidal trace. It's a kind of a, a feedback. It's, it's the way you talk about uh, uh, something like recursion or cycles in categories, okay? And so that's, that's something that I've kind of worked out on paper, but is definitely not, not in this paper. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, Thank you. Yeah. So anyway, it, it's a matter of looking at the inputs, looking at the outputs, and then and then first of all, you got to make sure that that loop is well founded. Okay. The well founded of that of that loop is why hardware designers usually put registers, right, in their loops. Yeah. But the essential thing is not registers and loops. It's a well foundedness of of, uh, of traces. Thank you. I'll just try to insert one question from, from the chat, Edwin Turek. Uh, it's a little long, but I'll see if I can say the actual sentence with a question mark. Can your approach be used to implement efficient and correct asynchronous circuits yeah. without the usual metastability problems that affect clock domain crossings? Thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited about that question. Um, um, I'm not just getting it, but I've been excited about that question. So I really tried in this, in this paper and in this work not to assume global synchrony, not to assume synchrony at all. So what I described to you doesn't assume synchrony. There's no clocks in this description. So it could be refined to talk about clocks and with the cycle store, that's, that's where you know, clocks come in right there. Um, but I don't think it, it, it needs, uh, I, I think it applies more broadly. And that's one of the reasons I pointed out the connection with, uh, uh, with automatic differentiation is, is, that, is that in um, a more broad computations, the timing is data dependent. Okay. And, and as in automatic differentiation, that's like saying the derivative is input dependent. That's just saying it's not an affine function. It's an interesting wiggly kind of a function. So I think this framework does support it, and I haven't tried it. Thanks. Okay. One last question. Satnam Singh, Grok, where I, we make silicon chips, and I spend a lot of my time looking at timing reports. But when I think about both combinational circuits and sequential circuits, my model is set up and hold and all the timing violations that come, that come from that. You know, even for a combinational circuit, they all have a register somewhere, right? And I'll have to worry about set up and hold for it. So I'm not thinking in terms of intervals. I'm thinking of how many seconds has this, have these signals together been stable to work out what the output's going to be. So does what you've described, does it map into the normal world of timing analysis for hardware, which is all based on set up and hold? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it does, and I think that's exactly what motivated this work was I was working for a different hardware company, and I went around asking hardware engineers, you know, like, like help me fill in my gaps here because I'm a software guy. What on earth is timing analysis? Yeah, and, and it was really from those questions, and it was like almost nobody gave me any helpful answers. It was more like, you know, it's how I struggle with this expensive, you know, industry tool or something. But, but I, I think there's, there's like there's the setup and hold analysis that they do. All right, in, in, in actual hardware timing. I think setup and hold analysis is what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about it in a neater way. So one of them is a the lower bound of the interval, the other one's the upper bound of the interval. One of them you max, the other one you min, but in both cases they mean intersection of intervals. You could talk about some intervals are semi-infinite and you're intersecting. Yeah. Some, the others are semi-infinite the other way and you're intersecting. Yeah, but you, you mentioned the analysis previous question. I guess what I've been missing for me is the global clock, right? Because all these oh, symptoms right, right. are relative to this clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's one kind of computing. And I really wanted to tell a story that's, that's more general than like globally synchronous computing. Yeah. And now, of course, you know, a sequel is show that this story really explains globally synchronous computing and, you know, multi-clock domains and uh, what's called asynchronous computing. It might be better called, uh, you know, like very locally synchronous computing or dynamically synchronous. Thanks, Colin, for great. Yeah. Anyway, thanks. Okay, thanks. All right. Well, I have to move on, so thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. I guess, I guess I should say that now. Wouter is coming on. Late evening, Utrecht, I think. <laughs> <laughs>
Can I start, Patrick? Are you good? Well, it looks like they're try still trying to get the zoom. Uh, well, the screen. Okay. Is the screen sharing on? Because we still only see your face, so that's <laughs> what they're trying uh, to figure out. Let me double check. Uh, I can stop it if you want. And now we got it up. Yes. Uh, OK, it did work. Good. Well, actually, for a split second. Uh... <laughs> OK, clear to go. Ah, great. Thank you. Hello, Seattle. This is Utrecht calling. Uh, and thanks for the organizer to putting together a great program and inviting me to talk about my JFP paper. So the title of my paper is a well-known representation of monoids and its application to the function vector reverse. And I'll explain where that title comes from in a little bit. But actually, the paper is much more about finding the right definition, just as Connell mentioned in his talk. So what do I mean by that? Well, according to the Oxford University Dictionary, a definition is a precise statement of the essential nature of a thing, a statement or form of words by which anything is defined. But for the purpose of this talk, I'll mostly focus on definitions in Agda. So in Agda, you can declare data types like the natural numbers closed under zero and successor, and you can define functions like addition. So here I've defined addition by induction on the first argument. And of course, given that this is a talk about Agda, it should really also mention vectors. So you can also define vectors, which are length indexed lists, where you keep track of the length of the vector statically in the type. So the empty vector nil has length zero, and the cons, uh, the non-empty vector takes a, a, a head and a tail and builds a vector, which is one longer. And then the next thing we can do is we can define an append function, which takes one vector and appends it onto the next. Um, but this is actually quite subtle, and it's quite surprising that it type checks at all. And because I'm going to do some more crazy stuff in the rest of the talk, I figured I'd take the time to kind of explain what's going on here very precisely. So if we look at the first clause for a pen, um, what we're promising here is to produce a list, or a vector rather, of length n plus m. But because we've pattern matched on nil here, we know that n is zero. So the goal that we need to prove or that we have to deliver on is proving, uh, providing a vector of length zero plus m. Now, what I'd like to write on the right-hand side is just to return y, and that is a vector of length m. So by definition of addition, I know that zero plus m is equal to m, and this, actually, this will actually type check. So I've marked it in green here. So what about the uh, cons case? Well, in that case, I uh, kind of promised uh, that I would return a vector which has length successor of k plus m. So because there's a cons, I know that the that n needs to be a successor of some number k. And if I kind of write out the usual definition for append, namely cons x append x x's, I can see that the cons x uh, gives me a successor out at the front. And then the append of the tail and y's produces a vector of length k plus m. And now, by definition of addition, once again, for the successor case, I can see that these two numbers are equal, and I'm done. So what's nice about this example is that the inductive structure of addition and append lines up precisely. So that's great, because I, do, I kind of don't need to do any other work. But the bad news is that the only equalities you ever get for free are those that hold definitionally. So in particular, suppose I try to write a function on vectors where I kind of manipulate these numbers, I rely on addition being commutative. Um, that doesn't hold definitionally, even if it's true. So I'd have to do some more work in order to kind of convince Agda that that definition really does type check. And in a lot of talks on dependent types and vectors, people kind of show kind of append and then they might do map or they might do kind of look up like functions and kind of the things which are which which work out well. Um, but the purpose of this talk is to kind of maybe kind of scratch the surface on things which are not so easy to define, but still possible. So let's look at reverse. 
uh, first thing to I can do in order to define reverse is define a snock operation, which kind of has the same type signature as cons, only I've reversed the argument and I'm now adding things to the end of the list instead of to the front. And now I can see I can define a reverse function phi, which takes a vector of length n and produces a vector of the same length. So the empty map vector is mapped to the empty vector, and if I have a cons, I replace it by a snog and recurse over the, over the tail x's. And this is fine. It uh, kind of ACTA accepts this def definition. It's easy to see that reverse is a kind of length-preserving operation. But uh, taking quadratic time to reverse a list is pretty bad, right? And uh, even though we're kind of independent types land, you'd like to kind of show that you don't that we at least can find a linear time, al time algorithm to reverse a list. It doesn't seem like such a big ask. And we're in luck because there's a nice paper which inspired uh, the title of my paper by John Hughes called A Novel Representation of Lists and Its Application to the Function Reverse. And this is the first sentence from the abstract which says that a representation of lists as first class functions is proposed and lists represented in this way can be appended together in constant time and can be converted back into ordinary lists in time proportional to their length. And here's the kind of definition that, um, that, uh, that's used in this paper for a reverse, where um, we kind of take an intermediate step where we kind of uh, write this function go that converts a list into what, what's called a difference list or a function from lists to lists, which uh, will take all of these elements uh, in the first list and then kind of reverse them somehow or build up a function which kind of will all kind of add these on in the reversed order. So if there's no elements to add on, we have the identity function. If we have a non-empty list as input, we build up a function where the first thing we do is kind of push the head of the list on a stack, and then we kind of continue pushing the other elements on the stack. And then if, once we've built up this function, we can apply it to the empty list, and then we have uh, the reverse list that we were looking for. And if we kind of expand, uh, eat expand a little bit, you can recognize back that you see this is the, uh, the typical definition of reverse using an accumulating parameter. And what's nice here is that it now kind of works in linear time. And if you're interested in a definition of uh, list reversal that also works in constant space, you should check out Anton's talk tomorrow. Oh, I sort of messed up the formatting on this slide. Sorry about that. Um, so what happens if we try to reverse a vector in the same style, right? We can take the definition uh, with an accumulator and try to write that out for our vectors. And unfortunately here, things don't quite go quite so smoothly. And what's the problem? So we're promising to produce a vector of length successor of k plus m, just as we saw previously for append, I guess. But the problem is that when we make a recursive call with an accumulator, we are uh, making a call on the tail x's, which has length k, and we're extending the accumulator to build a new vector of length successor of m. And these two numbers aren't definitionally equal, so Agda kind of rejects this, uh, this definition and says that it's type incorrect. Ah, so what's really going on here is that we have a mismatch all of a sudden. The definition of ref reverse is tail recursive using an accumulating parameter, and addition is just defined inductively uh, on the first argument. So uh, can we, the question now becomes, can we find a better definition of addition that lines up with this reversal function and choose a different type for our accumulating reverse so that we don't have to run into these problems with, uh, with types and we can. So what we do here is we define an accumulating ver version of addition, uh, which is tail recursive, kind of behaves the way you would expect, and it kind of mimics very closely the definition of reverse that you want to write. And now this goes through smoothly. And the crucial change here is that I have moved from uh, the type of reverse act being returning something of type n plus m to actually having the same structure in both my type and or the functions used in my type and the function that I'm defining, in this case, this reverse, uh, this accumulating reverse function. So, so far, so good. I mean, we're winning. It seems like we're doing okay. There's just one thing I still have to do is I need to kind of make a call to reverse and kick that off with the empty vector. Ah, no, this doesn't work. So why is that? Well, if I look, I'm promising that reverse is a function that preserves lengths. 
And now if I call my reverse, my accumulating reverse function with, with the list X's and an empty accumulator that has a type which is no longer definitionally equal to N. So remember the definition of my accumulating reverse was by induction on the first argument. So this computation add ac N zero gets stuck. I can't do any other work and uh, there's my, and Agda rightfully rejects this problem. So what can I do? Well, one thing I can do is I can kind of show Agda who's the boss and I can give a proof, right? And do give an inductive argument showing that, uh, you know, zero is really the right unit of my uh, accumulating addition. And I can use that proof and to write a coerced VEC uh, and write a coerced VEC function uh, which says, well, if I can show that the, in, the length of two vectors are equal, I can map one vector to the other. And then I can complete the definition of reverse and kick it off with an initially empty accumulator. Um, this is fine, right? I mean, this works. Agda accepts this definition. But I think one of the points that I've tried to make so far is that how you structure your definitions really matters. And in particular, if there's anything else, like another proof, or maybe I use this reverse some function somewhere else when I want to prove things about that function, having these kind of proof arguments, like showing that zero is the right unit of my accumulating addition, uh, it can complicate everything that comes after this. So it'd be nice if there was actually a definition of my reverse, which was both linear and didn't use any of these proof arguments. So let's try to find that. And the good news is there's actually a hint that we can take in this paper by John Hughes again. And the key observation that we can make is this construction of using first class functions to represent lists. It doesn't just work for lists. It works for any monoid. So in particular, what I'll do is I'll, I'll come up with a new representation of natural numbers to work with, which I'll call difference naturals. I'm not very good at naming, I guess and use that to see whether that can kind of push this development a little bit further. So what are different naturals? Well, just as different lists are functions from lists to lists, different naturals are functions from naturals to naturals. They can define a pair of functions, one which converts a number into a difference natural by partially applying addition, and a, and a way back which takes a difference natural and converts it back into a number simply by applying my function to zero. So far, so good. So I mentioned that these difference naturals are monoidal. So what do I have to do to kind of show that? Is I have to define a zero and an addition operation. So the zero is just the identity. Remember, these are functions that we're working with. And addition is just function composition. But to really show that this is a monoid, I have to do a little bit more work. I actually have to, sh I have to prove three laws, right? I have to show that you know uh, I have the right and left unit and that addition is associative. And here's the surprising thing, right? All three of these properties now hold by definition. So I don't have to do any induction. I don't have to do any work. And Agda will just accept these definitions once I write REFL. So why is that? So let's look at one example. And all the others are kind of the same. So here's I, where I show that the zero is the left unit of addition. So on the Starting from reifying some difference natural dn, reifying is simply applying to zero. Working in the other direction, I now have the addition of zero and some difference natural, which is function composition, but d0 is just the identity function, and then reifying is applying to zero, and then the identity function doesn't change anything. So my left and right hand side are really equal, and the only thing I've done here is unfold definitions. So this seems like a really useful trick. Now, the next question is, can we use this in our definition of uh, vector reverse? So let's try, right? Um, let's, tr let's revisit our accumulating vector reverse. Uh, but now, instead of kind of indexing by two numbers, we'll do this funny trick where we'll take a vector which has some length n and the second accumulating vector, which has, well, its length is kind of funny. Um, we've, we're assuming that its length of now is actually one of these difference naturals. And then we produce a vector which we get by you know, adding all the um, ends onto the difference natural. So there are two cases. In the first case, we uh, have an accumulator and uh, we return that. 
And in the second case, we have a non-empty list and an accumulator, and we want to make a recursive call. So the recursive call we make is on the tail x's, but now we need to extend our accumulator and we hit a problem. What's the problem here? So what we'd like to do is extend the accumulator with a new successor. That would be building a successor and then extending the accumulator uh, uh, in, this, in, this, in this fashion. But the problem is that what we're promising is that we, were, that we actually extend the accumulator in a different way, that by kind of growing the, um, uh, uh, by, by, by growing the n here, that, uh, that these two things are equal. And once again, because we don't know anything about the difference natural, there's no guarantee that it will actually commute with the successor in this way. So it seems like we're kind of stuck. Um, but suppose we actually had a function which had the type that we're looking for, right? Or we had a decones operation, which for any n and for any difference natural, we have an element, we have some accumulated vector that we've built so far that we can add things in the way that we want to this vector. Um, so cons doesn't have this type, unfortunately. Well, unless I know that when I start off the computation, I'll instantiate the difference natural to zero to start with. So dm will be the identity function. If I plug in D, the identity function for dm, I can see that cons has the right type. And curiously, as I kind of go down the one list and go up kind of accumulating through the other list, it turns out that because this happens in log step, I increment dm and decrement n in every step. It turns out that cons can actually still be used in the right way, provided I kind of pass it in as an argument to my accumulating reverse. So what does that look like? Well, it's starting to get a little bit more complicated now. Let's look at this line. Uh, the third line of the uh, of, of the definition first. So there we can see it, that's the familiar uh, accumulating type for accumulating reverse. In the top line, it's more gnarly, where we have a, a difference natural dm, and then we have this huge expression, which is basically the type the type of the decons operation I had on the previous slide, the thing that I really needed to complete the definition. And then I can see that I can complete the definition this way. And I can kick off the definition uh, the way I'd like by passing the identity function d0, cons, which I'll kind of add to, which I'll use to add to the accumulator, my list x's, and an empty accum accumulator nil. And then everything type checks. Act is happy. Hooray, we've won, but at what cost? Um, so there's another definition of vector reverse uh, that many functional programmers are familiar with, which is used as a, using a fold L. So the idea here is that I can reverse a list using an accumulator by consing uh, every new element that I see onto this list. But kind of trying to use this for vectors, unfortunately, doesn't work very well. So why not? Well, suppose I try to define this function, a length-preserving linear uh, reverse on vectors, I get stuck very quickly. So crucially, remember that the argument that I pass to the fold L has to have type A to B to B. But now I'm passing in a function cons, which goes from, or flip cons, which goes from A to vector AN to vector which is one longer. So the B types are no longer identical. So the program doesn't type check. Hmm. What can I do? Well, it turns out I can be a little bit more general and define a version of fold left, which doesn't just return a single B, but is actually returns a, an N index B or net index B. What does that look like? Well, I can see that I take a vector of length N and I produce not just a B, but a B at index N. In order to do this, I need to provide my initial accumulator B0 and a function which I can kind of take a bk in the head of the list and turn it into a b of successor of k. So the first line is not unsurprising, right? If the list is empty, I know that uh, n is 0. I have to return a b0, and I happen to have the accumulator, which is a b0, uh, right kind of in front of me, so I'm done straight away. But the second case is really not so obvious. So what you can see here is that I'm going into making a recursive call on fold L, 
on the tail axis. Mm. Oh dear. Ah, sorry. <laughs> uh, Patrick was just pinging me in Discord. Um, excuse me. Um, so what you can see here in the uh, in the recursive case is that x's is actually uh, now has length k, but we're promising to produce something of length successor k. So how could that possibly work? Well, the trick is that we're doing the same thing. We're doing this pre-composition with successor in order for the recursion to go through. But then we have to pass not just a b0 as the accumulator, but a b1, which we get by applying our step function. And now we can define reverse uh, without any proofs and get a linear time reverse function, which is familiar to everyone in the room. But wait, there's more. There's nothing kind of special about natural numbers. This kind of Cayley representation of monoids as endofunctors works for any monoid. And kind of it's a well-known kind of representation of groups, and it's not quite as novel as the title of John Hughes's paper suggests. So in the paper, there's an example of indexing a decision tree by a list of variables in scope. But what's really nice is because the monoidal equalities all hold definitionally, we can exploit that information to write a little monoid solver. So doctors hate him because this Arthur Cayley can solve any equation over monoids with this one weird trick. And let me explain that trick. So I'm gonna sketch this very kind of in broad strokes, but suppose I have uh, a set A, which is the carrier of a monoid. I'm gonna fix that set in the rest of this talk. And suppose I can write a little deep uh, embedding of this uh, monoidal expressions, right? Which have either constants, they have zero and plus. Then I can write a little evaluator which maps these expressions into A values easily enough. If I replace zero by the zero of the monoid, addition by the addition of the monoid, and you know, for all the variables and constants I encounter, I just return the A that I have in front of me. So now I can, can do the KV representation trick taking an expression, turning it into a function, taking a function, turning it into an expression. We've seen that a few times this talk already. And crucially, I can now normalize any expression. Basically, if I have an expression which is built up with lots of zeros and units, um, uh, sorry, zeros and additions, this will actually turn it into a list of all the things that I'm adding, essentially. I have to do one proof, and that proof says, well, for every expression, if you normalize it and then evaluate it, so I get the same uh, result as just evaluating that expression. This is a few lines long, and it's not that very interesting. But why I mention it is I can use this to now kind of run my, to write my monoid solver, where I pass in two arguments, and these, these two arguments are expressions, and I believe these two expressions to be equal. So they're built up from, uh, from the monoid operations. And then I need a kind of proof, which is hopefully just going to be very easy. It's hopefully just going to hold uh, by, cal cal by calculation, namely that evaluating the or normalizing the left-hand side and normalizing the right-hand side of my expression are equal. And if I have that, then I can get that my two expressions are equal. So to call our solver, uh, all I need to do is kind of quote the two sides of the equality that I'm trying to prove. So what I can see here is I'm trying to prove an equality over a list. So I have to write an expression E1, which represents the left-hand side, and expression E2, which represents the right-hand side. And now I can call my solver. And um, uh, all I need to do is pass in REFL, and I'm done. So this construction works for any monoid, in particular, the monoid of natural numbers using accumulating addition. So to come full circle, I don't really have to do the proof. I can now use this monoid solver to complete the first definition of reverse that we saw. So to recap, the KD representation of a monoid satisfies the monoid laws by definition. And that's a useful trick to have in your, whenever you're programming with dependent types. So this might be particularly useful if you're writing functions with uh, an accumulator, and this accumulator is indexed by a monoid. And whether this is very useful or not kind of depends on your tolerance for complicated type signatures. And crucially, you can use the same trick to solve uh, monoidal equations for almost free. Uh, kind of with a little bit of work. You need one very short proof. That's all I have time for, but thanks very much. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Same procedures before. Micro OK. 
Okay, no microphone questions so far. I've, I've got one question. <laughs> so, so usually sure. when, when you finally get something to work out fine in Agda, there are still mm -hmm. some gnarly cases. So when, when mm -hmm. does this not work? Uh, <laughs> um, so it's still quite, it's not trivial to reason about these things, right? Uh, so even if you have a definition using Foldel, which is very short and sweet, and it kind of fits in three lines, that's great. Uh, but then if you want to do any proofs, you have to be very careful and generalize in the right direction so that you can actually still use your induction hypothesis. Um, there are a few other examples in the paper, I think, uh, that might be interesting. Any other questions? Okay, then we'll just thank the speakers and take the break. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Enjoy the rest of ICFP. And
start now? Good? Yeah. Okay, okay uh, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Alex Hubers. I'm going to be presenting some joint work with uh, Garrett Morris at the University of Iowa. And uh, the name of the talk is Generic Programming with Extensible Data Types. And if you don't know what that means or that's confusing, that's actually OK, because I will explain it to you uh, in this talk. Um, seems that, OK. So uh, we're going to begin with, uh, we're going to motivate the problem with what I'm going to call the ad hoc expression problem. And um, it's going to be ad hoc in that uh, we're going to be looking at ad um, an AST. And we're going to simplify it from how the you know, uh, expression problem is usually formulated to consider a uh, Boolean AST with nothing too complicated right now, just the true and false constants. So that's the cases. Let's consider the behaviors. Um, imagine defining uh, the, like the eek type class over this data type. And um, we define it as expected. We know that t equals t and f equals f. And then we use this, uh, oops, this defaulting case to kind of handle the, we, we don't really feel like specifying that f equals, doesn't equal t and t doesn't equal f. So it's doing some work for us. And so, oh, this, there you go. Now we're going to extend uh, the data type as is expected for the expression problem. We'll consider adding um, named variables. And uh, we, let's look at the, this defaulting behavior, right? So for the original case, for f equals t, it did save us some work. We didn't have to write um, out this specification. But for the case extension, it has not worked, right? We end up in a situation where this default behavior is telling us that x uh, does not equal x. So we identify that this equation is doing two things for us, right? It's kind of correctly uh, defaulting the known but unspecified cases, but then it's incorrectly um, giving behavior to the, any case extensions. So one of the questions we'll be asking in this talk is like, can we extend data types in this manner uh, that kind of retains, uh, that retains the correct behavior and fixes the incorrect? Uh, and we'll be continuing our sort of dissection of equality comparison here at the start to, to illustrate that. So uh, as a means of problem solving, let's imagine what uh, the right solution looks like. Let's imagine we're in a modular world um, where everything is completely extensible and structured typing and error messages are never a problem somehow. Uh, we would probably define our cases independently. For example, we define t independently. And with the cases, we define the behaviors. So here uh, we have the t case, and then we know that t equals t is the only equation that's necessary. We do the same for the f case, right? f equals f, we're good. Um, and then we say do the same for the v case, where we know that vx equals vy if x equals y, this, um, if their underlying strings are the same. Furthermore, uh, let's suppose just for illustration that we have some way of combining these cases, which is pretty common um, in, say, a paper like data types a la carte, uh, where you can combine cases um, via this infix plus operator. And now let's, uh, these are, this is our setup of our cases. Let's look at behaviors. So um, in our perfect world, we, our unspecified behavior remains correct, right? I didn't give an equation for f equals t, but it does come out back false. Uh, our, we fixed our variable case. Uh, you know, now x does say it's uh, equal to x. But uh, the subtlety here is we have not uh, overgeneralized this, e, this um, function. So we're not just defaulting false to literally everything, and that's how we're inheriting this behavior. In other words, nonsense says nonsense. And you go, great, uh, great Alex. Um, you also have to provide a solution. So how are we going to get there is the question. And um, the, we want to do it safely and without recompilation of existing code. This is just as the expression problem is, is stated originally. We want to do it uh, without encodings because we're kind of interested in a first class and ergonomic solution. And we also don't want to uh, use too advanced machinery. These are just uh, sort of restrictions we're giving ourselves that interest us. And the machinery that we found to fit this ticket uh, is called row types, which we're going to step aside and kind of explain at least what's important about row types for the purpose of this talk right now. So uh, for the purpose of this talk, I really just want to highlight that what row types obviate. 
and that is the duality between variants or algebraic data types and records. And to make that point clear, let's, let's talk about what do algebraic data types consist of, right? We have the, a list of labels, which are the names of constructors, and then we have the, uh, a, a list of the types, which is the types of the constructor input. Now consider the dual for records. What do records consist of? Well, the names of the destructors and the types of the destructor output. In other words, in both of these declarations, uh, we have labels mapped to types. That's what we can abstract in commonality between the two of them. We call this mapping a row. So for our x ray data type, uh, a row is maps t to the unit type, f to the unit type, and v to string. And uh, we're going to abbreviate this type because we're going to be using it quite a bit and just call it expr. Um, and we use curly braces to kind of denote rows. So that's, uh, that's the abstraction. How do we reify it back into um, the actual data? Well, uh, rows themselves are not types. We use these type operators, uh, sigma and pi, to reconstruct the data. So sigma reconstructs um, the algebraic data type. This, you know, so sigma expert is isomorphic to the usual Haskell type that you're looking at. And then pi is going to construct a record. So pi expert is going to construct a record that has these tf and v destructors. And, and note here, I'm overloading syntax a bit, but for usually when you see curly braces, it will refer to rows. OK, let's go back to uh, the, that, those are the cases. Let's again consider the behaviors. Um, so we're considering eek, the eek, like eek type class at expert. So it, that is equality comparison of two variants, i.e., we're really thinking about the eek type class at, instantiated at sigma expert. What have we changed here? Well, now we're, we're, not, we're now using rows to represent our data type, not the initial declaration, which means we need this sigma here. The sigma constructs a variant from a row. And to reiterate, the sigma expert is just isomorphic to what uh, we originally saw. So that's very good. You say, that's great. OK, I follow. But this doesn't make any sense, right? Eek is a type class, and expert is a row. This is clearly ill-defined behavior. So eek expert question mark? You ask, well, uh, let's try to imagine what, what, the, what we think this should be, right? Um, it's pretty common to view type classes as evidence or as elaborating to evidence. Um, in this case, you know, the E type class kind of stands for evidence that we know how to equate a type A. And so we can think about E and then instead just as a type operator. So E A um, takes in the type and it gives you an A to A to bool function, or it gives you back the Boolean comparator. And for example, here's the computation. You know, eek of the unit type gives you unit to unit to bool. And eek of string gives you string to string to bool. OK, so now we ask the question, what does this mean to apply eek to a row? Well, consider the singleton case, right? Consider a row that just has a single label and a single type. It seems rather intuitive to just map uh, eek over, into the, over the types inside there, which is sort of like saying, well, if I, have, if I know that t labels unit, then I know uh, eek applied to that is just going to be like the, the comparator at that type. And then further, if you extend this idea to all the row components, just do what we did before, but for all of them, uh, you, we end up with like, uh, basically, we know how to handle every case. Or uh, we know the comparators for every case. So in other words, we're going to think of where we originally had eek expert, we're going to think of that uh, and now I sort of translate it instead into a record of instantiations, where pi is constructing a record from the row. The row is eek expert. And so pi eek expert is the record of instantiations, kind of like we saw. And so where does this leave us, OK? Uh, we have this function. And what's the fun the function is saying, if we are given a record of instantiations at eek over these cases, can I produce an eek instance for the same cases, but for a variant, right? That's basically what we're saying. And uh, this is an interesting question that has an interesting answer in 2019. This is something more or less some fudging around with the calculi, but we could answer in a paper called Abstracting Extensible Data Types in a language called ROSE, which is R-O-S-E. Sorry about that. Um, so you might ask as the audience, uh, firstly, what's novel here? And you also might ask, as the ICFP audience here, 
uh, you know, this is not the ad hoc expression problem thingy. We're not, I don't see anything here about modularity. In fact, I see only three cases. So I would say to you, hold your horses. And uh, we'll consider in, popular, in, in the Rose language, um, we actually can do some sort of extensibility by, by looking at row polymorphism, which is to say, we're gonna quantify over all rows R. And then here we have a qualified type that gives a, what we call the containment predicate. So qualified types are like type classes, but they generalize past that to be to arbitrary predicates. Um, and what is this containment predicate saying? It says, well, I, I'm quantifying over all rows R such that R is contained in Xver. In other words, all rows are such that it has like some subset of these uh, uh, label type associations. Um, unfortunately, that's not particularly interesting, right? That just means I cannot like operate on variants that were constructed. I mean, it actually doesn't mean very much at all because any of the variants with less can inject into uh, R anyway. Um, and, and further, if you notice, we, expert is only appearing in the qualification. So it's not really clear what it's doing for us. It seems to be inhibiting us for no good reason. A very natural question to ask following that then is, what about uh, unbounded R? Can I write this equation, or sorry, write this term for uh, any arbitrary R without knowing anything about the labels? And um, in the previous work, you could not and the contribution of this work in a language we call R omega is that, yes, you can. Um, and that's one of the things we'll be uh, getting back to later in the talk. So we're gonna call this generic programming with rows because we're kind of thinking about um, uh, rows as signifying data and uh, we're talking about it without respect to the labels, right? Here we don't know any information about the label. And in particular, this is uh, already a talk about duality, so we're going to consider two directions um, to, to illustrate. Um, yeah, so we're going to consider uh, at first reflecting records, and then we'll consider the opposite after that. So what do I mean by reflecting records? Um, so imagine we have a record of eliminators, right? And by eliminator, uh, I mean this, over the cases of sigma expert. So, um, all I'm really trying to say is expert has cases, right? And uh, I want to be able to handle every case in there and eliminate it to the type A. Um, the, that, there's some funny business here, which is that um, in R omega we have, we, you can lift sort of type constructors to row kind. And so this arrow here is, is actually some trickery. The expert arrow A is really like, if I, if I rearrange and do the computation here, is uh, I move it back to prefix notation and then I unfold expert and I do um, like one step of computation to see that it's this partially applied arrow and I still see I have an A um, to finish up applying and I get this. So this is what I mean when I'm talking about a record of eliminators. I'm just saying, uh, you know, for the T case, I know how to eliminate it. F case, I know how to eliminate it. V case and so forth. Okay, now the claim is that is sufficient information to be able to destruct a variant constructed along the same cases, right? We should be able to produce a variant eliminator. Uh, so for example, um, one sort of record of behaviors might be this truthy record, which says that uh, the T label maps to uh, the constant true function, the F label maps to the constant false function, and the V label maps to the, um, it just checks if the string length is non-empty. Uh, non and here um, I'll indicate that this triangle bit is just a, the term level association of, of labels to terms. So uh, under this definition, you would expect that the variant constructed at T is gonna be true when you reflect truthy over it. And uh, when constructed by F is gonna be false when you, when you reflect truthy over it. And for V, the, the variable X, it's going to be true because X is not empty. Okay, so that's the idea behind the type signature. Uh, the next question, obviously, is how do you populate it? And we're gonna take this uh, kind of piece by piece. So to begin with, we have our inputs, uh, D, this record of eliminators. Um, v, which is the variant we want to now eliminate. 
and question mark, which is we're eliminating to A, so produce a term at type A. Now, uh, we are still in this world where we know all the cases for, sort of for illustration. So, you know, in any functional language, you're going to write this function by proceeding by case analysis. Um, we eventually want to do away with that, but that's going to illustrate sort of the logic we're going to generalize. So, proceeding by case analysis in R omega, we have this case helper, and uh, this is not primitive, it's derivable, and it, but it just says, if the variant V is constructed by T, eliminate with this body, right? So that handles the uh, T case, and here it handles the F case, and here would handle the V case. And um, as is common, uh, we, want a way, we need a way to compose these different handlers, right? And we're going to do that with um, this construct we call the branching combinator, which is an upside down triangle. And let's take a look at that now. So um, looking at the type signature of the branching combinator, the first thing you'll see is the presence of another qualified type. Uh, in R omega, we have two predicates in our uh, qualified type language. We have uh, containment, which you saw before, and this is combination. And it, this is simply saying that if we, for row variables, or um, row one and row two and row three, uh, we know two things. We know that this operation is well-defined, where row one plus row two equals row three, and we, and we know that row one plus row two equals row three. So then further, uh, the branching combinator is saying, if, if I know that rows row one and row two combine to row three, and I know that I have uh, these eliminators for each side, then I should be able to like, eliminate uh, the whole, right? I should be able to eliminate row three. In other words, uh, you can think of branching as the concatenation of variant eliminators. And in fact, it's completely, it's more or less dual to concatenation. So coming back here, let's see this in illustration. Um, we see that this line has, uh, handles the singleton case along label T, and this one handles the F case. And so branching them should be, should be able to handle both cases. And then further, uh, this line handles the V case, and so branching that should give us the totality of the cases. Okay, next question is, uh, are you, we have question marks here, right? What should be inside here? Well. Um, our strategy is very simple, right? In, D is this record that tells us the behavior at that label. So we have another, uh, it's not a primitive, it's uh, derivable, it's this cell, which just, just stands for select the um, T uh, labeled thing in D. And that get, it gives us sort of like a handler, and we're gonna apply it to X, that type unit, and we get back something at type A. And by nature of this setup, uh, this logic is uniform for all of the cases, right? In each case, where whether it's TF or V, we're going to look for the TF or V thing in, in the record and then apply it to um, the value we have. And now, again, you say, uh, okay, there's probably a point here somewhere. This seems more like an elaborate setup. Um, yes, there is. I will get, we will get to it right now. Um, you, as I stated, we're going to consider now when we have no information about the labels, right? So now I've changed the types to ensure of reflect to just be this row, or type variable R, or row variable R. And let's look at the, the logic that we wrote, namely that we have none of it left, right? We have D, V, and, and nothing else because we were relying so heavily on case distinction. But you can ask the question, just looking at this code, uh, why would we need this? In particular, uh, can we not analyze, you know, if all of the logic is um, routine between the three of them, if it uh, conforms, why do we need to actually handle all three cases separately? And that's the genesis of what we call the Anna combinator in R omega. So to explain what Anna does is really just to say it, get, it does exactly this. The Anna primitive um, is a label generic case distinction. So in particular, it's we're going to be using first class labels. Okay. Um, yeah, first class labels uh, da, 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 uh, to analyze the, the contents. So suppose we have an arbitrary row component, L labeling U and R, 
because we know how we want to use this Anna Combinator, so let's consider um, how are we going to actually type it and make it, make it happen. Well, within the, within the body of Anna, we want to be labeled generically analyzing the variant, V, and so uh, L and X here should give us like uh, the components of the row at that point. So here L should be, is a first class label where this sort of machinery makes the type from the label. And X um, has type U is the thing that's also in the row component. And given those two things, we have an obligation to return A because in the individual case we need to return A so that in the whole case we return A. Um, and so in general for the body, or for typing Anna, what we're really saying um, for F the body is that if I know for each L labeling U and R, if I know how to uniformly destruct each component, then I should be able to uniformly, uniformly destruct the whole. Okay, so that's part one. And I think we can sneak in the dual and call her there. So dually, if I can reflect a record of eliminators into a variant eliminator, I should be able to reify a variant eliminator into a record of eliminators. And all I've done here is just swap these two around. And let's repeat the same exercise as before. We know that, uh, so in particular, we're going to be using this sin combinator, which is completely dual to Anna. And we know that we have F, which eliminates the variant sigma R, and sin uh, dual to Anna, which should have the obligation to construct a record, right? It's sort of like saying, if I, if I can construct a record from each of the labels and just knowing those, then I can make the bigger one. So sin builds pi, in this case, pi r arrow a from label L and row R. Okay, how do we go about uh, building this term? Well, again, we know, in particular, we know that uh, in the body of sin, we have L labeling u arrow a is contained in r arrow a, which remember r is a row variable, so this is a, a lifting of the arrow uh, type constructor. And more or less, we, we know both of these things. We know that L labeling u arrow a is in r arrow a, and also really just L labeling u is in r. Um, and we're trying to build something. We're trying to build something at this type. So now in the body of sin, we have an obligation to construct a term at type u arrow a. And we're gonna be given uh, one of the same things. We obviously get the labels so we know what to construct. Um, and here we have to recall that uh, we are constructing a record, right? So we have an obligation to build a, or sorry, we're constructing a function. We have an obligation to build a function. So the first thing to do when you're building a function is you um, presume a term at its input type, which in this case is x at the type u. And now finally, our, we have an obligation to construct a term at type a. How do we do this? Here's the general strategy. We're gonna to wanna to build the variant, uh, a singleton variant um, at type sigma L uh, U and inject it into sigma R and then use F to destruct it. And this is precisely what that looks like. Um, con is this derivable term as well that just says construct the singleton uh, with label L and term X. And uh, it injects into sigma R due to the qualified types which kind of allow us to do that. And then F destroy, uh, destructs it. So in general, in, in the dual case, when we look at the type, um, type of derivation of, of sin, what we're saying is if I can uniformly construct each component, given just the label, then I should be able to uniformly construct the whole. And um, we did, I, so I started, I led, led with this example on equating variants, and I'm not gonna have time, so I'm gonna skip ahead to the uh, a little advertisement for the rest of the paper. Um, but spoiler alert, I am, you are able to type the thing that I said at the start. Uh, it is possible. So in the paper, um, we also, you know, I've, I've presented a sort of a small fragment. Uh, we also found we actually had to lift this to higher order rows, that is rows that contain, say, uh, type constructors and the like. And that permitted us to do some very interesting things like writing a type, type transforming map you know, for example, if, if the insides uh, can transfer from U to T, um, then you should be able to, uh, uh, yeah. Um, the point is it got complicated. <laughs> uh, you need to do all this business. And um, that allows us to actually lift things, not just like the eek type class, but even more interesting type classes like the functor type class. 
And um, then finally, the, the last contribution of the paper is that we give a denotational semantics into AGDA that gives a, a proof of type sa safety. And um, that's the gist. Okay, questions? So if we've uh, got any questions, then the microphones are there. Um, and remember to state your name and affiliation. Hey, Javor uh, Diachki from Gallo. I was wondering uh, if you can say a little bit about runtime evidence. So you had your function to make a record, and it knew how to initialize each field. But how does it know what fields are there in the record in the first place? Can, can I ask you to, re I'm, I'm, he's not coming in. Oh. oh. I'll try again. Or maybe a bit closer to the mic. Sorry. Okay, uh, so this is, this, this is this is better. Good. Uh, so I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about runtime evidence that's being passed for these roles. In particular, for example, you gave an example of making a record out of uh, some of initializers, essentially, which were some type. So that tells you how to make each field, but how do you know what fields to make in the first place? So how would you compile a polymorphic function like that? So the role needs some kind of representation, right? Um, yeah, if I understand correctly, so you're kind of wondering where's, where are these labels going? Like, yeah, I'm wondering how big of a tuple are you going to be making? So how do you know so, how big um, is it? The, sh the short answer is in our sort of runtime semantics, uh, in our denotation, we erase the labels. So all of this information is really contained in the predicates. That is to say, the, the interpretation of the predicates. So. Um, uh, in, in particular, we, we consider um, the predicates kind of give you this index mapping between different rows. So, so rows get rid of their labels, and now they're just indexed, right? And then the, the predicates are going to, the interpretation of those is going to house the information that tells you where things go. It's sort of the idea. Okay, Patrick Jansson from Chalmers. So you seem to have a for all R and then things like sigma R and pi R and so on. So I wonder what happens if it's sigma of int or sigma of char or sigma of sigma of something. I mean, what happens when you apply sigma to something which is not a row? Yeah, good question. Um, in our development, we restricted things uh, to rows with kind star. So rows are indexed also by kind and um, the, the formation of uh, variants and records re requires that they have kind star. The, the thing contained in the row is kind star. So somewhere there is a hidden, in the for all, there is a restriction that the R is actually sort of well of Yeah, so let me back that up. Um, I, we, I, I omitted the, t the types. You're, you're correct to observe that I omitted the type on uh, the kind annotation on R. Um, really just to save space. So, I mean, here it, we're doing implicit quantification. Like I said, this, this R is actually for all R such that it has row, kind, housing, kind star. Okay. Yeah. Hello, Ethan Smith, Google. Uh, we kind of, at the start of the talk, alluded to some type class stuff where we're going to compose uh, individual case type classes into larger ones. Uh, and this reflect combinator looks rife for kind of implicitly constructing the dictionary. Have you given any thought to what that would look like and how that would fit into the system? Was well, that given any thought to what? Uh, so we're creating type class instances for individual cases, and then sorry, I'm very tall. Is it alright? <laughs> no, it's okay. Can I get closer? A bit, bit of an echo. There we go. Now we're coming in. Sorry. So our reflect, uh, we have this dictionary of eliminators that looks rife for kind of implicit construction from individual cases. Have you given any thought concretely to what that might look like and how that would fit into this label generic programming we're doing? The same what? Sorry. I'm really sorry. No, you're fine. You're fine. I'm not being clear. Are so, you talking about going from unary to binary? Is that the question? Or? Yeah. So in the expression example, we lay out very nicely. If I have two trues, they equal each other. If I have two falses, they equal each other. And then I can combine those. Uh, so I imagine can we automatically combine those through kind of in our compiler and then fill in this uh, row of eliminators for the user because we know how to do that from some kind of set of ground instances? Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try it. All right, fair enough. <laughs> okay. Cool, all right. I think we should uh, thank the speaker.
Right, and so the, uh, the second talk in this session is going to be by Beppe Castagna, um, talking about um, <laughs> typing records, maps, and structs. You know, so I, the microphone. OK, I cannot. OK. OK, so this is a, a talk on records, again, so which are, as you know, uh, finite maps from labels, uh, uh, keys, uh, attribute names, uh, you name it, uh, uh, to values, okay? And I will focus uh, on uh, two particular usages of records. One, it is like structs, which means uh, you have a predefined set of labels and uh, uh, mapped into values of different types, and uh, uh, if you select a label that is absent, then you have an error runtime. And the other is dictionary maps, uh, uh, associated tables in which uh, uh, labels are generated at runtime, and if you select a label that is absent, uh, it gives you one particular uh, value, uh, nil, null, something. And uh, I will show you how to type a language in which records mix both usages, and uh, also uh, you have a, a union intersection and negation types, and we have a very strong motivation for, for that. And the problem I will show you to how to solve is how to define the subtyping relation and how to type operational records. Uh, in the paper, there is also uh, some work on mutable records, but I will not present it here. So record, the, I don't know how many knows that it, they were first defined by Tony Hoare in 65 and uh, rapidly ad adopted by Simul 67 to yield uh, the concept of objects and classes. And since then, they were used in a, a lot of different scenarios. Uh, and in particular, as I said, I will focus on two particular usages. The one of structured data, uh, the original proposed by Hoare, and the one of uh, maps, associated arrays, dictionary, hashes, lookup tables. Okay? So there are differences between these two. Uh, and a lot of difference, and for each difference, you will find a language for which there is an exception on this one. And I want to focus on three uh, aspects. The first one is that for maps, uh, all keys usually have the same type, and they map uh, into values of the same type, while for struct, uh, the uh, different keys can map to different uh, types. Uh, then, in the maps, the key are values because you can compute them and use the result to select uh, something in uh, uh, the map, while in struct, uh, they are not necessary value and the access is by nominal keys. And uh, also, the important part is that uh, accessing a key that is absent in a map gives you nil or null, while accessing a key in a struct gives you an error. So to do uh, this thing, uh, I defined a calculus, a functional calculus, in which I added a record, of course, and uh, three operations, selection, deletion, and uh, uh, record concatenation with priority on uh, the right-hand side. And these are the struct operation, if you want. And then I added the map operations, which are, uh, well, the same operation, access, deletion, and concatenation of a single field. But the important thing here is that uh, the uh, label used for this operation can be the result of an expression. And of course, the other difference is that uh, in the rewriting semantics, uh, if you try to select a label uh, that is absent here, the uh, semantics is undefined, while for the map selection, uh, it just gives you nil, okay? So, types, what are the requirements? Well, we want uh, a type system which types cover both map and struct usage and the mixed one, and also we want uh, union intersection negation types, very simply because this work stemmed from a collaboration with the developer of Elixir Ballerina languages, uh, in which they have these types and also this kind of usage for records. Uh, so for example, I will show you the example in Elixir. Uh, in Elixir, you have this kind of 
uh, type in which you have a record that maps uh, the atom foo to atom. In, in an exhibit, atom is just a user refined constant with a column before. You have an optional field bar that is mapped to atom, which means if a field for bar is present, then it is mapped to, uh, to an atom. And any other atom that is neither bar or foo must be mapped into integer if present. Okay? And this is an example of mixed usage because the first two are typical of structs, the third one is typical of, of maps. For what concerns uh, union and intersection issue type, just to show union, with this type here is the type of records that have exactly two fields, one field output, and according to the value of this uh, field, if it is okay, you have a second field socket of type socket. If uh, the output field is error, then you have a second message uh, field uh, whose value is either timeout or a pair delay integer. And notice here that we use or, or is the union for, uh, union type for Elixir. And let me continue this example. So imagine that now you have a, 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 a record, a map in uh, Elixir parlance uh, of the previous type. If now I do m.foo, I know that uh, uh, where m has this type, uh, I know that foo must be present, so this expression type atom. If I try to do m.bar, since uh, the field is optional, it may be absent, so it is a, 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 an error at run, uh, static type, sorry. Uh, but of course, I can use the map selection, and I know that if bar is present, I will uh, receive an atom, otherwise I will get nil. So the expression is type atom union nil. And if I try to select uh, uh, an atom that is neither four nor bar, then it is the third case that applies, so the system will deduce integer or nil. And finally, uh, uh, sorry, uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, the interest of this uh, expression here is that you can put here an expression, not just a key. So let put, let's us put uh, m.foo, this as type atom, so we know that uh, all these cases apply, so it can be an atom, it can be an integer, or if the result of m dot foo is uh, gives a field that is absent, nil. And finally, uh, if I give an expression that cannot produce any atom, then uh, the system will tell me, oh, the, this is well typed with type nil, but give me a, a warning because a selection that always give nil maybe is not very useful. Okay, so uh, how I did this, uh, I defined a, a, some types, which are, uh, there are type constructors like int, bool, atom, arrows, etc. Then we have set theoretic types, union, intersection, negation, the top type that types uh, all the values, and the empty type that types no value. And of course, there are records, which are sets of fields, where fields are of two kinds here. So this is the field that must be present, it's mandatory, and must be associated to a, a, a value of type T. And this is the optional field, which means that if a field for L is present, then it must be mapped to something of type T. And this is the usage of struct types, and for map types, we had a new field, which maps some key types, a subset of keys, to some type T, okay? And uh, what is this uh, key types? Well, at least underscore, which means and all the other keys are mapped to value of this type, and something else that depends on the language you use. For example, if you use a language like Ballerina, you have that all the keys are uh, string, and, but, but the map has just defined that you can map a key, a, a string into integer, into, so it maps all the strings, you cannot differentiate which strings. So it has just underscore. TypeScript, you can define, of course, underscore, but you can say you map string into something, number into something, and symbol. And the most generic usage is uh, Erlang type spec, where for key types, you can specify any type. So you can define a map that maps uh, functions of type boolean to integer into something else, even though I think it's not a very good idea. <laughs> um, so, uh, with these types, we can encode all, already a few things. We can uh, encode open record types, which are 
which is the types that uh, as the field plus any other field that is uh, any other key uh, if it is present then it is a type and we can uh, uh, encode the closer record type which is the records that have exactly only these fields since here it says that any other fields if it's present it must be associated to a value of the empty type so it must be absent uh, and uh, uh, the top type that is uh, the top record type, which is uh, every record is smaller than this, is just uh, the open record with no other field. Uh, the Elixir example I showed you before, here is encoded by this type that says uh, foo is mandatory to atom, bar is optional to atom, any other atom is mapped to int, and everything is uh, uh, map else is mapped to zero because in uh, Elixir record types are closed, okay? And if you want to write an open record type in Elixir, you write dot, dot, dot here, and so you put a one here. Okay, the type system, uh, there are standard rules, one rule for each constructor, for records, just say that this record expression has the closest record expression of the corresponding types. And then you have rules for the structure, rules for the maps. I don't want to comment all of them, just uh, the rules for selection. And notice that uh, for struct selection, if I try to select the label L for E, all it requires is that the E is a record in which L is present and then there may be some other uh, fields. While for map selection, uh, I select uh, uh, the label result of E2 from E1, so we require that E2 is a, just a record, okay, nothing else, and E2 must be a subset of uh, the labels. And uh, uh, in that case, what I, I obtain as a result is exactly the same operation applied to the types. So to define this type system, I need to do two things. One is to define the subtyping relation I use it here, 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 here. And the other one is to define and compute the type operator I use it here, 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 and here. So how do I proceed? Well, for subtyping, I will show you that uh, uh, our record values are particular functions that are called the quasi-constant function. I interpret types as set of values, and therefore I interpret uh, record types as set of quasi-constant functions. Then I define subtyping as one type is smaller than the other if the set of the value of one is smaller than the set of the value of the other. So in particular, I can use this interpretation uh, to decide how to decide, uh, to define how uh, to decide the record subtyping, and I will derive a backtracking-free algorithm. For type operator, the problem is that we can select, uh, do an operation like dot .l on a type T, which is not just a record type, but it can be a union of intersection of record types and negation of record types. And negation is really what uh, makes things difficult. So what I do is to define a new notation for records in which I embed the negation, and which has the property that any subtype of the open record uh, is a union of this record. And then it is easy to define the operation on these unions. So let me show first the case for ballerina. In ballerina what we have, sorry, what we have is that uh, you have just, uh, for, for maps, you can just define a default uh, behavior that means all the other keys are mapped there. Uh, and then I define a quasi-constant function, which is just a function which is constant apart from a finite set of its domain. So consider this function f, this is always constant uh, uh, y0 apart from x1, xn. So I call domain of f this x1, xn, and the default value of f the uh, y0. Okay. Once I define it, this is clear that the record value is a quasi-constant function from labels to value or undefined. And a record value is a function that is always undefined apart from a uh, finite set of labels. 
uh, well, also a uh, record type is a, is a quasi constant function, but it's less interesting. What is interesting is that now we know how to interpret the record type, which is the set of all quasi constant functions from uh, labels to value or undefined, such that their default value is uh, undefined, and the corresponding value are in the corresponding type of the record. Okay, so now we can use this interpretation to decide subtyping. First observation, decided subtyping is equivalent to decide emptiness of a type because T1 is smaller than T2 if and only if T1 intersection not T2 is empty. Second thing, uh, every type which is smaller than the, the open record it uh, can be put in a disjunctive normal form. That is a union of uh, uh, intersection of records and negation of records. Uh, so we have to decide the emptiness of this union. Therefore, we have to decide the emptiness of uh, this, each term in there. So uh, to do that, uh, we can do it, it, it with an unreadable formula that I don't want you to read, okay? Uh, the only things that I want, to, it is in the paper, there is the explanation. The only things that I want you to observe is that uh, this subtyping of these records is defined by uh, uh, decomposing the problem on the subcomponent. So on the default value of these records and on the type of the field of these records. And the second thing is that here we have a NOR. So a naive uh, implementation of this uh, uh, decomposition would be, well, I first try this. If it fails, then I throw away all the hypotheses I added, especially if I add recursive types, and then I start again. So the last point is how to define a backtracking-free subtyping algorithm. So how to decide this without backtracking? Well, first observation, an intersection of records is always the record of intersection. They are like uh, products in that. So uh, I move the intersection inside uh, here, yielding some R0. So now what I have to do is to compute emptiness of these things. And this is equivalent to, again, an unreadable formula. Uh, so that checks uh, this is empty if it only if R0 is empty, or I call this phi function, which is defined, uh, which has as parameter the positive one, the set of negative records, and uh, if the set is, is empty, it is false. If uh, it is not, I pick one R, I do some test, and I do recursive call. So no backtracking there. Okay. Type operators, what do I have to do? Well, type operators, if I have just a single record there, it's very easy, okay? So uh, uh, the dot L on a, on a record R is, uh, well, the, the, the mapping of R as a, as a function, okay? Provided that this field L is neither undefined nor optional, which means R L doesn't contain uh, undefined in it. For the map selection, uh, well, it's the same. Uh, I just do the union of all the labels that are there inside. And if there is the undefined, I remove it and put nil instead. The problem is how to do when uh, now I have to do dot L on a disjunctive not normal form of the records. And for doing that, what I do, the problem is the negation. So I embed the negation in my representation here. Again, these things is that, I don't want you to read it, but just notice that this part is composed by a normal record part, this is the labels and this is the default value, plus a set of types that represent the negative part. And the property of this representation is that every type that is a subtype of the open record is equivalent to a union of these records. The second thing is that uh, uh, there is a, a um, effective uh, transformation uh, that allows you to uh, map uh, uh, a disjunctive normal form into this union, and uh, uh, the type operators are defined for this new form exactly as uh, on uh, the um, uh, old form. Okay, so now, uh, to uh, define our operation on something that is a subtype of the record, uh, open record, I just 
transform it into a union, and then I distribute this, the, the operation uh, on the unions. Uh, the general case is uh, Erlang maps, uh, so very difficult case in which you can map anything in, to any type. And uh, the problem here is when you have uh, overlapping domains. Uh, that is to say, uh, let me give again an example in Elixir. So this is a, a map that maps a pair of uh, integer term into atom and pair of term integer into integer, where term is the top type in Elixir. And this is semantically uh, equivalent to the record which maps integer and not integer to atom, uh, not integer and integer into integer, and maps uh, pairs of integers into the empty types. So uh, they must be undefined. And there are different solutions for that. Uh, Luau, what it does, it says, yeah, so let's uh, consider it. So we know that uh, all fields of type integer integer must be undefined because they map to the uh, empty type. TypeScript does a different uh, solution, that is they restrict the key types just to avoid overlapping. They, they, the types they give, they do not overlap. So the solution we chose for Elixir is uh, like TypeScript, we use a fixed uh, set of key types that do not overlap, but a little bit more, so atom, string, etc., pairs and records. So this is less expressive because you cannot say uh, my map maps from uh, uh, integer string into string, but just from pairs into string. Uh, but the advantage is a simple extension of the previous theory. It can be extended with raw polymorphism and other solution as possible as long as your key types do not overlap. So uh, an example in Elixir, you see here I added these two examples that uh, uh, maps uh, map into lists uh, and uh, triples into functions. So why it is an extension of previous theory? Well, the only difference is that the default value uh, now is not a type but becomes a product indexed on all the key types. Uh, this type in relation, this is how it was defined before. And uh, the only things that you have to modify now for this case is just uh, this red part, that is, you check the default uh, uh, value for all the key types. And uh, finally, for type operators, you have just slightly to change the uh, um, representation here. Instead of having a single default type and a set of types, what you have is a, a tuple of uh, types and a set of tuples where each component corresponds to one different uh, result type and it has a meaning that uh, you can uh, see in the paper. So conclusion, uh, what I did, it's a type system for mixed usage of strat maps. Uh, it is uh, uh, difficult because of the presence of saturated type, especially because of negation, uh, but actually it boils down to do two things, and that's what the paper does. Define and decide subtyping, and define and uh, compute the type operators. So I gave algorithm to decide compute uh, them and prove the, their soundness. So, uh, so the paper is rather technical, which is a euphemism for boring. Uh, I apologize to the reviewers of ICFP, uh, but it has very practical motivation since it's being implemented in Elixir and under consideration for the implementation in Ballerina. Uh, future work, uh, well, raw polymorphism, we are quite advanced on that, is not uh, easy, of course, because union intersection negation types. And the other part is of we don't want to use in Elixir a, a fixed uh, uh, set of key types, we would like uh, the programmer to give us the way you partition key types, and so we are working on that, and then I will be happy to, have you, to answer your questions if uh, I can. Thank you. Some. Is this on? Okay. Uh, so 
fantastic work as always. Uh, Sam Tobin Hawks at Indiana University. Uh, oh. So one thing that people do in TypeScript is, or in JavaScript generally, is they treat symbol, particular symbols, as as if they were like a named field. Uh, and that, that's in fact what the symbol feature in JavaScript was created for. So you could have something that was both first class, but also sort of more like dot rather than indexing. And I wonder, to, would that be a, it feels like that ought to be a straightforward extension here, but I'm not certain. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the, your question. Okay, well then so maybe. You, you said in, in TypeScript, the, well, what I know in TypeScript. I don't, I don't think they support this in TypeScript today, but this is sort of so what you would want. In, in, there, there is unrelated work and explanation of how it relates to TypeScript. In TypeScript, they, you can have one exception, just one case in which you say, uh, uh, oh, no, no, that's not TypeScript, it's flow, sorry. Uh, in TypeScript, uh, you can have uh, 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 the underscore, a string, number, uh, something else, and a huge finite union of constants. That's all they mm, have, right, I guess. Right, right. Uh, TypeScript definitely doesn't handle what I'm asking about. I'm, but maybe we should take this offline. Yeah, uh, uh, but, and they have uh, the possibility, they put in the square brackets, uh, say, uh, it is, but in the square brackets, you can just put string, uh, integer, or things like that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, sure, uh, but let's take this offline. Uh, uh, I think okay, it'll require sorry. more explanation. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, so I have a question then. Well, like, A, thanks for the shout out. Uh, and B, one of the decisions that we made I was like, uh, oh, 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 sorry, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the decisions that, that we made was to restrict the places that type negation was needed. Uh -huh. And it seems like quite a lot of the hoops you're having to jump through here yeah. are about dealing with negation of record types. And you've already got like a notion of a key type. So, so do you actually, in this development, need negation on anything other than key types? Uh, I don't think so, because uh, usually if you take the key types and you do the negation, uh, what you are negating, at least in this framework, is uh, uh, all the other labels that you use. So it is a, a finite, uh, uh, it's a finite, finite set of uh, labels. So intuitively, you can just specify the type of these things. So if you want to say uh, it maps uh, string uh, into something apart from uh, this string, then you, you just say maps every string there and this string is mapped into top optional. And so you don't need uh, uh, negation, but well, maybe yes, so this is the answer I can give you now thinking rapidly. But cool. by, by the way, Luau is, uh, I, I, I look at, at TypeScript, so et cetera, Luau is uh, really the, 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 the one that does it uh, in the right way. <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, <laughs> All right, and on that great note, I think we should <laughs> thank the speaker. <laughs>
Checking for captions, testing, checking for captions, test. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Pitens meeting. So we are going to start with giving awards. Um, we are going to have two awards. The first one is most influential paper of ICFP 2013 and distinguished papers for ICFP 2023. Okay, then could you show the slides? Yeah, it was intended. Yes, most influential paper of ICP 2013. Presented annually to the authors of a paper presented at the ICFP held 10 years prior to the award year. The award includes a prize of $1,000 to be split among the authors of the winning paper. The papers are judged by their influence over the past decade. And this year, 2023 committee um, the members are Tony Hosking, he is the chair, Greg Morissette as the general chair of 2013, Tamo Ustalu as the program PC chair of 2013, Andre Bauer, general chair of 2022, and Zena Ariola as the PC chair of 2022. And now the award goes to, yay, yay, our own PC chair. <laughs> Yeah, the title. So this way, um, I will tell that, yes. The title is Handlers in Action. The authors are Ohad Kamar, Sam Lilly, and Nicholas Uri. And let me give you certificate. OK. Sick plan, most influential paper of ICFP 2013. It, yeah, goes to Ohad Kamar. Congratulations. And same for Sam Lilly. Yay. So Sam is going to tell us about his story. Yes. Um, you can hear me. Excellent. Great. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to say a, a, a few words. Um, so first of all, it's a great honor to, well, in the first place, be invited to be the PC chair for ICFP, <laughs> and then the same year get an influential, most influential paper award. But 
the, this was 10 years ago and, and the two are not connected, but <laughs> as far as I know. Um, and secondly, yeah, we, unfortunately, Nicola, the, the third author, isn't here, but he, he played a, an enormous role in this work. So we should thank him as well. Um, I think one thing I, I actually wanted to mention was that in 2013, uh, when I, we, we, I presented this paper, it was actually just after my sister had died. Uh, it was a pretty difficult time for me. But I came to ICFP anyway. Uh, and for me, I think it was, it was the right thing to do. And I was sort of amazed at how supportive and understanding a lot of people were. And it's just a, a, an indication of how nice the ICFP community is and have some difficult but also fond memories of, of that time. So, yeah, in, so, in some ways I'd like to dedicate my part of this award to my sister. Um, but yeah, moving on to the, the paper itself, um, an, another thing I'd like to say about the way in which the work came about. Um, at the time, Ohad was was a lowly PhD student, and uh, Nicola and I were, were postdocs, and we, we shared an office, and Ohad would, would regularly come in and disturb us. <laughs> None of us were working in this area at all, really. I think, uh, were you writing your thesis at the time, or? Something like that. Yeah, anyway. Um, but we, we just sort of started having a bit of fun and exploring this, this new direction that We'd not, well, at least, I guess Ohad was the expert. He was, he was giving us all the, the advice and tips on what this thing was. But, but we, we were just kind of hacking and trying out new ideas. And it, since then, it, it's turned into my main kind of research topic. So it's, it's certainly been inf very influential on me. I, I got, <laughs> got a big grant and I've had, well, some amazing PhD students like Daniel, who's sitting there on the front row. Uh, done a whole thesis on, on this topic. Um, but I think it was also, um, well, I should say also, we shouldn't really claim credit for everything that happened here. In fact, in 2013, there were, there were several different things, well, at least three different, I think, important papers there. There's, so um, Edwin Brady had a, a paper on programming and reasoning about effects, which was also using effect handlers. And Oleg Kiselyov's extensible effects at the Haskell Symposium uh, has been very influential, particularly on, on, on the use of this kind of thing in Haskell. Uh, there was also, I chaired a panel at the Haskell Symposium on the future of effects in Haskell. Um, and then since then, there's, there's a huge amount of stuff has happened. So it's, it's very uh, gratifying to see how a lot of this has, has taken off. Um, let's see. Oh, I should also um, mention that we were very much inspired and in that the title of the paper was, was Handlers in Action. We're inspired by this Monads in Action by, by Andre Felinski. And actually, the semantics we wrote down was, was very, very similar to, to what he had. Um, Then finally, I guess the thing I would like to just mention is that this is not just a, a sort of academic exercise um, in the, the subsequent years. It's, it's had quite a bit, big impact on, on industry. I'm not sure if it's really our paper necessarily, but conversations we had, for instance, with uh, Dan Lyon, I think we set him off on a, a completely different research path with COCA. And then, then indirect conversations that led to um, effect handlers appearing in, in OCaml 5 now, and, and um, influencing the design of systems like React.js. Um, Uber has, a, has a, 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 this pyro language that is, builds in effect handlers. And, um, Perhaps one of the more, more influential things was, was the fused effects library in, in Haskell, which uh, GitHub, I don't think they're still using it, but at one point, 
over 50% of all pull requests were depending on this, this technology. Um, so that, that's very nice. And then there's the, this, is, this kind of work is also continuing as, uh, with, with um, things like WASMFX, as Andreas mentioned in his keynote the other day. So it's all, yeah, quite exciting. And I would encourage um, junior people to, if you're curious about something, and you're having fun, even if it isn't the main line of your, your research, um, spend some time thinking about it, and it might turn into something um, really big. So thank you very much. Thank you. So um, we, we need two things before you leave. Oh. So let's see what committee said about your paper. So this paper drew the attention of the ICFP community to handlers as an abstraction for effectful computation in exposition and in providing the first operational semantics of handlers and effects and an effect system, it seeded many subsequent works. Pragmatically, it detailed the implementation of handlers in Haskell and outlined the ideas behind OCaml, SML, and record implementations as well as providing experimental results comparing handlers with equivalent monadic code. So thanks a lot, and we're gonna take a picture together. <laughs> you need to watch it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you can go that way. So now we are gonna have three distinguished papers and the authors are supposed to come this way <laughs> and stand here. And I'm going to give certificates, and we're going to take a picture, and you're going to go that way again. OK? OK, let's start. The first award goes to, yeah. Um, title is Haskell Functional Choreographic Programming for All, Functional Per Genshin Shin Kashiwa Linzik Per. So, yay! Okay, um, so when I give you, you are supposed to watch it, okay? Okay, Genshin, oops, let me do this one by one. Congratulations. Okay, and Shun Kashiwa, congratulations. Yes, oh um, yeah, it's difficult. <laughs> and Lindsay Cooper. And we're gonna take a picture together, yeah. Yay! Congratulations. Good point, yeah. Thank you. And the second award goes to Reflecting on Random Generation. Harrison Goldstein, Samantha Froelich, Meng Wang, Benjamin Pierce. Meng is not here? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I really enjoyed your presentation. You are good actors. Thank you. Yeah, so the first one, Harrison Goldstein. Yes. Yeah, this is. And one more, yeah. Thank you. And Samantha for a leak. Yes. Maybe. And Benjamin Pierce. And all together. <laughs> See, very difficult. Thank you. Okay, finally, the last one goes to many authors. <laughs> the first calculus, the core calculus for functional logic programming. Lenard Augustin, Joachim Breitner, Quinn Klassen, Ranjit Jala, Simon Piran Jones, Olin Shivers, Guy Steel Jr., and Tim Sweeney. And we have three people here. Okay. Um, 
Leonardo for <laughs> sorry. Um, you are the last. <laughs> okay. So Leonardo Augustin, congratulations. Thank you. Joachim Breitner. Thank you. Congratulations. And finally, Simon Peter Jones. <laughs> Thank you. And all together. Yeah. <laughs> Can I say something brief? Sure. Like, uh, um, my yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I just want to say this paper illustrates the power of rejection. This was rejected by Popple 2023, but the paper is so much better as a result. So feel encouraged, those of you who are about to be rejected by two Popple 2024, <laughs> <laughs> you should be so happy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Change the slides. Okay, now my job is done, and now the stage goes to Gabriel. You don't, uh huh? Mike? Really? Oh, that's news to me. <laughs> We need to change the slides. Uh, yes, we need to change the slides. We need Sam. Uh, we'll have a PhD, I think. The other one, yes. Yeah. Yes. All right, so this is to conclude this student research competition, or SRC. I uh, hope you all had an opportunity to see the posters yesterday and enjoy the presentations that the students gave earlier. Um, we had uh, six students participating. We have six prizes. What a coincidence. Um, so, yeah, without uh, further ado, I'll just get started with this transition diagram here, uh, which we will uh, unfold in lockstep. So I'll start with the uh, third place for the undergraduate in the undergraduate category. And there we have uh, Vishal uh, Komala. Let's give him a applause. And I I think he's not in the room today, so I I'll take it on his behalf. Uh, so thank you. Um, we'll, we'll move swiftly on. In the postgraduate category, on the third place, we have Kai Priske. And Are you in the room? I think you should be. Uh, you, yeah, come up here. Come on and join me on the stage here. Um, maybe Vicky gave him another round of applause now that he's up here. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. In second place in the undergraduate category, we have Bakhti. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> if he just that way there, yeah. And moving on to the postgraduate category, the second place, we have Ernest. Please come to the stage, yeah. <laughs> All right, now it gets exciting. So first place in the undergraduate uh, category, we have Cynthia, please come. Oh, so you have to take the long way, apparently. Yeah. Let's just, and then, I guess by process of elimination. All right. So in first place in the postgraduate category, we have Andrew. Please come to the stage. All right. F let's. I think we're supposed to take a picture together. Or? So thank you very much for your contributions. Usually in this, there's like uh, metals and papers handed out, but the ACM no longer sends that ahead of time, so they'll be mailed to you by, I guess, US Post, or whatever is used over here. Uh, so yeah, look forward to that. <laughs> uh, 
and just as a closing, I just want to say thank you to the people who were part of this at the, in the committees. So thank you very much for your work. And um, yeah, now for Gabriel. <laughs> Uh, now, very short announcement on behalf of the. No. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Uh, so, very short uh, announcement on behalf of the Journal of Functional Programming. So, you might be aware that since 2020, we have the JFP to ICFP track. So, for JFP authors who publish an article in JFP that's basic original, not already kind of an extended version of a conference paper, they can present their papers at, or they work at uh, ICFP of that year. Um, and that will happen again in 2024. So um, please consider submitting uh, your work to JFP. So you can be in um, next ICFP. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Dan Leijer. I'm going to uh, say something about diversity and, and may, you may have noticed there's something new this year at ICFP. There's actually a, a diversity committee uh, and it was really initiated by uh, Simon Marlowe. A shout out to him if he's still around. Um, and the committee this year is, is me and uh, Gabriele Keller and Alejandro Russo. And the idea is really to make a more uh, coordinated, long-term, sustained effort for diversity and inclusion at uh, ICFP. And that's the idea. And we have this, uh, I think uh, all of us have this ideal, really, of, of to have an uh, environment that's diverse and inclusive and welcoming for everyone uh, of all backgrounds and experiences, where we can all thrive around our shared passion for functional programming. Uh, and I think um, not only we can thrive, but a research tool which can really benefit from a you know more diverse set of viewpoints. And um, oh no, of course it's it's also uh, not so easy diversity. Uh, Ohad uh, Kamar uh, put it very eloquently that it's really about the people that are not in this room, right? And we make uh, we're going to make various efforts to to work on that. And I think this year's ICFP had many events. I think that are aligned with that. Uh, like PLMW, uh, it's always highly recommended for, for starting PhD students to go there or, or enthusiastic students. We had uh, two mentoring breakfasts, uh, the LGBTQ plus lunch and the underrepresented minorities lunch. Uh, we have the women at ICFP dinner. It's tonight at 7. It's in a fantastic place. Uh, I encourage you all to go. Uh, you don't have to have registered beforehand, so please consider that. Uh, and there's the Sick Plan M mentoring lunch uh, tomorrow at noon. And many people worked really hard in organizing this. Uh, many people that I don't name here, and I would actually uh, like to thank them all for making this happen. So maybe. <laughs> and I, I want to actually uh, briefly call out the Sick Plan M uh, long term mentoring program. It's a fantastic program. It, if you're a starting PhD student or your master's or you're thinking about doing a PhD, uh, you can be matched up with someone who can help you uh, navigate the, the pitfalls of a PhD uh, and they match up mentors and mentees uh, together. And it's a very successful program. Uh, there's now uh, 300 mentees and 200 mentors participating. And actually, the shout out is that there's actually not enough US mentors. So if you're in the US, uh, or you know the US system well, uh, please consider joining the program. And uh, 
Rishab is here. Please talk to him and otherwise email uh, Nadia Polikarpova uh, for more information. Yeah, think about that. Also, if you're a like more senior PhD student and think you can help, uh, you can also be a mentor. So please consider that. And finally, there's, there's something else new for next year's ICFP. Uh, and we're going to create a new uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion sponsorship category. And uh, that was really uh, an idea by Gabriela Keller and Simon Marlowe. And, and the idea is that on the one hand, we have these companies, big companies like, say, Microsoft, that have special budgets that need to go just to diversity and inclusion goals. And they cannot just give money to, to a conference. So why not help them spend that money and create a specific category where it's guaranteed that we look for, uh, it will be spent on DNI goals. And on the other side, there's actually already many great opportunities for sponsorship for students uh, like PLMW and Sick Plant Pack. But often there's all kinds of restrictions in place that, that makes it not possible for everyone uh, uh, to be eligible or to be funded. So I think it's a fantastic win-win situation and we really want to look uh, for this DNI fund to sponsor those enthusiastic FP students and especially from, from underrepresented geographical regions and see if you can help them to be able to attend ICFP even if you don't have a paper yet, for example. And Maybe it's the opportunity to meet a mentor and it can change everything uh, if you're from there. So I think actually this year we did a kind of trial run uh, of this funding uh, model and, and we were very glad to have a, a, a sponsor that, that helped out and we were able to fund uh, uh, one student from South America region and he's uh, sitting uh, right there. Uh, so Gaston, maybe you can show yourself, it's real. <laughs> Uh, and we're very happy that that worked out. And we're hoping maybe next year with, with funding from, from companies and people, we can you know even have even more people uh, around. And I want to give a huge shout out to Alejandro Russo, who worked really hard with his connections in the South America region, and Chris McKinsky from PLMW, and Naringa Young, and many others uh, for making this happen on such short notice and uh, this new kind of thing. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah. Ah, that's a bit unfortunate. Uh, is that better? Yes. Okay, uh, so I'm back now and in my capacity as, as PC chair. Um, just going to say a bit about how, how things went this year with the, the program committee experience. Um, so I'll start by thanking all of the, the PC members. Um, and you'll see, you should all have received your packs of cards. So here's the, here's the assignment. Um, ah, I need to stay close to the podium. <laughs> so yeah, let's, let's thank all of the, the PC members. And, If you're in the audience, please stand up if you're a PC member or an, an associate chair. So actually, I, I particularly want to thank Matthew, who, who was the associate chair, uh, which is a new thing for ICFP. And I think it's a really great idea. Uh, while I'm at it, I should actually thank Amal, who is somewhere in the audience, I believe, yes, um, who 
gave me loads of ideas about how to improve the running of the PC based on her experience from, from Popple and Oops last year. Um, and one of them was associate chairs. It, it, made it made my life so much easier. So basically, it, Matthew helped to manage about half of the, the papers that were being reviewed. Uh, yeah, so here are the pictures of the PC. Um, we should also thank the external reviewers, all of these people. Um, a number of, we had a number of sub-reviewers. The uh, tradition with SIPLAN conferences, and I continued this, is if you're on the PC, you must review every paper you're given. Uh, but if you have um, colleagues or students who, who, who can help with that process, then, then that's allowed, and that's what these people did. Um, Right, so, yeah, maybe, let's thank these people as well. Um, now I'm gonna say a bit about how many papers we got and, the, and so forth. Um, give you some numbers. We had 90 submissions, which is a bit, is on the lower end of what I was expecting, but it's still still reasonable. I, I don't exactly I don't know what the, the correlation between numbers and locations or other things is, but it's yeah, we got ninety submissions. Seventeen of them were PC papers, seventy-three non PC papers. PC members were allowed to submit uh, but papers are held to a higher standard. Most of them were regular research papers, but we also had some experience reports and functional pearls. And 33 of them were accepted. Um, with the transition to Packham PL, we have, well, we're, we always have two rounds of reviewing, so um, papers by default are accepted conditionally, and then there's another round where we check that all the conditions have been met. But 10 papers were unconditionally accepted and 23 conditional. Um, this is the number of the breakdown of PC and non-PC papers. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and actually, yeah, if you just look at these numbers, you can see that uh, if you want your paper accepted, then you should submit an experience report. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's the overall acceptance rate, 37%. PC papers, the acceptance rate's a bit higher, um, even though they, they were held to a higher standard, and I, I can assure you they were held to a higher standard, but PC papers on average are of a higher standard, so that's fair enough. Um, yeah, and there's the, the percentages for the the other things. Um, we also had artifacts and a, an artifact evaluation committee, which was led by Yanis Limberg and Quentin Stevenar. Um, so can we thank them? <laughs> and maybe, yeah, why don't people who are on the Artifact Evaluation Committee and in the audience and the chairs, please stand up. <laughs> okay. It's unfortunate that, that not so many of them were able to make it here. Maybe, maybe with the new funding mechanisms we could get more of those kind of people here. Um, yeah, so we, there, there's these three different badges that, that we have for artifacts. Available says that it's in some repository, a long-term accessible repository, and then functional and reusable. So all of them got the awards, one of them was functional, and all of the rest were reusable. Uh, I, I always get confused by this because I'm a functional programmer and I thought, 
functional is better than reusable, but <laughs> apparently it's the other way around. Um, yeah, so some, some other things to say about how the logistics of, of ICFP this year. We had the largest PC ever, uh, which meant that the maximum reviewing load was six papers. Um, I've had lots of feedback from the, the PC members saying that they, they appreciated that. Uh, it did make it harder work for me, but having Matthew there meant it was, it was doable. Um, we didn't have an in-person PC meeting. I think the days of in-person PC meetings are probably over. Uh, but most of the, the discussion actually happened in hot crap. Um, having observed the process last year, I saw that that worked pretty well, but then you have a few papers where the discussion doesn't quite converge or they're a bit con controversial. So I just decided we'd have a, a Zoom meeting for just those difficult papers. We just had seven papers left. And so that was, that was quite short. And being under two hours meant we could actually have everyone attend from all over the world. I mean, okay, some people on the West Coast had to get up at 6 a.m., I think, and then people um, further east, it was very late for them, but, but at least it wasn't the, the middle of the night. Um, I mentioned we had the higher standard. We also had a limit of three papers, three submissions per PC member. Um, lightweight double blind. Uh, an important thing I, I message I got from Amal, um, and tried to replicate was, if you want to get expert reviewers, you need to try really, really hard. So we did. And we aimed to get one expert reviewer and one why, so knowledgeable person as well, because if it's just experts, then maybe you end up with papers that are only accessible to a few people in the community. And we want, we, we want to encourage uh, papers that people can read as well. We didn't completely succeed with that, but I think we did pretty well. Uh, another aspect of this process that contributed to getting these expert reviewers is that every paper was assigned a so-called guardian reviewer who had to write their review in three weeks. And then if they saw any problems with getting a proper expert review, then we could revisit that. Um, I also mentioned the, the two round thing um, already. Okay, so I'm gonna give you some more demographic information. This is number of authors by country. You can see that USA is, is right at the top there. With, um, but we do have, um, we had one author from, well, two from Ethiopia and one from Botswana. So we, we actually had some submissions from Africa, which I think is unusual. And the, the Botswana author um, got a paper accepted. Um, but yeah. Obviously, Europe and, and America kind of dominate here. I, I have some pie charts by, by continent. Uh, disappointingly low number of South American contributions. It'd be nice if we could uh, encourage more submissions from there in future. Um, I guess that from there you see Europeans seem to have had a, a higher success rate. I don't, don't know why that was. Uh, oh, and the, the big drop there in Asia, I think that was a couple of papers that had lots of Chinese authors that were out of scope, that kind of skewed those numbers. Um, oh, right. So I've distilled some of the numbers of papers based on topic. These topics probably look fairly uh, ad hoc and complicated. This, this is just what seems to have built up over the years in, in hot crap as the, the, the categorizations of topics. And they're mainly used to do the, the review assignment, which was actually, they were actually quite useful for that, even though it looks like it's a sort of very random collection. Um, but I think Looking at these is, is quite interesting. On both, both the submitted and accepted sides, you see that there's a lot of, well, formal semantics is top there. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of stuff about program verification, type theory, um, 
I don't know if this is a good thing, but we, 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 there definitely seems to be very much a sort of theory bias in the in the 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 topics that were most popular. Which is not to say that we didn't have have plenty of practical papers as well. They're probably just further down that list. And uh, you even see there's, there's a mention of effects here, um, although there's, there's papers. Language design effects is is on this side, but didn't make it over to that side. So, so again, there seems to be this message of if you're doing some theory, then maybe and I don't know if that's a bias in the PC. Uh, that seems more likely to get accepted. Um, I'm also using that data. I've I've looked at the number of papers by programming language, and as you can see, Haskell is way ahead of everything else. Um, those, those, some of these, these, these other ones, um, Nick and I were looking through the categories at the beginning and saying, oh, we, we seem to have some, some sort of strange esoteric languages in here. Can we smuggle a couple of our own ones in? Uh, I mean, F star is probably less esoteric, but that wasn't in there, but it, it turned out there were actually several submissions there. And there was, a, there was a link submission, there was an Isabel submission. They didn't get accepted. Um, but yes, I, I, it's, it's certainly interesting that, that Haskell is, is very dominant. Um, and that's about all I have to say. So I'd just like to thank everyone again. Marco should be coming up now. Stay close to the podium. I said, no spoil, and you spoil it. <laughs> All right, I'm Marco Gabardi from Boston University, but uh, as you saw, the next ICFP will not be in Boston, also because we had, uh, we had it in Boston a few years ago, and we want a new location. So the next location will be Milan in Italy, where we didn't have uh, ICFP before. If you are not familiar, Milan is in Italy, in the north of Italy, close to Z Switzerland. It has, uh, like uh, many places in Italy, it has a lot of uh, art and history, and uh, is a bit less known than other cities for its uh, art and history, because uh, maybe Florence, Venice, are more po Rome are more popular, but also Milan has its own uh, fair share, in particular, if you read the, the, da Vinci uh, the Da Vinci Code and you wonder where is the painting, is in Milan. And also it has, uh, is uh, well known for its uh, food. It has uh, many restaurants of all the kind, from affordable to more uh, expensive one. The reason why I think it's a good location for uh, ICFP is well uh, connected to the rest of Europe uh, by train or by bus, so people that prefer those uh, uh, transportation should be able to access Milan easily. But it also has a free international airport, uh, one for intercontinental uh, flights and uh, the other two for European flights, including uh, many low-cost uh, uh, air carriers. It has a range of public transportation, subway, trams, and buses, and also uh, is very, it has many shared bikes, scooter of uh, any kind, and cars. So you will be able to go around uh, Milan uh, as you prefer. It's a big city, so you may need to, to use uh, some uh, transportation. 
Now, the venue is a bit different from this year. It will not be in an hotel. It will be in a conference center. It's uh, similar to ICFP 2022. So uh, if you have been there, it was in a conference center. It will be a bit the same structure. We have uh, all uh, a floor all for ourselves. So we will be able uh, uh, to enjoy discussion and uh, all the workshop and all the meeting we need. Is in the under uh, is in the basement of this building. So although the building looks a bit uh, uh, modern, we will be in the basement. But uh, I think it's still a nice venue. So the venue is uh, in the central area of Milan and is uh, served by two subways. So since uh, we will not uh, be in an hotel, uh, we will have uh, other accommodation around the city. Uh, we. Um, we expect uh, to have uh, some uh, uh, negotiated rate with the different hotel, but the, the venue is uh, um, reachable by two, is close to two subway stops and many buses and trams uh, around. There are many hotels around. I think uh, that uh, everybody should be able to find a reasonable uh, accommodation in terms of uh, there is a lot of offer in terms of uh, affordable uh, accommodation or more expensive one, depending on uh, uh, what you can uh, have. Now, a bit more about the organizing committee. I will be the general chair. Brigitte Pienka will be the program chair. And uh, Gabriel Keller will be associate uh, program chair. We have... Uh, people already that agreed in helping us uh, with uh, workshops, with the uh, programming content, with uh, student research competition, diversity, uh, industrial relationship, and so on. And we will build a bigger uh, organizing committee uh, when we get closer to the deadline. The tentative schedule is uh, similar to this year. Uh, the conference will be September 2nd to September 7th. Um, and the uh, call for a paper will be slightly different. It will be the 21st of February. We will have an auto response period and notification in May. And this is all I have. I hope to see you in Milan. Out to you. Otherwise, we uh, that's I think that's the end of the day's proceedings. Except I remind you of uh, the women at ICFP dinner. If you're a woman or identify as a woman, please consider going to that. Um, it's at the Andra Loft, which is across the street. If you go up to the registration desk, we can point you to where it is. Uh, but otherwise, thank you for coming and see you again tomorrow. <laughs>